You're kidding me, right? I asked as Captain Malloy revealed just what exactly we were looking for. The crew gave each other strange looks and let out nervous chuckles. Do I have a joke? He asked, back with his usual stern look. He didn't. So the fact that he just claimed to know the location of the lost city of Atlantis could only mean two things. A. He'd lost his mind. And B. He legitimately knew the location of the supposedly mythological city. According to our captain, the city had been rediscovered after an underwater earthquake. How he was the one to come across this information he wouldn't say but he promised us all the riches we could ever dream of as long as we followed him on the mission. So what are we going to do? One of the men asked. Listen, we're going to dive down 7,000 feet and confirm what I've found. One of my contacts will provide us with the tools we need. I trust a few of you blokes know how to operate diving vessels. He was right. A good portion of the crew had scoured the depths of the ocean in miniature submarines, but most of us were fresh meat aboard the research vessel we'd since come to call home. Our job had never been more than tracking weather patterns and learning about how storms affected the oceans. While it wasn't the safest job, it sure beat the crushing pressure of the depths. The submarine is only capable of holding five men, including myself and the helmsman. That leaves three spots for volunteers, Captain Malloy said. The men let out a few questioning mumbles, but none daring to speak up. I didn't know if the captain was telling the truth, but I couldn't deny the unrelenting curiosity his insane statement had built up. So I raised my hand. Ah, Winters, good to have you on board, mate. Are there any other brave souls ready to embark on a journey that might very well make it into the history books? After another minute of nervous mumbling, two other men raised their hands. As fate would have it, the men were Quint and Brennan, two men of a silent nature. They were among the more experienced crewmen, mostly keeping to themselves. Excellent. We'll reach our destination within the day. We'd already spent a week on the open ocean, albeit under the guise of another regular job. That night, we all gathered together in the small dining hall, whispering about what we would truly find at the bottom of the ocean. According to the legend, Atlantis was a city south of Gibraltar, one that had sunken into the ocean over 10,000 years ago. But we were heading far out into the Indian Ocean, thousands of miles away from its supposed location. Once the first light of day reflected off the waters on our port side, we had finally reached our destination. Just on the horizon, we could see the research vessel we were meeting up with. Due to the secretive nature of our mission, only a skeleton crew could be found aboard. But what it carried surprised me the most. A state-of-the-art submarine meant to traverse the deepest parts of the ocean, unlike anything ever built before. How had they managed to procure such an instrument? Just how they had managed to procure such an instrument was a question better left unanswered. Few words were exchanged as we went aboard the unnamed research vessel. We were just shown the way to the submarine, where the five of us boarded what was essentially a metal prison. The helmsman's name was Dylan Wallace, the only crewman coming from the other ship. Unlike the rest of us, he didn't look suspicious, but rather excited about what might lie at the bottom of the ocean. Gentlemen, prepare for the last job you'll ever need to endure. Captain Malloy said as they shut the door on us. With that, we were lowered into the ocean. The windows were quickly enveloped with water and the light of the rising sun was turned to mere rays dancing in the shallow depths of the ocean. Accompanying us downwards was little more than a few curious fish quickly abandoning us as the waters darkened. We were making good speed, a fact only measured by the echo sounder. Truth be told, we might as well have been floating in an endless void, seeing as we didn't have a single landmark to guide our way. Despite our exceptionally strong lights, there was nothing to be seen. How long until we reach the bottom? I asked. About half an hour, Wallace responded, his eyes still fixed on the equipment. I kept my face pressed against the window, 
trying to get some sense of our location. There were a few jellyfish and twisted, deep-sea creatures in the void, but apart from that, all I could see was darkness. The following 30 minutes felt like an eternity, and I felt as if I had to hold my breath until our helmsman finally announced that we should brace for impact. The landing was rough to say the least, but that was by design as the vessel was built to resist pretty much any external force. I took another peek outside the window, only to find endless dunes of sand. There's nothing here, I said. We're some distance away from the actual target. Not sure how it happened, I suppose the current dragged us away. We kept moving along the ocean floor, in search of ruins or any signs of ancient life. Before long, the soft sand gave way to a rocky surface. There were massive, strange holes covering the majority of the surface, each measuring about a dozen feet in diameter and stretching endlessly far into the ground. What are those things? Quint asked, trying not to sound too worried. Well, I haven't the faintest idea, Captain Malloy said back. But well, I don't think they're natural formations. Ignoring the weird phenomenon, we kept moving. In the distance, we could see a thick pillar that stood out from the ground. Is that... I began. That, my dear boy, is Atlantis, Captain Malloy exclaimed in joy. I still couldn't believe it, but as we progressed further, the true magnitude of that pillar came into view. As we passed a cliff, we realized that it was the center of what had once been a massive city. Tons of ruins surrounded the thick structure, which stretched a hundred feet up into the air. It shone gently as our light was reflected off of it, and that's when we realized it was actually made from a strange-looking type of metal, almost untouched by time itself. I can't believe this, Wallace let out. The city supposedly standing underwater for thousands of years had yet to be washed away by the tides of time. Though the brick and stone was gone, the metal scaffold remained. At a first glance, none of us could figure out what the material really was. But the fact that nothing had broken it down, not even earthquakes, meant that it was the strongest building material known to man. Still, among the vast city, an eerie presence lingered. The holes we'd seen on the rocky surface covered the city as well. I wonder what made those holes, Quint said. As we descended down the cliffside into the city, we got a true scope of what had actually happened to Atlantis, because the cliff was riddled by exactly the same holes. Our assumptions were simple. Something had dug out the ground beneath the city until the point where the porous ground could no longer support the structures above, at which point it had sunken into the ocean, killing everybody living there. But above the tragedy stood a wonder hidden for thousands of years, a city extraordinarily well-kept and built up by materials forgotten by mankind. Just a small sample of the material would make us rich beyond our wildest dreams. We approached the ruins, ready to extract a small sample while taking enough pictures to shred any doubt back on the surface. Wait, did you guys see that? Brennan asked as we tried to remove some of the metal. See what? The captain asked back. There was something in the hole just a second ago, Brennan said. The rest of us gathered at the window, staring into the numerous holes below us, but they were empty. There's nothing there, I said. You sure you... But before I could continue, our vessel shook violently. What the fuck was that? Quint asked. Our helmsman tried to maneuver the submarine away, but something appeared to have latched onto us. We peered out the window to see a gigantic... Earthworm-like creature emerged from one of the holes, faceless and covered in long, thin spikes. Each of its appendages appeared to be made from the same metal as the city itself. The creature approached us at a rapid pace, and it had its body pressed up against the window. One of the spikes shot through the hole, stabbing Brennan through his chest. He let out a short whimper before falling lifeless as he hung on the spike penetrating the wall. The worm pulled away for a moment, appearing to detach from the spike it had attacked us with. Get us the hell out of here, Quint yelled. Luckily, 
The spike seemed to seal the hole it had created, but our luck was short-lived as the worm struck again, shooting three more spikes through, one stabbing Quint through his leg and grazing the captain's arm. In addition, it had partially damaged the engines, making a quick ascent impossible. More worms emerged from the other holes, each one bigger than the last, far larger than our own vessel. As we reached the cliff, another one attacked us, that time hitting Quint through his abdomen and just barely missing my face. Can't this thing go any faster? I begged. Half the engines are dead. This is all the speed we're going to get, Wallace said in a panic. We reached the top of the cliff just as another worm latched onto us. While the spikes just barely penetrated the hole, that one didn't let go. Instead, it clung to our metal box as we slowly ascended towards the surface. And on our tail, we had a dozen more. They were all seemingly unaffected by the rapid pressure change, each just following but not attacking. In a way, they almost seemed to be playing with us. By then, some of the spikes had been torn away, allowing water to pour into the submarine. Luckily, we were high enough up for the pressure not to instantly kill us, but the creature was still latched on. Quint had fallen unconscious from blood loss and was just barely breathing. We all know he'd be dead long before we made it to shore, and if the creature didn't let go, so would we. But as we breached the surface, we were still partially enveloped by the massive worm. From the outside, we could hear gunshots, with some bullets hitting the creature and some hitting us. Luckily, the hole was strong enough to withstand it, which made the spikes even more menacing. The hail of bullets were just enough to make the creature let go of us. Without hesitation, we opened the hatch and climbed outside. The entire crew of both ships stood in panic on deck, watching about a dozen worms circle around. Some of them immediately pounced at the side, shooting their spikes into the hole penetrating it with ease. Wallace went back inside to try to get Quint loose, but just as he climbed back down, another worm attacked, shaking us to the ground. The crew on deck quickly lowered a rope, which I grabbed onto, following the captain. But as we did, the submarine was pulled back under with Wallace and Quint still inside, including all the data we'd collected. By then, everybody back on board had realized it was a futile fight. Our accompanying research vessel had already started turning around, but with the creatures latched on, there was little we could do, because the hole had been torn to shreds, with water quickly pouring in. At a record pace, it had already tipped over, with the crew desperately trying to get out of the water. One by one, they were consumed by the creatures, and we were next. Lifeboats, now! The captain ordered as he turned to enter the engine room. What are you going to do? I asked. I'm making sure these things don't follow us back. With that, he ran towards the engines as the rest of us attempted to use the lifeboats to flee. As we lowered the boats into the ocean, we were picked off one by one by the worms below. In the end, we were hanging on the side of the ship, trying our best to not get consumed by the monstrosities we ourselves had awoken. Then we heard a brief bang, followed by a flame that started engulfing the entire ship the captain had ignited the fuel reserves. Before we could react, the ship exploded, propelling us all into the infested waters below. The last thing I remember before the world faded to darkness was grabbing onto a piece of debris. Then nothing. I can't tell you how much time passed, but when I woke up, both ships had long been taken down into the depths of Atlantis. There were no survivors, only myself, floating on an endless ocean on a piece of debris. Three days would pass until I coincidentally drifted into a shipping lane, but when I told them my story, no one believed a word. Atlantis is a real place, full of hidden discoveries never to be seen again. And if I'm being perfectly honest, it's just better that way. Those creatures, whatever they are, need to be left alone until the end of time itself.
the Harvard Wormhole Experiment. Written by Nathaniel Lewis They gave me a million bucks to keep my trap shut. And I did. For 15 years. But last night I was making the rounds. And I saw the professor again. I had a heart attack three years back. And I tell you, when I saw him standing there in front of room 204, I felt another one coming on. He turned and smiled, and it was like he hadn't aged a day in 15 years. Hey there, chief, he said. And that was it. I dropped my clipboard on the ground and hightailed it out of there, never looking back. What I'm about to tell you is liable to make me sound crazier than a three-horned goat. But I promise you, there's crazier things out there. The cops don't believe me. The official story is that the professor and those students died 15 years ago. Room 204 just up and exploded, they said. Damnedest thing. And there's some truth there. That room did explode. But it wasn't an accident. We knew exactly what we were doing. Or we thought we did. They call me an assistant supervisor of maintenance. But really I'm just a janitor. And always have been. You might wonder why I'm still at it after getting that million bucks. That dough is for Junior, so he doesn't have to go through the same shit that I did. The night this happened, I was assigned to the Astrophysics Center, a bit northwest of the main Harvard campus. Until that night, this was always my favorite beat. I mean... God help you if you wound up at one of the biology labs. Those goddamn dead, cut open animals all over the place used to give me nightmares. And really, thinking back, I'd take those nightmares of mutilated and scattered organs any night over the stuff that had haunted me ever since. Anyway, I was there mopping the hallway on the second floor of the lab building when the door to room 204 opened up and this guy popped his head out. Hey you. I looked around to make sure he was talking to me. Yes, can I help you sir? I thought he was going to bitch about the room being a mess or something. How'd you like to make a thousand bucks chief? An hour's work at most, easy money. Does that sound good to you? It sure did. Things were tight at home, as they always were. A thousand dollars would knock off some of those long overdue bills, but I was also on a tight schedule. They didn't give you much breathing room. Don't want you standing around thinking about it all, I guess. That sounds great, sir, I said, but I gotta stick to my beat. The man laughed. We're about to make history, Chief, he said. And you're worried about emptying the bathroom trash? Come on, don't sweat it. You won't get in trouble. I promise. I'm a professor here. I'll vouch for you. The guy did look like a professor. With carefully combed gray hair and big old glasses on his face. I shrugged. Leaned my mop against the wall and said... Sure. What do I have to do? That's fantastic. Come on in, Chief. Come on in. I followed him into the room. One look, and I should have just turned around then and told him to keep his damn money. But I didn't. As soon as I stepped in, I felt the little hairs all over my body stand up. I don't mean I was scared. 
I mean like there was an electrical charge in that room. And I had a guess about where it was coming from. There, in the center of the room on a round table, was a large glass globe crackling with electricity. Like what you see if you go into a kid's science museum. Like they somehow created a lightning storm in a glass ball. This one was sort of vibrating around on its stand and buzzing. And the lightning inside was black. I could feel the electricity coming from it from across the room. There were four kids there. Students, I guess, sitting in a row of chairs along one wall. More than sitting. They were strapped into those chairs, with metal things over their heads like those big bowl things you see at a hair salon. They all had their eyes closed. Uh, I said. What's going on here? Those kids okay? They're quite fine said the professor. As to what is going on, as I said, we are about to make history. We are going to open the first wormhole. Wormhole? Like in the movies? The professor laughed. I suppose so, chief, he said. Now listen, we had a last minute cancellation, but that's okay because it's an easy job. We're going to be kicking things off here shortly, and once they are properly kicked off, the wormhole will open. I will enter. If I am not back in 30 minutes, you are to pull that lever there, and this will close the wormhole. I looked to where he was pointing, at a big red lever attached to a giant whirling machine that was hooked up to the metal bowls over the students' heads. But, uh, won't you be trapped on the other side of the wormhole? I asked. Not that I had the slightest idea about what the hell was going on. Just so, chief, said the professor. We've got this down to two possibilities. One, the wormhole opens up to what we're calling the second universe. The best way that I can explain this possibility is that there is a different reality that exists on the other side of this one. The other side of an invisible wall. The wormhole will provide a door in that wall. And the other possibility? That the wormhole will open to a place that man was not meant to go. Thirty minutes will give me enough time to get in and out, if the first possibility is true. And if it's the second? Then you'll close the hole with that lever, and my students will destroy my work. This was all way above my pay grade. But my head was spinning. Why only two possibilities? How the hell did they come up with those two? And if this is real, why the hell would the professor take a coin toss chance of getting stuck in the place that man was not meant to go? I mean, those were just starter questions, among the swarm that was buzzing around in my head. I see that you have some reservations, said the professor. I assure you that your only job is to pull that lever after 30 minutes. That's it, Chief. We'll take care of the rest. And nothing that happens is on you. The documentation is quite in order. He tapped a folder that was sitting on the circular table. And here, I'll write you a check now before we proceed. As he wrote out the check, I wondered if it would still be valid if you got swallowed up by the wormhole. I actually had that thought, as crazy as it sounds. It was still all so weird and abstract to me at that point. Here, he said, handing over the check. Let's do it, chief. As soon as I enter that hole, give me exactly 30 minutes. On the dot. That's all you have to do. I took the check, mumbled a thanks, and watched as he walked over to the machine. He pulled the lever. There was a loud crackling sound, and I watched in unease as one by one the student's eyes shot open. 
There were no pupils there, like their eyes were rolled back in their sockets. Hey now, I said, taking a step towards the machine. They're quite fine, said the professor, I assure you. Their jaws started to move like they were grinding their teeth. The professor took a jar of neon blue liquid from a shelf on the wall. He unscrewed the lid and poured the stuff over the electric globe on the round table. The thing started going crazy, and then the globe shattered completely, bits of glass flying through the air as shots of black lightning zapped out into the room. I ducked down. I had had enough by then and was ready to get the hell out of there. Then it happened. A fucking black hole appeared in the middle of the room, sucking in the bolts of electricity. It grew larger and larger until it took up half the room. All I could hear was the rushing sound, like the world's largest vacuum cleaner running at full throttle. Remember, Chief, shouted the professor with a wild look on his face. Thirty minutes exactly. Then he stepped into the thing and was gone. At first, my mind was a mess, staring at that whooshing black hole that seemed hungry to suck everything in. I looked at the kids hooked up to the machine. Their eyes rolled back. White holes, I guess they looked like. Their jaws grinding away like crazy. It was too much to make sense of. I looked down at my watch. Fifteen minutes and thirty-one seconds had gone by since the professor got swallowed up by the wormhole. My heart was pounding, and I kept pacing back and forth, trying to work out what the hell was going on. Then I started to zero in on it. I was getting pranked. Not a prank like we used to do as kids, setting dog shit on somebody's front steps and all that idiocy. I mean, a prank like the sophisticated college folk do, where they tell you something's going on but the whole point is to just observe your reaction. A psychological experiment. Probably cameras in here watching me right now, seeing what I do. Twelve minutes to go. I saw a trickle of blood come down from one of the kid's nose. I leaned down to look at him. He was shaking a little bit, all over. If I throw that lever, this will all probably stop. Maybe that was the test. I had to decide between trapping the professor in the black hole and saving those kids hooked up to the machines. None of it being real, of course. But they didn't know that I knew that. But then, screaming in the back of my mind was that voice. What if it is real? Ten minutes to go. The professor had promised me that the kids were alright. But another one started bleeding from the nose. If it wasn't real... It was a hell of a trick. Where did the professor go, if not through that hole? I thought about touching it. But whenever I got close, I was filled with total terror. It sure seemed real. Like it really took you someplace far, far away from here. I walked over to the table and picked up the folder that was there. Just like the professor had said... The first page was instructions to shut down the machine and destroy it, if he didn't return within 30 minutes. I flipped that page over, and the next one had a photograph of one of the students. I read what it said. It was a consent form. I, Jackson Stewart, acknowledge the possibility of my imminent death if I participate in this experiment. I am prepared to give my life to science. 
I flipped that page, and there were three more just like it. Now, I'm no lawyer, but there was no way in hell that this experiment was legal. If it was even real, even with those consent forms. So, I concluded, it probably wasn't real. And if it was, then the professor lied to me. He had said that those kids were fine. This folder was telling me something else. Two minutes to go. I took a deep breath and paced the room, watching each second tick by. My mind was telling me that none of it was real, but my gut was screaming in horror. I just looked at my watch. It would be over soon enough, one way or the other. 30 seconds. I walked over to the machine and put my hand on the lever. God damn it, why is he cutting it so close? I watched the seconds tick by, and I didn't know if I could do it. I didn't know if I could risk trapping the professor wherever the hell he had gone off to. Five seconds. My hand was shaking. Four seconds. Sweat was pouring down my face, dripping into my eyes. Three seconds. One of the students started to moan. The one that I saw was named Jackson in the folder. Two seconds. Oh god, oh god, oh god. One second. Jackson started to shake. Zero seconds. Shit. I tensed my muscles to pull the lever. One look at Jackson and I knew I had to pull it. He was violently jerking around. Wait! I snapped my neck around to see the professor's head sticking out of the black hole. Wait, damn it! Then his shoulders were through. I turned back to Jackson. Blood was pouring out of his eyes. I'm almost through! A second kid started to shake. One more second! I looked to see that the professor was through. He was back in the room. Do it! He shouted. Two things happened after that, at the exact same time. I heard a wet popping sound, and I watched as the wormhole disappeared as though it was never there. But I had never pulled the lever. I slowly turned to look at Jackson. His head was gone. Judging by the bits of brain and splatters of blood on the bowl thing above his neck, his head had just exploded. The whirring of the machine gradually died down, and then it was silent. The three kids who were still alive stopped shaking and closed their eyes. A tragedy, said the professor, pointing at Jackson with the exploded head. But not for nothing. I've been there. I've seen it. Chief, I've seen it. I hunched over and puked. It was weird. But my first thought was, what a mess I'll have to clean up later. I don't know. I guess my mind had just sort of shut down and I was going on autopilot. I was the janitor. I cleaned up messes. That was all I knew. Then it hit me. The reality of what had happened. You son of a bitch! I yelled. You told me those kids would be okay! The professor put this sickening, smug grin on his face. He would have been, Chief, had you pulled the lever at 30 minute mark as I instructed. You told me to wait! Did I? Yes, you fucker. I'm calling the police. I had a walkie clipped to my belt. It wouldn't get me the police, but it would get campus security. I reached for it and had it in my hand when I heard a groan behind me. I turned to see that it was one of the kids. 
they were waking up. I went over to unstrap them from the chairs. The first kid's eyes blinked open, and when she saw the professor, she started screaming. It's okay, I said. Shh, it's okay, it's all over. She kept screaming. Then the second kid woke up. He looked right at me with wide, terrified eyes. Get us out of here! He shouted. I'm working on it, kid, I said, fumbling at the straps. They were on so tight. The third kid woke up. It's here, she said. It made it through. Everything's okay now, I said. Your friend didn't make it. I'm afraid, but it's over. I'll make sure the professor pays for what he did to you and your friends. The first kid was still screaming at the top of her lungs. Get us out of here, shouted the second kid again. The third kid looked me dead in the eyes, and in a totally calm voice said, That's not the professor. What? Of course it is, I said. What I saw when I turned to look at the professor will haunt me forever. The professor's mouth was twisting around at odd angles, like something was moving the lower half of his jaw randomly or like he was trying to get a hair out of his mouth that kept jumping around. The veins on his neck bulged, then sunk back down, then bulged again so that they were thick as ropes. His wrists were rotating in ways they weren't supposed to rotate, as his arms flailed around wildly. I had the first kid, the screaming one, free. She jumped out of the chair and ran to the door, but her legs were wobbly, and she tripped over herself in the middle of the room. I went to work on the second kid, whipping my head around every second to look at the professor. It looked like there was something crawling around under his skin. Something big. Get us out of here! The second kid shouted yet again. The first kid was still on the ground screaming, I worked away furiously on the straps. If you believe in God, said the third kid with an eerie calm, then pray. I took a glance at the professor, and that's when the first bone burst out of his chest, through his suit. I call it a bone, but it was pure black and dripping with green slime. As for me, said the third kid, I do not believe that there is a god. Not after what I have seen. The second kid was free and made a run for it. I scooted over to the third kid, but watched as the professor reached out an arm and grabbed the second kid by the top of his head. The professor gave one quick twist and let go. I heard a terrible snap, and the kid slumped to the ground, dead. Three more black bones came out of the professor's chest, dripping. He laughed and bent down to the first kid, who was still screaming, as bones began to poke out of his back like a fucking stegosaurus from hell. What is that thing? I asked as I fumbled at the straps of the last kid. It doesn't belong here, said the kid. No shit, I said, getting one strap free. But what is it? It comes from a terrible place, a place where there is nothing save pain, endless pain, incomprehensible to our minds. Great, I muttered, as I noticed with a shrieking heart that the screams from the girl behind me had stopped. Then I heard a wet crunch. I couldn't help it. I looked to see the professor tearing into the poor girl's throat with long, black fangs dripping in green slime. I turned back to the kid, almost done with the straps. Just a few more seconds. What's your name anyway, kid? Claire. Claire, I said, my mind trying to stay focused. When I get you out of these straps, I want you to pick up this chair and throw it at that thing, okay? I'll do the same thing, okay? Then, we make a run for it. Do you understand? 
Can you do that? I understand, said Claire. I do hope it works. I hoped it worked too. We have to make it work, Claire, I said, yanking off the last strap. Come on. We stood up together, and I reached over to pick up a chair. I hurled it at the professor with all of my strength, and it shattered against his boned back. I heard a terrible shriek then, and watched as Claire's chair followed behind. I grabbed Claire's arm with one hand and reached for my pocket knife with the other. The only way out of that room meant passing by the professor. We started running as I pulled the knife out and flicked it up. The professor stood, still shrieking, as the green slime mixed with the red blood from the kid's throat and dripped down his chin. I took a wild stab at the professor's neck and connected. I kept running with Claire, leaving the knife stuck in the professor's neck and made it to the door. I had my hand around the knob when I felt Claire pulling away from me. I looked back, helpless as I saw the professor reach long, black claws into her gut. I threw the door open and left her there. Good God. I left her there. I made it outside the lab building somehow. I don't remember how. My mind just sort of shut down and I ran like hell, I guess. I did have the presence to go around and lock all the doors from the outside. Then I got on the radio to campus security. You guys need to get the police over to Astrophysics Center fucking ASAP. There was a fucking massacre in there. The front door started to rattle, and I heard that god-awful shriek again. Repeat, said a voice over the walkie. Look, I said, call up Lawrence Summers right now. That was the president of Harvard at the time, and I had seen his signature on the papers in that folder with all the consent forms. Tell him that the wormhole experiment has gone way the fuck south. The rattling at the door stopped. I only prayed that that thing didn't figure out it could just break a window and crawl out that way. This is the janitor, right? Said a different voice on the other end of the walkie. Is this a joke? The wormhole experiment? Have you been drinking? Call Lawrence Summers. If you don't, I promise you that you'll never be able to live with yourself. Do it now! There was a horrible pause. I heard the professor trying the side door now, shrieking once again. 10-4 A fleet of black SUVs pulled up two minutes later. A team of heavily armed men jumped out and ran past me, breaking through windows and jumping inside. I heard a stream of gunfire and screams. So many screams. And the professor's horrible shrieks. After a while, it was quiet, and a second team of men jumped through the broken windows. I didn't hear any more gunfire. I felt a hand on my shoulder and I whipped around. A man was standing there. I don't remember a single thing about what he looked like, but I remember our conversation. Tell me what happened, he said. I told him the full story, the same one that I've told you. We are prepared to give you a lot of money to sign an NDA. NDA? Non-disclosure agreement. It means that you can never tell anybody what happened here tonight. How much? A million dollars. And a promotion. The man paused. You mean you still want to work here? Work here? After tonight? 
Somebody's got to clean up this shit, I said. Fine. Of course. And one more thing. And what's that? Asked the man. I want to know that this will never happen again. I want to blow all that shit up. And burn all of the notes. Of course. And I want to watch. Of course. Said the man. And so I thought it was over. But it's not. Last night, I saw the professor again. He looked me right in the eyes, flashed that smug grin, and said, Hey there, chief. That's when I ran the hell out of there. The police don't believe me. I've sent a dozen emails to Lawrence Summers' assistants. I've called every number that I've found listed for him. I haven't heard anything back. I don't know who else to turn to. I'm afraid the professor is going to open the wormhole again. And I'm afraid this time, he might bring his friends back with him. Hello everyone, this is Magnetar. I just wanted to say, I will be continuing the story of your life series. I just wanted to go ahead and mix it up a little bit and give you another story. If you're new here, or haven't checked out some of my other series, you can find playlists for every series that I've done as well as playlists for individual videos sorted by topic. And if you are new here, I do invite you to subscribe as well and join us here on The Void. But remember, astrophobes be warned. Eden Rising, the CCS Exalted Aurora, an original story by me, Magnetar. The sun slowly started rising up over the horizon, basking the entire garden in a warm, glowing light. It shone brilliantly across the acres of green foliage in which Dorian is having his early morning stroll. He's trying his best to enjoy the magnificent cool air but he is finding that his mind could only concentrate on the clusterfuck that he is facing at work. Dorian is a sustainability control officer aboard the CCS Exalted Aurora, one of the largest of all humanity's carrier-class airships. Boasting an impressive 42,480 square meters of rooftop gardens, habitats, and ponds, that measurement does not even include the dozen or so floors of interior space below that contain living quarters, cafeterias, conference rooms, and maintenance and power systems. Like most vehicles these days, the Aurora floats and moves through anti-gravity magnetic propulsion. It gathers energy through solar panels, wind turbines, and an impressive zero-point energy reactor. The exalted Aurora like oil tankers of the old world, transports the most valuable goods of the future. Seeds, grasses, all kinds of trees and other forms of vegetation. It also carries animals that inhabit the artificial forests which sprawl across the top of the ship. And therein lies the problem Control faces at this moment. There has been a wave of death originating from a certain clearing in one sector of the ship's forest. Plants and animals alike are falling ill and dying in greater numbers every day as the sickness seems to radiate and spread from the center point. Control has no idea what is causing this. Beyond the concern for the ship's health and well-being, this puts their mission in jeopardy. 
Ships like the Exalted Aurora are humanity's answer to a dead world. They travel to the outskirts of the small, inhabitable zones dotted around the planet and land. Trees are offloaded and planted there, and the animals are released into the man-made wilderness. It is a century-long project to reclaim the destroyed and dead parts of our Earth, our small way of atoning for our ancestors' sin of failing to uphold the mantle of responsibility to Mother Earth and all of her life. Dorian yawned, taking in a lungful of crisp, fresh air hoping to jolt his mind out of its grogginess. Due to the mystery of the cancer that is spreading across the ship, he had not been able to get much sleep the last three days. In fact, the recent events were keeping everyone in control constantly on their feet. What's more is that almost every day for the past few weeks, they had been getting numerous alerts from the sensory reactors. Alerts that something was passing through their carefully constructed perimeter shielding which served to protect man and beast from spilling over the side of the deck without sacrificing the view and doubling as a projectile defense system. That's right. Even now, humanity still has its disagreements. The point is, he and Control still hadn't been able to find a source for the alerts, and the looming threat was hanging over their heads quite uncomfortably. Suddenly, he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned around and placed his hand on his sidearm, but quickly removed it once he recognized the figure in front of him. Whoa, at ease, Captain, Maeve chuckled, giving Dorian a cheeky grin. Her red hair glistened in the sun rays. He flashed a quick smile and took her hand in his as she gave him a quick kiss on the cheek. They both turned and continued the peaceful stroll across the garden, looking down across the edge of the ship and the protective, almost invisible walls that were put up. This five-minute portion of the walk was one of the only places where they had any privacy to be fully open with their display of affection for each other. Letting others see an unsanctioned blossoming relationship was out of the question, especially since they were both working at control. Do you really think something could have infected the ship's flora? She asked, with concern seeping into her voice. Well, that's what our sensors say, and based on what is going on in parts of the forest, I'd say nature is throwing up red flags as well. Nature never lies, you know. Well, maybe you ought to check in with the suits in the council. Maybe they have some thoughts. She said, looking down at her moving feet, each step cushioned by thick green grass. <laughs> yeah, like I could even get a minute in front of them after throwing out one of their buddies for smuggling. Dorian chuckled, but instantly became serious when he saw her face. I don't know about you, but I bet they know more than they often let on. I mean, they knew about Chief Eric's escapades to the surface and what he was bringing back. They just didn't care. Yeah, we do make a fair point. But do you really think they'd stay mum about something as serious as this? I mean, nature is crying all around us. She looked into his eyes. Sadness and maybe a shimmer of anger radiating from them. Dorian nodded. I'll call Chief Williams and request a meeting with the council. We'll figure this out. He tried to reassure her, but got only a brief nod in return. She began to change her posture, putting some distance between them. As she did, her arm extended in order to keep her hand in his as long as possible, before it eventually fell away to her side. He took one last lover's glance at her before turning his gaze forward, as they rounded the corner to control headquarters. They stepped into the outside courtyard, complete with a fountain in the center, rows of solar panels on one side, and about eight feet of empty grass between the two. On the other side, their team was waiting anxiously and working furiously at their stations, which were covered by an awning of even more solar panels. They were groaning loudly, clearly frustrated with the impasse that they currently found themselves in. Any progress? Dorian asked glumly, 
but received only a few depressed glances back. Sighing, he plopped onto the ground that was still wet with morning dew and started rummaging around his backpack for his tablet and barely noticed Maeve slip away. He was too caught up in his own worries, fully pushing their pleasant walk out of his mind. Barely a few minutes passed when a sudden roar erupted from outside the courtyard's walls. The ground was shaking beneath his feet as he glanced around frantically, watching his colleagues blindly press buttons on the gigantic control panels in a desperate attempt to detect what was happening. Before he could grasp an understanding of what was going on, he felt the earth he was standing on start to crack, and before he knew it, a large abyss started growing at the center of the courtyard. The fountain and other equipment were slipping through it, crashing loudly. As the dirt and grass crumbled into the levels below, screams of terror and confusion rose up through the cracks as the roaring continued. With heavy legs, Dorian turned around and ran in the direction Maeve went, refusing to think about anything else other than ensuring she was safe. Maeve! Maeve, where are you? He yelled as he rounded a cluster of shrubs and bushes. Maeve was crouched beside one of the shrubs with her back to him. Maeve, it's okay, but get up. We gotta get out of here. Suddenly, the roar reached a crescendo, and it was joined with additional, higher-pitched screeches. Dorian peeked over the shrubs to survey the courtyard, but couldn't make out anything more than the slowly expanding hole. As the deafening noise stimmed down, something wet and slimy grabbed at his leg. He looked down and screamed out in horror, instinctively shaking his leg to free it from what had wrapped around it like shackles. He fell onto his back and continued shaking his leg, but the tentacle only seemed to get a stronger and stronger grip around his calf. After a few grueling seconds, he managed to catch a glimpse of what the tentacle was attached to, and it made his blood go cold. It was Maeve, but she was horribly disfigured, as dark, pus-filled lumps grew and leaked what looked like sludge as they popped and regrew. Her eyes were bloodshot and her left shoulder was snapped in a way that was not natural. Out of her right elbow extended the tentacle that was now pulling him closer. The rest of her arm from the elbow down hung limply from torn muscle. He was paralyzed. The wet, bloody red extension wrapping tighter and tighter along his leg that was now a deep hue of purple. What remained of Maeve's face looked at him with protruding eyes and hollow skin, her body oozing crimson red blood and more sludge splattering on the ground around her. Maeve. Oh god, Maeve. Baby, what happened? He yelled through tears. As he did, the tentacle tightened again, and you could hear his bones snap. Screaming in pain, he frantically searched all around for something he could use to free himself from her grasp. Luckily, he had grabbed his bag before running and it had fallen just within arm's reach. He stretched to reach it, and felt around for the familiar feel of his pocket knife's handle. Come on, you fucker. Where are you? He was able to finally pull the bag close enough that he could dump the contents out and quickly grab the knife, flicking the blade open. He pulled himself up by his shaky elbows, all the while doing his best to keep Maeve away through well-aimed kicks. He slashed at the tentacle a half a dozen times before it finally relented. Quickly standing, he placed his hand on his sidearm for the second time today. Maeve, honey, you're sick. It's okay though, we, we can, we can get you looked at. He held his other hand out to keep space between them, partly hoping she'd take his hand again and revert back to her calm and loving demeanor. She took a swipe at him with her human hand, causing Dorian to jump back to avoid the impact. He drew his plasma pistol and aimed it at her, the recognizable sound of it purring in his hand. Maeve froze, lowering her arms, her eyes meeting his. 
For a moment, time stood still. The chaos around him slowly phased out of his mind. The screams, the rumbling, the gunfire, it all just faded away. Maeve, please, he whispered. The body in front of him, almost completely unrecognizable, straightened slightly. He saw what could be described as a tear in the once beautiful eye of the woman he loved. Then, the creature that was once Maeve lunged forward screaming. With tears of his own, he pulled the trigger. An echo from the shot resonated off the wall beside him. The creature, having been in mid-lunge, continued past him before falling over a few feet away. A large hole in its chest oozed black sludge. Dorian did not give the body more than a quick glance before moving away. That wasn't Maeve. Not anymore. And he refused to let the image of that mangled, malformed body be imprinted into his mind. He felt guilty about that act. But if he hesitated even a moment, he knew he'd be overwhelmed by grief and he needed to flee the area. Clutching his still, throbbing leg tightly and wincing through the pain, he staggered forward. His eyes set for the main unit, the home of the council and certainly where people would flee. The screams around him had long faded into the distance and he did not see anyone around him. He looked to the sky and saw birds circling above him. The sun reaching the highest point in the sky. The sun was scorching hot, making his skin fried and plastered with sweat, but he kept trudging on. Over the last hour, he had seen no people and no wildlife aside from the birds overhead. More concerning was what he had seen. He witnessed something that he never thought he would live to see and it shocked him to his very core. The magnificent greenery started wilting around him in real time, turning browner and browner by the moment. With each passing second, the exalted Aurora was dying. Body screaming in pain, he made his way forward for half the day. As he reached the garden leading to the main unit, he tried to ignore the deep pain he felt upon seeing the dried-up flowers in his way, and the small animal corpses, barely twitching, bloody tentacles scattered all around. He kept his guard up, but no more creatures jumped at him. He entered the main lobby of the tower, leaving a bloody handprint on the doorframe. The area seemed mostly untouched by the earthquake that had shattered the ground at the other end of the ship but the Death Plague had obviously made its way there as everything was wilting rapidly. Ignoring the young receptionist who yelled at him that he needed to be buzzed in, he rushed through the hospital white lobby, leaving a trail of more blood behind. He burst right through the council's meeting room door and found himself stared at by a dozen people in impeccable suits. He scanned the room. No, not a dozen, but only seven. Seven members of the council sat before him, and Chief Williams was not one of them. Dorian pulled out his badge, now covered in dirt and bodily fluids, and started recounting who he was and what he had observed happening over his way over. Every few seconds he would glance over at each of their faces, searching for a reaction. He anticipated horror, or anger, or surprise, but nobody showed even the slightest bit of emotion, besides sharing a few conspiratorial glances with one another, which only annoyed him. He had wasted hours making his way there, hoping that the people governing the ship would be doing something. Where were the medical tents? Where were the officers working to save the plants and animals? Excuse me, have you heard what I just said? We need to do something. The plants are dying. These creatures are roaming the ship. We need to send out recovery teams to bring people here to shelter them. He started raising his voice, panic surging through him. 
but he was interrupted by one of the very stiff men. So more people can be killed? Don't worry. We've already decided to abandon ship. You're free to come along. Just need to check in first to see if there's any more space. He spoke in a patronizing tone, as though it was a huge favor he was doing, allowing him to come along. I'm sorry. Abandon. We figured out that some sort of virus has infiltrated the exalted Aurora. And although we didn't know much about the specifics until you arrived, we have guessed as much. The wisest thing to do in this situation is to move on to one of the neighboring ships, a woman explained with an icy calm. But you can't just leave. There still might be people out there in need of help. He stammered, shocked with the lack of concern from the council. Too risky. Besides, we must leave soon. The ship is dying, shouted the first man. But the ship is our home, our responsibility. We can't just abandon it, let it die. What about those of us that are linked with this ship? We die too. Why not? We are irreplaceable, but we can always build another ship. You can always retether. Now are you in? Or are you out, Officer Myers? Dorian could barely comprehend the cruelty of what these people wanted to do. The ones tasked with ensuring the safety and sustainability of the exalted Aurora. He, like most of the others living here, had been on the ship since they were children, purposefully detaching himself from the symbiosis that he had cultivated was something he couldn't even comprehend. Not to mention, running away like cowards, leaving all other survivors behind to fend for themselves. Just as he decided to tell them that he couldn't be a part of this ghastly plan and would much rather stay behind and salvage what he could, horrific roars erupted from the lobby. Glancing behind him out one of the floor-to-ceiling windows, he could see that the receptionist had changed just as Maeve had. Her neck snapped to one side and tentacles protruded out of her elbows. She had pounced onto someone unlucky enough to be within range of her swipes. Dorian turned back to the council, only to see that they had already begun fleeing out of the other end of the room. Hey! He yelled as he rushed to the door, but it slammed down behind them. A red light above the door indicated that there was no way he'd get it open. Fuck you, you fucking cowards! He turned around and exited the room running past two more people in mid-transformation. There was no way he would be able to fight them all. As his tired legs made their way out of the building, he caught a glimpse of a set of ships taking off. Surely the council had made it aboard. Dorian cursed under his breath and drew his plasma pistol, exiting the main unit's garden. There had to be people held up in other sectors of the ship. Finding others was the best chance he had at saving the exalted Aurora. The best chance he had at saving himself.
Hundreds of spectators gathered around in anticipation of this historic launch. Those who did not attend eagerly watched on their television screens at home. Cameras dotted the grassy field and collected the dew of the foggy morning. The clock showed two minutes till launch. Taking her cue, a young girl stepped up to her microphone and began to sing. Three flags fluttered in the gentle breeze. The first, the flag of the United States of America. The second flag was a flag displaying the NASA insignia. And the third flag sported a more recently adopted design, the flag of Earth. The crowd remained hushed as the girl continued her song. The lyrics echoed through the field and the excitement could be seen in the face of every man, woman, and child. Of course, it would be years before this mission would yield any results at all, but today was an important milestone towards saving mankind. For a moment, the song was interrupted by the announcement. One minute to launch. Destiny, the first spacecraft intended to explore planets outside our home solar system, sat vertically on the launch pad. The silence was almost eerie, but was shattered by her voice. The crowd erupted in cheers as the final few seconds ticked off the clock. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The cheering of the crowd was overshadowed by the explosive roar of the engines of destiny, and white clouds billowed from the bottom of the spacecraft. Liftoff. Log Journal of Destiny Astronaut Jason Falcon, 24th of June, 2044. So, today is my last day on Earth. Well, technically I'm not on Earth at all anymore. I'm actually in the low Earth orbit. But I'm closer to Earth than I'll be for the next 33 years, roughly. The plan is to head straight for Cape 10 Star at around 85% the speed of light, or 250,000 kilometers a second. That means we'll spend just over 16 years headed there. Then about six months on Cape Den B to study it, and another 16 years headed home. Luckily for us, it will only feel like 17 years total due to the special theory of relativity. More specifically, it will feel like seven months to us because we're going to be in cryosleep for almost the entire trip. The other six members of my crew and I, if you can even count John as a crew member, go to sleep tomorrow and won't wake up until we reach Cape Den Star. It's a good thing because I think I'd rather jump out of the airlock than spend 17 years with these guys. In all seriousness, we've been selected specifically to complement each other's personalities, so we don't rip each other to shreds in the few months that we will be awake in the aggressively tiny 
accessible portion of this spacecraft. My other crew members are an amazing bunch of guys, and girl, and I would trust them with my life. Which is good, because it's more than likely that I will have to before this trip is over. <sighs> We've all been saying our goodbyes, even though the next thing we remember will be waking up 13 light years away with nothing much to look at but each other's faces. So yeah, I'm willing to give up 17 years of my precious youth for this opportunity. I really love space. But hey, who else can say that they visited another star? It will all be worth it when we're regarded as world heroes for discovering a new home for when Earth is no longer habitable. This will be my only log prior to the cryosleep. So, see you in 16 years. Log date, 13th of April, 2051. I woke up to alarms and a cramp in my stomach. It's nine years early, so I assumed it must be some important maintenance. Oddly though, the ship decided to do an emergency thaw, which is a very dangerous quick version of the thawing process. And I quickly discovered why. The ship was losing oxygen and fast. I extended my cryogenic storage tank, basically a glorified frozen coffin, and crawled out. Oxygen alarms sounded all throughout the cabin and I rushed to the main control area. I realized what had happened. There had been a major leak in the oxygen so the ship had prioritized the cryogenic storage tanks, pumped oxygen from the main cabin into the tanks, and performed an emergency thaw. Oddly though, the ship had only thawed me, and I assumed that I was the only one needed to fix the problem. I continued to assess the situation but the controls were becoming increasingly confusing and daunting. I quickly started to realize that I was getting oxygen deprived, and I began to panic. Blackness clouded the edges of my vision, and just before passing out I realized what had really happened. With the last of my strength I redirected the oxygen to the main cabin and sealed off the oxygen to the tanks. My only hope was that the leak existed somewhere in the tanks and sealing them off would stop it. The next thing I remember, I was waking up, slouched uncomfortably in the control chair, still loosely belted in. The oxygen levels in the cabin were stable. I was alive. Unfortunately, as I had learned just prior to blacking out, the same could not be said about the rest of my crew. I was the only one left. All the alarms were off, and I had some more time to figure out what was going on. I learned that the leak was located somewhere in the tanks, and I was able to isolate it by cutting off the oxygen supply to them. The computer had in fact attempted to thaw all of the crew, but it prioritized my oxygen during the quick thaw. The computer had to ensure that at least one of us got through the thaw alive and was able to fix the problem. But why me? Why did the computer prioritize my oxygen supply out of the entire crew? And who the hell designed that and didn't tell me about it? It wasn't until writing this that I realized the gravity of this situation. All of my crew members are dead, and I'm alone in space traveling away from the Earth at 250,000 kilometers a second. This is really bad. It might not sound like it, but I guess I'm just in shock. I can't stand to think about how they must look right now, half thawed in those refrigerators. I can't help but think about my family. I'm not married, which is the only reason I was actually able to go on a 33 year trip, but my parents are going to have no idea what's going on until I get back to our home system. Destiny has no long-range communication systems for a variety of reasons, but most importantly, the ship is already traveling close to light speed, so messages would take forever to reach the ship, and the distance back to Earth is simply way too far away for current technologies to reach. So I'm alone, and no one is coming to save me. 
All this adrenaline paired with the fact that I've been asleep for eight years has left me incredibly drained. I'm going to take one last check on all the computer systems and then try and get some sleep. Log date, 13th of April, 2051. The time is 12.13. They told us that waking up from cryogenic storage wasn't going to feel good, but they didn't say that I was going to feel like this. I awoke more sore than I've ever been. I guess earlier, I had too much adrenaline to feel much of anything, but that's worn off and I feel terrible. The lining of my stomach feels like it's on fire, my mouth is dry and I can barely walk. The very first thing I did when I woke up was bolt to the water reclaimer and chugged it until I thought I might puke. When frozen, all your biological processes are temporarily suspended. This means that you don't need oxygen, water, food, or anything else really, so long as you stay frozen. This also means that you wake up extremely thirsty, and with a killer headache. It will be a few days before I'm fully recovered from the storage, and I've learned some troubling facts. I can't put oxygen back into the tanks until I fix the leak, and the only way I'll be able to fix the leak is by doing an EVA. I don't know how I'll fix the leak exactly, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. For now, I have to face the reality that going outside the ship right now is a really bad idea. This means that I'll have to wait until I reach Capeton B to do the EVA necessary to fix it. More importantly, no oxygen means no cryogenic storage. The computer won't let me freeze myself unless I have an oxygen flow to the tanks. All this to say, I'm going to have to spend the next nine years alone on this ship. This led to another troubling discovery. As I said before, you don't need any food when you're frozen, which means NASA was kind enough to only leave us with seven months worth of food each. Seven months times seven crew members makes three and a half years worth of food. I may be able to stretch that to four years since I won't be burning many calories, but not the full four and a half years that this trip will feel like, assuming I turned around as soon as I go to Capeton Star. <sighs> I guess I can figure out a solution later. I have plenty of time. I'm going to spend the rest of the day searching the cabin for anything useful and running checks on all the systems to make sure there are no major problems. Log date, 15th of April, 2051. Time, 1656. I kept thinking about how time was going so quickly yesterday. And today I expected to sleep in some, since I went to sleep around 2300, but I woke up at 1945. I slept for almost 24 hours. I was baffled before realizing, duh, relativity. Einstein does it again. Every minute I spend on this ship is two minutes on my clocks, which are adjusted to display Earth time. We were never supposed to be awake while traveling this speed, so it's not something NASA ever thought about. I'll readjust my sleep schedule so that I sleep during even days, and I'm awake during odd days. It doesn't help that the ship is lit with the world's most oppressive fluorescent lights that I can't figure out how to turn off. I was never actually meant to control the ship like this. That was Matthew's job. But I had been briefed on all the controls just in case something happened. And sure enough, in my searches I found no more food. Limited supplies that I already knew about. Some tubing, repair supplies, gum, etc. And some books and music brought by my crewmates. One book in particular, Pale Blue Dot by Carl Sagan stuck out to me. A book that, as an astronaut, I really should have read by now, but had somehow managed to avoid. The Pale Blue Dot refers to Earth and its tiny size in comparison with a vast cosmos. It's very fitting for this trip and I can see why Daniel brought it along. I'll enjoy reading that one. John also brought along a Bible. 
Most of my crew is religious, if you couldn't tell by their names. Personally, I've never really thought much about it. I've always been into space, and I guess that keeps me covered on my spiritual quota. But I've got a lot of time, so maybe I'll become a little more religious. It probably could help my outlook, because things aren't looking very good. I think I thought of a potential way to survive with enough food until I reach Cape Town B. I wonder how long partially frozen meat lasts. Oh shit. I finally found the light switch. Thank god, man. I can finally get some real sleep. Oh, never mind. As soon as I turn the lights out, some dim, orange emergency light comes on. I suppose that's better than nothing. Log date, 17th of April, 2051. 1722. This is the hardest decision I've ever had to make in my life. Whether to survive or die. I've concluded after much thought that the only way I'm getting out of this situation alive is to eat my dead crew members for nourishment. I can't believe I'm actually considering this. I decided that I'd rather die than live the rest of my life without on my conscience. I could never defile the corpses of my friends. I just don't have it in me. I have to come up with another way to survive or I'm going to die out here. I decided to consult my handy Bible to see what it had to say about... about cannibalism. And I found two verses. Leviticus 26.29 you shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. Jeremiah 19.9 And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters, and everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbor in the siege and in the distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life afflict them. Doesn't seem like God really likes cannibalism. Reading this made me wonder whether or not this god was testing me with his ordeal. Had I sinned so badly that the only proper punishment was forcing me to eat the flesh of my friends to survive? Was I deserving of such a punishment that I would be reverted to a primal, beast-like state of kill or be killed? Or rather, eat or be killed? I'm pretty sure animals eat their own species and don't mind, but my crewmates aren't just livestock. They had hopes and dreams and aspirations, many of which I knew and shared with them. How could I ever degrade their bodies like that? I continue to tell myself that I will never do this, but I fear that my instinct to survive will overcome the illusion of honor that I still hold dear. For now, I'm eating the food that NASA sent with us. It's pretty good for space food, especially considering I haven't had a good meal in nine years. Speaking of which, my symptoms seem to be lessening. My headache has subsided and I'll be able to move more freely, though my soreness and aching still persist. Log date 19th of April 2051-1424 Damn it, if I'm going to die, why don't I just do it now? All I'd have to do is cut off the oxygen supply and black out and it would be over. If I've exhausted all my options, I don't understand why I haven't just ended it yet. If I know that I'm going to starve, I don't see much of a reason to sit here for years and wait on my death. I should go out with dignity and honor and die with my crew. But I'm a coward. I stare at the controls knowing exactly how to turn off the oxygen supply, but I just can't do it. I just sit there and cry and my tears well up on my face because of the surface tension and because there's no gravity to pull them down to my cheek. I continued to read through John's Bible and I found, fittingly, the verse I was looking for. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so I finally accepted what I had to do. I decided to survive. And damn it, if God is going to damn me to hell because I ate some already dead people so that I could get to Capedon B and potentially save all of mankind, then so be it. If God so loved the world, then certainly he'd want me to save it. 
Log date, 21st of April, 2051. 5.51. I have a lot of time on my hands. I spend most of my days looking out the windows of the cabin at the vastness of space. I feel like I'm adrift in the most massive ocean mankind has ever set sail upon. Albeit I'm aboard what is likely the most expensive ship ever made. I figure the price of the ship is irrelevant if it's unable to safely deliver its passengers. The time that I don't spend looking out the glass, I spend somersaulting through the air. I'll be damned if I'm going to let a little bit of death and misery ruin my fun in zero gravity. As unprofessional as it might sound, well, I think these logs have become much more unprofessional than they were originally intended anyway. One of the things I was most looking forward to about this trip was the limited amount of time I got to spend bouncing off the walls in zero-g. Looking on the bright side, I have all this room to myself now. I just hope I don't break anything. As fun as zero-g is, I found myself getting increasingly bored, and I know that the next few years are going to be very, very long. I'm almost already through the whole Bible and it's only been a few days. I know it's unusual to read the Bible like a novel, but it's one of the only books I have, and I'm saving Pale Blue Dot until I really need it. Log date, 23rd of April, 2051, 1212. I finally finished the whole Bible. I know that doesn't sound all that exciting, but for me, it's a big deal. You'd think the experience would have left me feeling all spiritual and at peace, but mostly I feel anxious. One popular story that stuck out to me and was relevant was the story of Noah's Ark. I couldn't help but wonder whether or not the situation back home on Earth had anything to do with that. I made the connection of my ship, Destiny, to the Ark, but I don't really remember Noah eating his family. That being said, after the flood, God did tell Noah, everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. And that was unsettling to say the least. It's probably just a coincidence, but my mind keeps playing games with me. And being alone all day in this tiny cabin with only a few books, I'm destined to make some connections. I've been putting off what I have to do, but if I keep putting it off, the meat will go bad, and it will all be for nothing. As much as I don't want to, I'm going to go prepare some of the meat to be eaten. Log date 25th of April, 2051, 7.31. Last night, in my new adjusted schedule, was easily the worst night of my life. First decision was who to eat first. I decided Carlos. He is the largest of us and we weren't all that close. I won't get into the details, but I had some tools in my toolbox and I salvaged the edible meat and left what was remaining in the tank and just pushed it back into the wall. The look on his face was a look of betrayal and I couldn't help but think I made a horrible mistake, but I pressed on. I had my first meal last night. I don't have anything that I can start a fire with, since NASA was sure to make everything on this ship 100% fireproof. Even if I was able to make a fire, I wouldn't be able to make one every day. So I decided to just eat the meat raw. It wasn't good, but it was edible, and I tried not to think about what I was doing. It definitely took an emotional toll, though. I can't stop thinking about what I've done, and I feel sick to my stomach. All my symptoms from the cryosleep are gone, but they've been replaced with worse symptoms from this experience, most notably nausea and headaches. I'm about to have my second meal, followed by a day of staring into space and thinking about what I've done. Log date, 27th of April, 2051. Time is 1712. More system checks today. I'm going to start Pale Blue Dot. 
I know I said I should wait until I really need it, but I really need it. Log date, 2nd of May, 2051, 1243. I found a passage in the book that was circled in black pen, presumably by Matthew. It follows a picture of the Earth taken by Voyager 1, a space probe launched almost 70 years ago. The picture shows Earth, an infinitely small dot in the middle of vast blackness. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. And then there's me. I'm sitting aboard the equivalent of Voyager 1, Destiny. The Earth is way too far away to be seen from here, but I can imagine just how small it would be. It dawned on me that I'm further away from Earth than any human has ever been in the history of mankind. I think it's interesting how dangerous the universe is. All that's keeping me from boiling alive is a thin sheet of metal or glass. This ship, Destiny, is like a pocket of life in the vast death that is the cosmos and even it is filled with death. I used to have an amazing fascination with the cosmos and all of its beauty and wonder, but what kind of god would make a universe where 99.9% .9 of it will kill you instantly? Two of the lines of that quote are highlighted in orange sharpie. The first, in our obscurity, in all of this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. I'm not sure why Matthew highlighted this line, 
or if it was him at all, but if he only knew how relevant this quote would be. Not only for Earth itself, but for me and destiny. No one is coming to save me. And no one is going to save Earth if we don't do it ourselves. This quote gives me newfound hope and purpose, and I am reminded that I'm going and doing what I have to in order to ensure that mankind will live on. At least that's what I keep telling myself. The next highlighted line is, Visit yes, settle not yet. Like it or not, for the moment the earth is where we make our stand. This one makes a little bit more sense. It's just like Matthew, and it directly relates to our mission. Back in 1990, humanity had no place to settle other than Earth. That was our mission, to change that. We were supposed to give mankind a new home, but Matthew never made it. Log date, 6th of May, 2051, 13.05. My sleep schedule is messed up. It's hard to keep it straight when you're in complete control of how light it is in the cabin. Space is always darker. Daytime just means I have the lights on. Everybody knows who Carl Sagan is, but I don't think anyone knows Carl Sagan as well as I do. Sure, some people have read his full biography, or knew him personally, but no one has known him the way I know him, by studying his text so religiously. I may not know where the man was born, but I understand who he was by studying his writing. Okay, that might be an over-exaggeration, but when you're all by yourself for years with a handful of books, you want those books to be yours. Log date, 9th of May, 2051, 716. I spent some time rereading the Bible, and I found something worth sharing. Revelations 8:12. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. I don't know how exactly this relates to my situation, but I know there's something there. Log date, 11th of May, 2051, 1414. The boredom is getting much worse and I'm running out of things to do. I'm having anxiety about being stuck in this tiny cabin, and I've been having nightmares of my crewmates coming back to life and crawling out of their storage tanks, their flesh rotting off their faces. In the dreams, I have the audacity to worry about how, if the meat was rotting, I couldn't eat it. I decided to have a quick look this morning. All the bodies are still in good condition and definitely not alive. Up to this point, I've been too paranoid to even open the other storage tanks, but I needed to check on the meat. I started the nasty habit of watching the clock, too, as if expecting a day or two to just disappear. This just makes time go slower, and I get even more miserable. I reanalyzed the verse from earlier. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. What's interesting about this is that both a third of the day and a third of the night are missing. That's not less sun shining, I realized. That's less time. Relativity. And then I had a horrible thought. I rejected the idea, disgusted at its ludicrousness, but a lump rose in my throat as I looked at the numbers finely painted on the cryosleep tanks. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And on mine, the number four, the seven angels of revelation, the seven crew members of destiny, the fourth angel. I decided to reread the surrounding verses to get some more clues. The other angels sound trumpets that call for horrible plagues and death to happen on Earth. The more I think about it, the more ludicrous I think the connection is. 
I just can't help but feel like this has something to do with us. Like we're triggering events to happen in the Revelation. The main lights just went out and the emergency lights came on. I can't seem to get them back on. And this whole time I've been complaining about the oppressive lights and now, as soon as they're gone, I yearn for them. I fear I will be in near darkness for the rest of this trip. Log date, 15th of May, 2051, 1609. To be clear, I don't need my other crew members to complete the mission. The main reason seven crew members came along is to keep everyone sane for the time we were intended to be stuffed in Destiny's cabin, or on the lander module on the surface of Capeton B. Destiny does most of the work automatically. The crew is only here to do repairs and to land on the surface of Capeton B. I won't be able to land on the surface with just one man, but I can still get plenty of data and make the mission worthwhile. Once I get to Capeton B, I can do an EVA and get the oxygen breach filled, and I can sleep cryosleep all the way back home. Today, I did some more systems checks, and planned out every step of the mission from now until I reach home on some scrap paper NASA conveniently provided. I'm starting to get more hopeful that I can complete the whole mission and still return a hero, only to be overshadowed by the sacrifice of my crew members for the success of the mission. Doubt has inevitably set in and I'm starting to wonder whether or not I will actually be regarded as a hero or a monster. 19th of May 2051, 1352. I've read all the books now, listened to all the music multiple times. I can't find anything else worthy of doing with my time. I don't think I'm going to read the Bible anymore. It just makes me feel worse than before, and I'm more uncertain after putting it down than when I picked it up in the first place. I found more understanding in Pale Blue Dot, and some of the other science-related reads. Yeah, us astronauts like science books, big surprise there. I found peace in the humility demonstrated by the astronomy books, and beauty in the chemistry books. In hard times, people, including myself, like to turn to spirituality but the natural world seems to be the best opiate for me. It's ironic, really. I love the cosmos so much, yet it's constantly, patiently waiting to kill me. Speaking of which, the carbon dioxide alarms are going off, and I'm not sure why. Maybe it's carbon dioxide. Log date, 21st of May, 2051, 362. Yeah, it's carbon dioxide. Something's wrong with my air regulator. Ideally, the regulator keeps carbon dioxide at normal levels, but for some reason the levels are steadily increasing. I guess my perfect little oasis isn't so perfect anymore. Thanks, NASA. In reality, NASA's genius engineers are the only reason I'm still alive and are probably going to be responsible for saving the human race only because they were able to come up with an ingenious way to travel at 85% the speed of light. Are we even able to make this trip? I'll just have to fix this regulator before the carbon dioxide levels reach lethal levels. I'll get to it tomorrow. Right now, I'm rereading Pale Blue Dot. Yes. Again. Log date 23rd of May, 2051. 612. Carbon dioxide levels have reached 4% and are climbing. Symptoms will start at around 5% and I'll be unconscious at 10%, so I need to fix it by then. I messed with the reclaimer for an hour or so, and I can't find the problem. Not to mention it's dark because the main lights aren't working, and I'm trying to see using only the emergency lights. I fished a flashlight out of the supply cabinet, but that didn't help much. I'm starting to get worried about this. Luckily, NASA's engineers made everything really easy to repair, and I have schematics for everything on the ship. I am running low on meat, and I haven't been eating as much, so I got faint after staring at the schematics for too long. Tomorrow, I'll fix the reclaimer and prepare some meat. 
25th of May, 2051. Time is 8.13. Shit, I can feel the effects of the carbon dioxide already. It's sitting at 7%, and I'm wondering why I took so long to fix this and let it get so bad. I should have repaired the regulator earlier because the CO2 is making me so dizzy that it's almost impossible. If I can't manage to fix the reclaimer, this may have all been for nothing. No, 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 no. No. Shit, I lost the schematics. I don't know how to fix this damn thing without the schematics. I know I left them in the supply cabinet yesterday, and I've searched everywhere in this tiny cabin and they're nowhere to be found. How could I misplace something in this small of an area? I need to keep searching. Only 8% CO2 levels. 27th of May, 2051 to 1612. I found the schematics and fixed the regulator. Carbon dioxide levels are back down to normal, thank God. Oddly enough, I found the schematics in a locked cabinet under the control panels. I don't remember ever using those cabinets, let alone storing something in them. I assume I was just so dizzy from the carbon dioxide that I mistook the locked cabinet for the supply cabinet. But I would think I'd remember using the key. All that matters is that I'm no longer in any immediate danger. All systems seem normal. Also, the lights flickered back on today, which was a big help in repairing the regulator. It's refreshing to have the lights, and the cabin is a lot messier than I remember it being. I'll spend the rest of the day cleaning up the cabin. Log date, 29th of May, 2051, 916. I lost my science books. Admittedly, this is getting a bit weird. How can I lose the only possession that I really care about? I cannot lose those books though. I have to find them. You're going to laugh at me when you hear where I found the books. I found them in the locked cabinet. But when I found them, I didn't laugh. I began to cry. I didn't cry because I was sad, I cried for every other reason. I cried because I was happy to find my books, but most I cried because I didn't put my books in the locked cabinet. I'm still crying and I don't know why, but it's getting hard to write. The 31st of May, 2051, 1614. I decided to check the cameras to see how my books ended up in the locked cabinet. Immediately after checking the recorded footage, the first thing I noticed was how horrible I looked. Somehow, despite having nothing else better to do, I hadn't kept up with even the most basic hygiene. To be fair, there's not enough water for us to shower. But we have soapy water and towels to simulate a shower, and we definitely have enough toothpaste and deodorant. I guess when there's no one else there to smell you, you don't take care of yourself as well. Even so, I looked worse than that. I had a longer than expected beard, matted hair, and bloody, stained clothes. Then I saw what I was really looking for. I watched myself grab the science books from the supply cabinet, unlock the cabinet, place the books inside, lock it, and resume staring out the window. I can't, for the life of me, remember doing that. I took the rest of the day to very thoroughly clean myself and the rest of the cabin. I also shaved my face and clipped my nails. I feel significantly better than before and I wasted a whole day. 2nd of June, 2051, 1924. I cleaned most of the day away again. Not much to say here except the cabin is as neat and organized as the day I arrived. 4th of June, 2051, 6.31. I've been putting it off again, but today's the day. Who's next? I chose John. I don't even know why, but I just chose him like a lottery. Then began the cutting, tearing in the face of betrayal. I decided to go about it differently, though. I prayed for him before the procedure, 
and placed a sheet over his face. Looking back at some of my old journal entries, I feel pretty barbaric about how I did it last time. I think I was so overwhelmed by the process that I didn't have time for anything else. This procedure was so painless that I've decided I'll go ahead and cut up Matthew and Jennifer today too. No more meat cutting for a few months. I had a nice meal once I was done, and I didn't feel as guilty as before. I felt like I had given them the respect they needed. 6th of June, 2051, 12.34 One of the things that I've been neglecting is working out. If you're not careful, the lack of gravity in space can make your muscles weak. I've been more careful about this recently, and I've been doing all the exercises that I was told to do. I've been keeping busy, and I feel as good as someone all alone in the middle of space eating his friends could feel. 8th of June, 2051, zero hour. Happy birthday to me. Today I turn 29. I know my parents are celebrating even though I'm not there. This reminded me that Carter's birthday was a few days ago. To be fair, we slept through about eight of his previous birthdays, but since I'm awake, I figured I'd celebrate his alongside with mine. I went back to the rations that NASA provided and ate the most glamorous meal I could find for the both of us. Log date 10th of June, 2051, 9-12. I started to read the Bible again, maybe out of boredom, maybe out of interest. I'm not really sure, but I did. And I'm glad I did because I found this verse. Matthew 626 Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? This made me think that maybe God wants me to get fed, despite how horrible it is. Maybe this is all necessary for some reason. I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat so that I can survive, not for me, but for mankind. 12th of June, 2051, 235. I went to turn on the lights this morning and they didn't turn on. My heart dropped. No more lights. I have an odd feeling that they're gone for good this time, but I'm not a man of superstition without cause, so I'm going to keep trying. 14th of June, 2051, 6.15. My sleep schedule's off again. I need to get that back on track. I keep reading the Bible in search of another verse that will cheer me up. I've already read every verse, but sometimes when I read the same thing at a different time, it can mean something completely different. So I keep reading. I spent a lot of the day looking out into space, something I've avoided doing recently. I have to remember to keep doing my exercises, but it's hard in the dull orange light of the cabin. 16th of June, 2051, 1213. Something horrible happened today. I think I saw a cockroach. I am deathly afraid of roaches. I'm not generally afraid of things, let alone insects, but cockroaches hold a special place in my own personal hell. I know, I know. A cockroach could never live for eight years on a spaceship, but I know I saw it and I'm paranoid that he'll crawl into my bunk at night and down my throat or something. It's an illogical fear, I know, but the brain rarely functions on logic alone. 18th of June, 2051, 1919. I spent all day searching for the cockroach. Finally, my worries have subsided. There is no cockroach on destiny, thank God. 20th of June, 2051, 1642. Spent today doing system checks and reading books. I had to do a little maintenance on the water reclaimer, but nothing serious. Destiny is working fine. 12th of July, 2051, 1435. I haven't been doing my log lately. I was supposed to log every day that I was awake, but obviously that was supposed to be for seven months, not for four years. 
Also, the time difference means that I've only been doing a log every other day. Nothing interesting has happened, and I didn't see much of a reason to log anything. It's not like there's much NASA can learn from what I do on a day-to-day -day basis while stuffed in this giant metal death trap. I logged in today just to update. I've been doing plenty of reading, some exercising, and keeping up with my hygiene as much as possible. The cabin isn't that clean, but it's been worse, and I'll have fun cleaning it all up in a day later. I'm 100% sick of all the music that my crew brought with them, and I'm only about three months in. This is going to be such a long trip. Log date 24th of July 2051, 031. I saw the cockroach again today. I knew at that moment that my mind was deceiving me, but as hard as I tried, I could not make it disappear. There it was, clear as day. I grabbed a book and went after it, but it quickly scurried behind some wiring and was gone. I looked through the Bible on anything about roaches. I found a lot about locusts, but nothing on roaches. Then again, I'm not really sure I'd know what I was looking at if I did see a locust, so maybe that's close enough? Exodus 10.4 If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. Great. 26th of July, 2051, 1912. I saw the locust. I mean, cockroach, today. It was on the ceiling of the cabin next to one of the emergency lights. I swung my book frantically at it, and in the process I managed to destroy the light, but not the roach. Damn it. 28th of July, 2051, 035. I swear I felt roaches crawling on me in the night. I'm terrified. 13th of August, 2051, 2.13. I haven't been sleeping much. Every time I sleep, I dream that roaches are crawling on me and I wake up to myself scratching the skin off my legs. Instead, I just stay awake and snack on my meat and look out the window. I realize that before too long I'll be able to eat NASA's food again. And this nightmare will be that much closer to being over. 24th of August, 2051, 609. Still haven't been sleeping much. Zero gravity is starting to get old, and I miss being able to walk around normally. I miss the trees and the grass and the blue sky, and I miss being on Earth with my friends and family. And I miss having something to do other than stare out a window. Log date 6th of September, 2051, 919. I hadn't seen the cockroach for at least a week, and I thought it was finally gone, but boy was I wrong. Now there's more. At least three. I see them constantly. They won't stop taunting me, and I can't kill any of them. They sit there, on the wall opposite to me taunting me to kill one of them to verify my sanity, but they escape my grasp. Log date 8th of September 2051, 1612. Today I ran out of meat, and I had to cut up my fifth crew member, Carter. I didn't do the Bible regiment with Carter. I thought about it, but his face looked angry, and it made me angry, and I didn't think Carter deserved it. Carter had a lot more blood than the others, which was odd and annoying and I got mad at him for a moment before realizing how stupid that was. 24th of September, 2051, 602. Carter was a small guy and I need to cut up my final crew member today. Thank God that I'm almost done eating these guys. I'll be glad to go back to eating something better soon. I thought there was cockroaches in his body I knew there couldn't be, but I could see them with my eyes and feel them on my arms, and I vomited on the floor. The smell from the body was horrible. I finished cutting up the flesh that I could salvage and piled the remains back in the tank. I never have to cut up another human being for the rest of my life. 
26th of September, 2051, 1213. My final crew member's flesh tastes putrid and horrible, but I have no choice. The cabin is starting to smell like death and body odor, but I can't be bothered to clean it. 3rd of October, 2051, 2353. I hate these stupid fucking lights. All I want is some real darkness so I can get one night of real sleep in this damn cabin. I hate this small cabin. It's cramped and it smells and it's lonely. I hate NASA. 23rd of October, 2051, 010. I haven't slept in a week. I found a verse in the Bible that I like. Matthew 2752. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. I cry whenever I read it. If this happened to my friends, I would be more happy than you could possibly imagine. Even though I've been reading the Bible, I haven't once prayed. But I prayed that God would bring my friends back to life. 14th of November, 2051, 2142. I ran out of meat. 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 I get to eat NASA's food for the next three and a half years, and I never have to eat anyone ever again. 16th of November, 2051, 613. NASA's food isn't as good as I remember. I... I miss my meat. 17th of November, 2051, 1232. Thanks a lot, NASA. Thank you so much, NASA, for this nasty, freeze-dried meat. This is not meat. This isn't food. A man needs real meat to survive. Maybe I could eat some of the cockroaches. 18th of November, 2051, 1316. Some of my NASA food went missing. I figure I'll have to eat some of the human remains I left over in order to survive. Of course, I went for the freshest remains and harvested what was still good to eat. 24th of November, 2051, 619. The cockroaches are reproducing. Maybe they stole my missing food. They have to be eating something. Now there's hundreds. I think they're attracted to the lights because they crowd around them. 25th of November, 2051, 909. I woke up this morning to almost pitch blackness. The roaches must have destroyed the rest of my lights in the night. The only light I had crept in from the windows from distant stars. I grabbed my flashlight from the cabinet to look around. The roaches scurry away from the oppressive light of my flashlight, and I can only see them scurry away. Happy Thanksgiving. I celebrated by eating the last of the remains that I gathered. 30th of November, 2051, 013. I used to spend most of my time reading by flashlight, but today my flashlight batteries died. I was so angry that I threw it across the cabin and the flashlight broke something. I don't know what, nor do I care. I'm still eating NASA's shitty food by starlight. 3rd of December 2051, 2314. I think the roaches are coming from outside the spacecraft, so I have to seal it off. I saw one come right through the window earlier today. It crawled right through the glass. I used everything I could to plug holes in the cabin, and I used pages of my Bible to cover the windows. Maybe the roaches are demons, and the pages will keep them out. And that gave me a great idea. I spread the pages of the Bible everywhere throughout the cabin to protect me from the demons. I'm finally safe. 6th of December, 2051, 1816. I finally understand how I connect to the Angels of Revelation. I can't tell you, though. I'm going to keep it to myself. 
It's between me and God now, and NASA can never know. 8th of December, 2051, 1219. The roaches weren't stopped by the pages. They crawl on them, and they leave their wretched feces on my pages, the bastards. Every time I close my eyes, they crawl all over me. I can feel them under my skin. So I scratch until my skin comes off, but I can never make it stop. My arms and legs barely have any skin left on them at all. And if I don't have skin, no bugs can crawl under it. 14th of December, 2051, 031. I finally understand why I had to eat my friends. God will never let us interfere with his plans. He was punishing me for my actions. He sent the roaches like he sent the locust, my personal hell on earth, in space. 25th of December, 2051, 1200 hours. Merry Christmas. And I celebrated with the rest of the crew today. John didn't come, and I don't know why. 26th of December, 2051, 1319. Today, I realized I'm not going to make it to the star. I was never meant to. If I made it home, I would be the scum of the earth. The only proper thing to do is ensure that no one ever finds out what happened on Destiny. 27th of December, 2051. 0666. Today I changed the navigation to steer directly into Capedon Star, destroying all evidence of my heresy. I will burn my sins. 1st of January, 2052. I didn't turn off the oxygen. It was the cockroaches. I just watched them do it. Then I watched the oxygen meter slowly lower. I didn't know if this was what I wanted, but it was my destiny. I watched the meter tick down until I started to get tired. Then I sat down to write this log, and the lights went out, and I... End of Vlog Journal of Destiny Astronaut Jason Falcon What really happened to the Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity is not what the news is telling you. It is absolutely imperative that the truth about what happened to Oppie and what followed be relayed to the public. To hell with laws and protocol. I was part of the team designated within NASA to track the movements of the Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity, or more aptly named, Oppy. I am here to tell you that you have been lied to. Oppy did not simply expire due to some ill-conceived dust storm like you have been told. Although, I would much rather that be the case. But once again, that is a farce. 
Our mission was dedicated to the exploration of our neighbor, the Red Planet. To say the least, I was honored to be a part of humanity's ascension to the last frontier. I felt elated and even godlike. How many people could honestly say they were doing something bigger than their mundane lives? At the end of my day, the answer to that question did not matter to me. The only thing that mattered was what lay beyond our atmosphere, but being a part of that meant uncovering things we had no business meddling in. I remember standing over Maria's shoulders. Her long brown hair was draped behind her ears with expensive looking headphones. She was staring intensely at the computer screen in front of her. We started picking this up around 0958 Sulu. I have no idea what this is. Oppy was located there. She nodded towards the giant screens at the front of the floor. It seems to get louder as Oppy moves south. This doesn't sound like any sort of weather anomaly to me, and we've been analyzing it. Maria gestured to her own computer screen at the audio waves. There seems to be a source. Her voice shook slightly. She passed me her headphones and I precariously put them over my ears. Maybe I would hear the rumblings of tectonic plate shifting, but I was not sure what to expect. Maria pressed play. Low, echoing octaves were traveling around Oppie. It sounded like a deep voice humming eerily, almost like some sort of chant. But no, that was ridiculous. This was not a voice. Mars was dead, so what silly type of conclusion was that? Maria was staring at me with her wide, almond-shaped eyes, attempting to anticipate my thoughts. I passed back her headphones and straightened my back. It sounds creepy, right? She inquired a little too loudly. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> it is certainly unusual. It suddenly occurred to me that I had the entire watch floor's attention. Had I been the last person to listen to this? I instructed Maria to forward the recording to an acoustic engineer team we had stationed in an effort to provide us with a rash and logical explanation. I have taken the liberty to upload what I was able to get my hands on. How long has Oppie been picking up this anomaly? The anomaly is what we had come to address it as. For the past five hours, Maria answered promptly. It's been getting louder. Pull up Oppie's path, I gestured towards the screen. Immediately, a grey-scale satellite map of Mars filled the display. Small, blue tick marks annotated Oppie's travels along the terrain. Oppie was currently located in the Kronos 15 quadrant, an area of rocky land. Um, we've been leading Oppie on the eastward path towards the cliffs on the far side of K-15, one of the terrain analysts explained. I had already been aware. My superiors had given me that directive to pass to them. I debriefed my chief within the hour on the anomaly. If I was being honest with myself, Maria was right. It did sound creepy. Follow the sound. I relayed the order. It had been what my superiors wanted. An intense bout of curiosity overwhelmed me, mixed with a barely contained veil of excitement. I received several looks of satisfaction and wonder when I passed down the order. The only one who appeared as though they wanted to protest was Maria. She was a quiet little mouse always kept to herself. 
dutifully listening to any sounds or signals that might be of interest to the agency. She opened her mouth to say something, but abruptly shut it. Now, it took longer than we would have liked to find the source of the mysterious sound. It's common knowledge that MER-1 has a speed of less than a quarter of a mile. In the 15 years that Oppie had been active, our little explorer had traveled about 28 miles, an incredible feat. The mission was only supposed to last 90 days, but went far beyond than expected. An anomaly was captured on the rim of the Endeavor Crater, right along Marathon Valley. It was a few days later that we received a distant video of the source. There had been dust and sand particles, what we assumed to be the dust storm, but it was not a natural occurrence as we had originally thought. What, what is that? My voice shook with wonder as the entire watch floor stared at the screen, attempting to make out what Oppie had sent back. The video was grainy. Red swirls of sand pervaded the screen, making it a bit difficult to make out at first glance. But as my eyes adjusted, my mind began to comprehend what it was I was looking at. A single source of green light emanated powerfully through the dust from some sort of structure hundreds of feet from Oppie. The light seemed to be pulsating, kicking up the sand, essentially creating its own isolated dust storm. We directed Oppie to move forward. We wanted a closer look. Excitement tingled through the air as Oppie steadily approached at a much slower rate than normal. The wind was becoming powerful. Were we on the verge of encountering alien life for the first time? I stared at the screen with my arms crossed tightly over my chest. It looks sort of like some sort of obelisk. I said slowly, before I could stop the words from tumbling out. But I was right. The obelisk in question appeared slightly taller than the average man. It was wider, though, and had to be made up of some sort of grayish metallic material. It slowly became clear that the green light glowed from some sort of Sanskrit or cuneiform writing etched onto the obelisk. Oppie came to a halt, angling its camera up towards the monument. It was just a few feet away with a much clearer view now. The writing was written in some sort of language that none of us obviously recognized. There was something else, though. To the left was some sort of picture carving. It could only be described as some writhing mass of tentacles. I have not been able to acquire Oppie's visual logs. Their classification level was elevated far above mine before I had a chance to take them. I apologize. But it was fascinating. Never had any human discovered the markings of an ancient civilization on a completely different planet. We were staring at the screen, awestruck by our discovery. Theories ran through my head at rapid speed. Was this tentacled creature some sort of god to the Martians of old? The anomaly was booming through our loudspeakers, and now we had proof it was coming from this strange obelisk on Mars. All of the team leads gathered in an office to explain what was happening to our superiors. Snapshots were sent of the ancient language to world-renowned linguists, and we waited with bated breath on what information we would get back. I was standing on the watch floor, smiling and laughing with my teammates about how we would be heroes and rich people because of this. 
I was sipping a hot cup of green tea when the directive came down to attempt to extract a sample from the obelisk. Maria's eyebrows were deeply furrowed. Is something wrong? I asked her hesitantly, glancing between her and the screen. I was hoping she would not answer. I did not want to miss a thing. I was feeling giddy, like some school kid finding out that school was cancelled and we had a snow day. I was right where I wanted to be. It's just that I was speaking to one of the linguists that we brought in, she began to explain, and he said that the markings on the obelisk were actually ancient Sumerian. The room was crowded now, full of scientists, engineers, among many others, all of us watching as someone guided Oppie to touch the obelisk. I snorted. <laughs> That's not possible. He was probably making it up to mess with you. Gullible people are easily susceptible to conspiracies. She glared at me. I thought the same thing. She hissed, lowering her voice. Let me show you. I rolled my eyes, preparing to move away, but she grabbed my forearm and dragged me to her workstation. She unlocked her computer and googled ancient Sumerian. My hands were on my hips, with a contemptuous expression. Look! Maria swung her computer screen. I don't know. It looks similar at a glance, I suppose. It seems far-fetched, don't you think? Before Maria had a chance to form a rebuttal, someone in the crowd gasped. My head snapped up just in time to see Oppie's visuals blacked back from a cloud of green plasma energy just as the claw touched the obelisk. It landed several feet away on its side. The camera was now angled horribly. The tip of the obelisk could be seen in Oppie's bottom right-hand corner. The frequency of its glowing pulses accelerated. Oppie's camera was moving in and out of focus, making everything far more hazy than they already were. A violent tremor vibrated underneath the little rover as a seemingly final pulse blasted from the obelisk. Oppie's screens went black on June 10th, 2018. There was a great panic, of course. Everything was done to resuscitate Oppie, but nothing worked. We tried for months, but we never got it back online. Everyone was scrambling over each other, trying to understand what happened. Everyone was questioned by an outside agency, and I had no idea who. Those in the room that had the necessary clearance were either shut out or brought in further into the fold. This was clearly something alien. The obelisk had not been built by humans but by Martians. I was dying to know what was going on, but I had been shut out and Maria had been brought in. When Maria pulled me aside in the middle of the hallway, she double-checked to make sure no one was in the vicinity. Another obelisk was found on Earth, in Guatemala. My stomach dropped. More questions than answers now, and it was driving me crazy. What? She waited until a few people passed us, darting nervous looks to the back of their heads. There was an earthquake a few months ago, on the same day Oppie touched the obelisk. Some locals found a cave opening that I guess opened up due to the shake. We sent people to the area a couple months ago to investigate. A contact of mine said that an American agency moved into the excavation site. I tried to reach out to them and the locals, but I've heard nothing for weeks. Who told you this? The word stumbled out. It all sounded crazy. Maria hesitated. He was at the excavation site. He would send me updates as they dug deeper. But like I said, I haven't heard anything in weeks. The worry in her voice was apparent. Maria 
gave me a final look before taking down the hallway and leaving me dumbstruck. The shock was quickly wearing off and this intense need to know what exactly was happening overcame me. I had seen the same feeling in the depths of Maria's eyes. I felt like every cell of mine was on fire. The pit of my stomach felt like it was constantly on the loop of a roller coaster. This terrible, aching curiosity followed me home. My palms had not stopped sweating with anticipation. I was sitting at my desk in the living room, gazing at my computer screen at the one-way tickets to Guatemala while contemplating wild theories more ridiculous than the next. What if our creators had come from Mars and passed on the gift of writing to the Sumerians thousands of years ago? What if they left behind ways for us to contact them? If so, they wanted us to find them. Maybe we had forerunners from another planet and our home planet was not actually Earth. Were we just a forgotten colony or some sort of experiment? I called Maria. She had already booked a ticket for tomorrow morning. I promptly did the same, packed a bag full of essentials, and met Maria at the airport the following day. We both were filled with that burning, unnatural need to just know, and we did not look back once we boarded that plane. My running theory was that the Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity electronically activated some sort of beacon, the obelisk, that in turn activated another one on Earth. Most people brushed it off as after tremors of the volcano that erupted that year, but the initiated knew better. Maria and I arrived in Guatemala and immediately set about finding her contact. She made several calls via WhatsApp, but he did not answer. How do you know about this? I asked, staring over her shoulder at her computer screen as I used to before. We had booked a hotel in Guatemala City and I used it as a base camp while we figured out where the earthly obelisk lay. Alex is a security contractor. He told me he was out here guarding some camp for excavators who had found the obelisk. He said there were... Well, there was a green light coming from a cave that they were digging into. She was typing away rapidly on her laptop as she spoke. I backed away, sitting down on my bed, and took a deep breath. We had been there for a week now, digging around for any sort of evidence, but nothing. I laid back letting my feet dangle over the bed and stared at the spinning fan above. I found him! I sat up a little too fast, staring at the back of Maria's head. How? She turned around, dangling an arm over the chair. Alex and I used to date, she began sheepishly. One night, he logged into my MacBook and never logged off. His last known location came up. I ignored my moral hiccups on that and we were off. I will not reveal the location of the excavation site, but we did find it in the end. We would not have been able to do it without Maria there to translate. <laughs> I cursed myself for not committing myself to learning Spanish in my college years. Our jeep managed to get us as far as a remote village 12 miles away from the site. If you have ever traveled to a third world country beneath the United States southern border, I mean really traveled, then you can already imagine what this village looked like. It was nothing like Cancun. This was a village in the middle of a jungle. It was a wonder that Alex, the contractor, received any signal way out here, because I had none on my phone. The metal sheets that held the shacks of the village were rusted in some places, which was to be expected in a humid jungle environment like that. An old woman was sitting in a rocking chair on a makeshift wooden porch, 
listening to some Spanish radio. A white, spotted mutt lay right beside her with its eyes closed. Sweat dripped down the back of my neck and I was constantly swatting mosquitoes away, but this woman, with all her wrinkles, seemed content. The village smelled of burnt wood, I thought. Maria explained that the people way down south burned their trash. There was no garbage men that came by to pick up people's trash in their garbage trucks, like we had back in the States. These people had to make do another way. White smokestacks of burnt garbage seemed to surround the village. A large truck that clearly did not belong sat on the edge of town. It was her grandson we spoke with. He was lanky and wore a dirty white tank top. He was darker than Maria. A machete leaned against the stairs to the porch. No te venía. ¿Por qué? Maria answered back. I stared back and forth between them as they conversed in a language I did not understand. His body language seemed to convey a sense of urgency, almost like he was pleading. What's he saying? I asked. He says we should stay away from the site. Maria snapped at me. That there was a cave-in. Apparently the Americans triggered it. She turned back. She asked another question in Spanish. More answers, more questions. Fear in only one half of the conversation and exasperation in another. Maria was the latter. A moment of silence passed and she spoke again, pleading this time. The young man glanced around anxiously as though Maria did not understand a lick of Spanish. He looked like he wanted to yell at her for a split second, but he took a deep breath and spoke evenly. Then he said something else and gestured for us to follow him, taking care to bring his machete with him. Chickens clucked and moved rapidly out of the way as we tailed him. Around the back of the house, say, a leaning metal shack, he opened the door. Pantelos, he commanded, gesturing inside. Inside, there were a few white biohazard suits. What were they doing with these? How had a poor village like this come to acquire these suits? None of it made sense. He says we should put them on. A truck, probably that big one over there, came through when the excavation first arrived and stayed in the village while they worked. They never came back for it, and the villagers decided to open it up. These suits were there, along with a bunch of medical supplies. How come they never came back for it? I blurted. I gazed at them, arching my head. They were rather bulky. I reached for one, but tossed it aside. There were red specks inside one of them, and I didn't want to think too hard about This is what we're here to find out. And to locate Alex, Maria added. The logical side of my brain was starting to clear through the fog of the burning, aching curiosity. This was crazy. Why were we delving into a jungle for an alien artifact that a person and likely several others had disappeared over? It was beyond stupid. This was not a government-sanctioned investigation. This was a couple of imbeciles going on some ridiculous adventure quest. Nevertheless, Maria and I put on the suits, and she smiled at me. The Guatemalan and several other men led us to a dirt road on the outskirts of the village. Quite a few smoking piles littered the area. He says that the Americans paved this road. It will lead us to the excavation site, Maria said with thinly veiled excitement. We moved forward, but a hand clasped my wrist. It was a man, the man we had been speaking to. Toma, el humo te puede ayudar. 
Maria, was already on her way back to the jeep in a hurry. I could not let her go by herself. I slipped what he had given me into my backpack, even though I had no idea what his words meant. We climbed into the jeep and took off. Just like everything else, I was not sure what to expect. Maria eased the jeep through the campsite. There were white tents and no one in sight that I could see. We hopped out of the vehicle. Even through the stifling plastic suits, the silence was somehow deafening. Not a leaf moved in the air like it had in the village. No songbirds chirped cheerily around us. It was deathly quiet. Maria slammed her door shut and I jumped. Will you please do your best to be quiet? I hissed at her angrily. She rolled her eyes. There's no one around. She threw her arms up. Then why are the trucks still here? I kept my voice low, but could not stop the irritation from seeping through. I thought this girl was smart, but I was starting to suspect otherwise. She ignored my comment. In case you weren't aware, you're not my team leader anymore, so you can take that stick up your ass and shove it down your throat. Maria pushed past me, speed walking through the site. I followed, trying to stifle a rebuttal. It was like she paid no mind to the tatters of biohazard suits or the assault rifles abandoned on the thick, muddy earth. I glimpsed a splatter of blood and tripped over some sort of large, cannon-like contraption. I smacked right into Maria. There it is, she gasped. Just ahead of us, there was an enormous mesh of boulders piled over the mouth of the cave. My eyes darted left and right. Were those explosive charges by that tent over there? I surmised that this was not a natural cave-in. Maria, I cautioned, but she began sprinting forward. I have to know. She reached the cave-in before I did. Every single fiber of what made me human was screaming for me to run. I could only watch with dread as Maria scaled the boulders. She tried to pry a rock loose, but when it would not budge, she climbed higher. Maria, this is n not safe. We should leave. My brain was firing off warnings every second that went by. She should not be near those rocks. We should not be there. Maria managed to heft one loose, creating a small gap in the cave. Immediately, something small and red shot out from the hole, striking Maria's face. She let out a shriek and fell back from her perch with a sickening crunch. She lay face up with her left leg bent at an odd angle. A chilling, deep, sigh escaped through the gap, but my brain had not registered it due to the fact that Maria started convulsing for a moment. I sprinted forward, sliding on my knees to her, about to lift her torso, but I froze. There were three holes in her faceplate. Three spiked red spores were embedded in the flesh of her face. One was stuck in her cheek, another one on the corner of her left eye, and the third on the corner of her chin, and they seemed to be trying to burrow in. It was then that I realized that those spikes were starting to wriggle. Maria's hands slapped up against her faceplate in desperation. Tears were streaming down her face, her shrieks piercing my ears. The spore near her eye was moving. A tendril flicked over her eye, seemed to elongate, pulled at the corner of her eye and forced its way inside. Maria's shrieks turned into inhuman screams of pain that I will never forget as the spore climbed up her chin and into her gaping mouth. The other simply kept digging into her cheek, spurting blood all over her face. I scrambled back, terrified. Then, 
her screams turned into distinctive moans of pleasure. Yes! Maria's face split into a smile of pure ecstasy. The blood vessels in her eyes popped, turning the whites of her eyes into Mars reds. I know! I know everything! Her skin seemed to bubble and morph as she turned on her side to look at me. Another voice echoed from the dark cave behind her. Join us! It rumbled, shaking the earth around me. It was deep. For I am your God. I am your peace. Maria stood up, towering over me on her broken leg. It snapped back into place as the spores spread through her body. Her eyes were wide. Alex is inside and he understands. He can see just as I can see. Her voice was distorted and fanatical. She choked slightly and her skin stretched. Thin, long tentacles slithered out of her eyes as her skin reddened and she stumbled towards me with her arms up to the heavens. It's come to save us. It was trapped by that beacon, but we've rescued it, and now it will save us just like it did for us before. She gurgled my name. Let it inside you. Oh, fuck. I scrambled back on my ass, but luckily she was slow and shaky. Sharp, tentacle-like claws had grown from her hands and poked out of her suit. She was a monstrosity. My hand smacked against the device that I had tripped over. My head flashed back to what the Guatemalan had given me. Matches. But this was a flamethrower. I had grabbed it and squeezed the trigger. Intense heat erupted from the end and fire engulfed Maria. No screams from her came. She just fell back and crumpled into ashes much faster than I thought possible. The ground shook again. I will consume this planet. It promised angrily as I ran for the tent with the charges. I do not know if I believe in a higher power, but that thing inside that cave was not God. Something had to have been on my side when I grabbed the explosives and managed to hurl it into the gap just as a fine, lazy mist of spores began to pour out. Maybe it was just luck, but the explosion that I set off made the cave-in a lot worse. I stood there, shaking, staring at Maria's burnt body. She had died with a sweet smile on her face, twisted by whatever evolution those spores had induced. She died happy. Her body eventually crumbled into ashes. I stood there for a long time, staring at the cave and shaking with the flamethrower in my hand, but no voice came from it again. I cried uncontrollably as I drove back. There was nothing else to do. This was the reason that NASA and the rest of the government had abandoned that excavation site. I do not have all the answers, but these are my theories. That beacon on Mars activated another on Earth when Oppy touched it. Maybe it was as a warning not to approach it. I never found out what the Sumerian had translated to, but I can only assume it was some type of warning about an all-knowing, tentacled creature that spread through red spores, infecting life as we know it. Maybe there was another one on Mars, and it woke up the thing that had slumbered beneath our planet. Perhaps those beacons are there to keep it locked away but when we excavated the site, we dug too deep and let it out. 
Some of the villagers had deduced that smoke or fire can keep it at bay. I figured that was what that plasma field on Mars was for. But how the fuck would I ever find out? Those red specks I saw in that suit was the one that Maria had put on. Those spores were a lot smaller, and she had inhaled them. While the smoke in the village was in my lungs, the spores in that suit had urged her on and fogged her thought process. I know, it sounds ridiculous, but it's the only thing that makes sense. Fire in any form keeps it away. It kills it. Maybe Earth was constantly fighting it with all those volcano eruptions we have been having lately. At least 200 people died when the Volcán de Fuego in Guatemala erupted. The volcano in Hawaii flowed steadily for years into the ocean. I could still hear its words. It said it was our god, and maybe it was, even though I seriously doubted that. I am a heavy smoker now. I hate the color red. I cry about Maria every other week. The details about what happened after do not actually matter. Do you really care about how I was questioned over Maria's disappearance? As soon as I mentioned the obelisk in Guatemala and how I had somehow managed to close it up even tighter, they relented. Something happened on Mars that killed every living thing on it. That's what I think. The tentacled monster carved onto the obelisk on Mars flashed in my head every single day. I imagined it was enormous and could cover the entire sky if it ate enough. I hope the day never comes that we find out. But somewhere in the back of my mind, no matter how many cigarettes I smoke, is that aching need to know. Attention, this is the crew log of Ensign Colby Jordan, role designated as Systems Technician. Current assignment is to cargo acquisition vessel Achilles IV, which is undergoing post-flight processing and containment procedures in docking port 2 at station Alpha Centauri. Information contained in this file has not yet been verified or vetted. Level 1 analysis of file indicates 11 security breaches committed in the creation of this file. Please, set your system security at Epsilon while accessing this data. Remember, your safety and the company's safety are one and the same. Log number 1, August 14th, 2074. I really have no idea how to begin this since I don't normally bother with doing logs in the first place. Always felt like a pointless exercise, since the ship AI keeps track of everything and the Jericho company execs don't give a shit what we think as long as it doesn't impact our jobs. I had to fight dirty with the Achilles AI just to get access to the logging program, so I'll just be blunt. They're dead. Everyone else is dead and the ship doesn't believe it. <sighs> Impossible, right? I mean, surely the bigwigs back on Earth created a perfect system, one that can't go wrong. We're so trusting of our machine captains that the corporate newsletters are always spouting off about the 92% mission success rate. Jericho AI has a thousand eyes and ears, can take control of any ship, and uses cold and practical logic to get the job done. 
Why even send humans on missions anymore? Except us, system technicians, know the bitter truth. The company can't afford to fashion every ship in the fleet with a true AI. So they slap together a bunch of cognitive programs into one fancy package designed to mimic a true artificial intelligence. It does fine with handling ship functions, but it's not an intellect that can think and adapt. That's why cargo ships are sent out with a crew of six humans, and why the captain isn't mechanical, but flesh and blood. It's also why we have implants in our chest that transmit our bio-readings to the ship, because that's the only way the system knows we're alive. That little fact is rather important, because Jericho trusts its state-of-the-art tech far more than it trusts its employees. Our rank affects which ship systems we can access without authorization from a higher rank. The captain, of course, has full authorization, but only if the computer allows it. And little old me, an ensign, is at the bottom of the rung. I can't even make a log entry without Captain Westinghouse's approval. But if the captain is rendered dead or incapacitated, the highest ranking crew member gets control. We don't make that determination, though. The computer does, because even though the system can't determine if we're alive or dead without help, it decides how to dole out control. Basically, we have a chain of command dictated by our implants. I should have control. I don't. Westinghouse and the others are dead. Their implants aren't. The expansion got them. But the computer still thinks they're alive. As a result, I'm locked out of most ship systems because I need captain authentication to do anything. But us techs are tricky bastards. I managed to put together a diagnostic program that forces the ship computer to go into maintenance mode for 21 minutes and 3 seconds every 24 hours. In that time, while the computer is distracted, I have the ability to enter the system and whittle away at the security firewalls and encryptions. It's been 57 hours since the crew died, and this log is my first success. I have to cut it short because I'm almost out of time. I'm going for the communication system next. I'll transmit a distress call and this log, and hope someone intercepts it in time, because this ship is on its way to Alpha Centauri Station and it cannot be allowed to dock. Repeat, do not allow this ship to dock under any circumstances. Log 2, August 18th, 2074. Three days attempting to send out a signal. Three wasted days. The expansion ate the comms array. I'm a tad demoralized right now, so I'm going to waste today's access time with another log entry. Even if I can't transmit any data off ship, I can at least keep a record of what happened here, in case the ship survives, but I don't. Though honestly, it'll be better if the ship doesn't survive either. I'm not ready to go that direction yet. We still have two months before Achilles IV arrives at the station. I have time. I suppose I should talk about the others. Florin, Mads, Kindy, Lars, and Westinghouse. None of them deserved what happened. They were all good workers, committed to the unofficial company slogan, the cargo comes first. I won't say we were great friends since I spent more time with the computer than talking to them about their home lives or significant others, but I'd sip a libation pack with any one of them. None of them were incompetent either. They didn't die because one of them got greedy or high and did something stupid. I know Jericho will try to spin events so that they don't have to pay through the nose to reimburse their families, but they deserve all the credits they can get. They had no idea what they were walking into. None of us did. 
RH-1129 looked like a million other planets in the Galactic Survey database. A barren rock with lots of free minerals to exploit. All we had to do was keep the ship in orbit and sit back while the drones went down and did the work. I didn't study the survey map myself, but Lars had been practically giddy about the place after his analysis. There was a plentiful amount of anomalous material littering the surface. Some of it piled up in mounds as high as 300 meters. We didn't even need to break out the mining drones to collect samples. If the material turned out to be valuable, as the spectrographic reports suggested, we'd have some serious bonuses coming our way. It was an easy job. Too easy. The drones only took four standard days to deliver the sample payload to the Achilles IV. All the drone scans checked out. No biological contaminants, no aberrant energy readings, no explosive properties. The cargo wouldn't have made it into the ship had it tripped any warning bells. The cargo shuttle went into Cargo Bay 3 without incident, and everybody was there to greet it. Mads and Kindy were the only ones who had to be there, since they were running the metallurgical tests, but the other three had decided to sneak a peek as well. I mean, this was a brand new substance, a finding that few ship crews ever come across. Forget our bonuses, this kind of thing could get us into the history books. Now, why wasn't I there? Well, I was going to be, but I received an emergency message from the computer concerning the drone task force on the planet. The drones were my territory, and I confess that I get territorial about them, though I don't label them or give them names. We go through too many of them for me to want to get attached. So I diverted to my workstation on the bridge and viewed the message, right as the cargo was getting offloaded back in Bay 3. I admit that I was distracted from the goings-on in Bay 3 at first, because the message had me at a complete loss. All five drones assigned to the surface had just... died. All energy readings and signals were zeroed out. And it had happened almost simultaneously, all of them going dark within a span of ten seconds. But they'd been on mapping missions miles apart from each other. Some kind of natural disaster, a massive storm or earthquake, this planet didn't have weather, and the computer would have warned us about any incoming meteor impacts or tectonic shifts. So what got the drones? It was this mystery that occupied my thoughts when I first heard the screams coming from Bay 3. I, I don't really want to dwell on what happened right now. I'm pretty low already. I'm also almost out of time for today. Let the record show that I'm no coward. I'm just lucky. If you can call my current state of affairs being lucky. Log 3, September 1st, 2074. I just noticed the date. It's been a while, hasn't it? I've been using my access windows to try to reprogram the system to acknowledge me as a sole survivor, but the computer's not going for it. Those damn implants. I suppose it's a good thing that the computer had a directive constituting a regard for life so high that it won't declare a crew member dead unless the implant says so. The only way to kill the directive is to kill the computer, which would kill the ship, and then me. I should probably answer the million credit question you've been dying to ask me. How are the implants still functioning if the crew is dead? Well, by the time you're reading this, there might be an answer. But right now, I have no idea. My best guess is that the expansion took control of the implants somehow, and is replicating the vital signs of my crew. The fact that it's sophisticated enough to do that scares the crap out of me. But then I've been scared every minute of every day since the crew died. Right. Time to talk about the expansion. That's my name for it. And it does what it says on the tin. 
it expands. Thanks to the computer lockout, I only have so many analysis tools at my disposal, but it appears to be composed of some kind of microscopic entity akin to a virus or a nanobot. Its main mass resembles earth-based moss, only its colors change from red to blue and back at random intervals. It doesn't move except when it's growing, which appears to be done by breaking down other materials and assimilating it into its structure. When it grows, it grows very quickly. In between my attempts to sway the computer to my side, I've been able to access security footage from the onboard surveillance system. I was able to watch the last two and a half minutes of my crew's existence before the expansion got the cameras and the ship initiated a total lockdown around Cargo Bay 3. I've had over a month now to deal with what I saw. I like to think I've processed it and moved on, but... God, I get chills just thinking about it. Up until 1500 hours, the video depicts pretty standard docking procedures. The cargo shuttle comes in and latches to the floor. It takes seven minutes for the decontamination and threat scans to do their business, so nothing visible is going on at all. At 1539 hours, the system gives the okay. The bay pressurizes and the crew enter the zero gravity zone, using mag boots to stick to the floor of the room. While this is going on, an automatic servo crane is removing the sample canister and locking it down. Mads goes over to it. Kindy is right behind him. And the others are hanging back. Everybody seemed real eager to uncork this vintage wine we found. But they were all following established procedure. If I could pin a negative on them, it was with Mads and Kindy who were definitely in a rush to study this new substance. At 1542... Mads opens the secured access point to the cargo canister in order to get a microsample for study, which is less than a millimeter in diameter and has a number of filters on it to help control substance spread. That was enough room to allow the stuff to breach containment. It comes out like tooth gel bursting from a tube that got squeezed too hard. Mads had his face right up to the access point when it happened. Obviously, Mads was the first to get broken down. His face disappeared into the substance, followed by his head, the neck, and then the rest of him. His arms and legs flailed helplessly around like snakes on hot coals, and I suspected he was already quite dead at that point. Kindy's noble instincts got the better of him, and he grabbed one of Mads' arms and tried to pull him free. All he accomplished was to become the second victim as the stuff worked its way onto Kindy, the poor guy screaming as it took his hands and then took the rest of them. Westinghouse and the others backed off and ran for the airlock, but the computer was already one step ahead of them, as was the expansion. It was spreading out all over the cargo bay, a living carpet of hungry alien cells latching onto and absorbing everything edible. Other cargo containers, equipment for our shuttles and drones, lubricant for our machinery, and even the cargo shuttle itself. The computer couldn't allow a thing like that to get any further into the ship, so it trapped the captain and the others in there. I could hear Westinghouse screaming at the computer to let them out, even used his command override to try to get the door open. I think he forgot about company policy involving mission priorities. We know the tales about how entire crews have been lost on these missions, but the ships fly back just fine. It's simple math, right? If you lose the ship, you lose the crew. If you lose the crew, you might save the ship. A ship-eating organism is too much of a threat to risk getting loose, and even a captain's authority can't change that. It ate the contents of the cargo bay as easily as it took in Mads and Kindy. In some places, it would bunch up and send strands of itself into the other parts of the room, using zero gravity to get about it quicker. In short order, the room resembled a thick spider web in there, strands of red and blue covering all the walls and flooring. 
with bits of clothing and other material hanging off it in places. For dessert, it took out all four cameras, ending the available footage at 1544 hours. I never did see what happened with the others. They had fled to a corner of the room not covered by an operational camera. I think they were still screaming when the last camera fell. They may have still been alive, considering that their implants still claim they are alive. I doubt there will ever be a clear answer to their times of death. Since then, my ability to monitor the expansion is very limited. Surface scans can't determine if it's organic or artificial. Hell, surface scans are just about useless. It gives me either false readings or no readings. It explains why we got the all clear to take it on board. At least the expansion can absorb everything, or the ship would have been consumed within hours. It has an appetite for all sorts of materials, but it apparently doesn't like duracrete, the synthetic material composing the walls of the bay and the sample container it was in. It also can't stomach unnatural materials like polyester. The computer has locked down all three doors into the bay, and other openings shut off with duracrete shutters. The ship could eject the cargo bay into space, but not with five crew members showing life signs inside, and not without captain authorization. So, yeah, not an option for me. Yet, despite the lockdown, it got to the comm array. I don't think it targeted it deliberately. The ship lost one of our backup power nodes at the same time. I've had some time to study the damage report and my guess is that the expansion found a power cable not adequately covered by the containment shutters. It followed the cable all the way to the power node, and before new shutters could be implemented, it got to the comm array. This stuff is on the outside of the ship, and there are a number of ship components it could feed on out there, but it's not spreading. External cameras show that the external bits are dormant, maybe even dead. I think it has a problem with complete vacuum, and that might be why it acted inert on RH 1129. The planet had no atmosphere. It hasn't spread further on the ship since eating the comma ray. With any luck, it won't get any further but it won't do me any good unless I can gain control of the ship. Speaking of which, I better get back to it, or else all these logs will be for nothing. Log 4, September 15th, 2074. It got to Cargo Bay 2. It got to the food. My fault for getting so stupidly complacent. Can't blame the computer or the company for this one. The expansion had been so quiet that I thought it had gone into a type of stasis, like what it did back on RH 1129. I mean, it had eaten everything it could, right? Well, yesterday it pulled a fast one by suddenly breaching Cargo Bay 2, where we kept the lion's share of the food stock. I had moved some of it into the ship culinary section for my own convenience, so it wasn't a total loss. I still have a month's worth of food at normal consumption, so I could probably ration it to last until at least reaching Station Alpha Centauri in six weeks. But that's only problem number two. Number one is that it got past containment again, and that is a bit more serious. Thanks to my constant hacking, I managed to gain access to structural scan records. It turns out that the duracrete isn't impervious to the expansion. It just slows down the absorption rate to a crawl. There was a weak section between Bay 3 and Bay 2. It also means that the other parts of the cargo bay could go at any time. And you know, it would be nice if I could talk to this misbegotten son of a trash compactor about it and create a new containment line in the adjacent sections to Cargo Bay 3. But I can't. Still locked out. So I just have to stay out of the vulnerable sections and trust in the computer safeguards. It's all just a stopgap measure. My best calculation is that the expansion will infest the entire ship within five weeks. 
It'll hit key systems like propulsion, the antimatter power plant, and life support before then. Starving to death is the least of my concerns. Alert. Station Authority has issued a cautionary advisement. An accident has occurred in Docking Port 2. Please avoid use of Docking Port 2 until further notice. Remember, your safety and the company's safety are one in the same. Log 5 September 16th, 2074 Who comes up with all this bullshit? Which company executive decided that all us human employees were too stupid to be trusted with our own ships? You know, all us dummies with advanced degrees and years of space travel under our belts? But I guess they know better. They know us learned folk are just rife with dysfunction. Can't possibly give us control. That'd be too much. A functional mind, whether living or mechanical, would look at this situation and say, Hmm. We appear to have a biohazard contaminating our ship. Maybe we should stop the ship and purge it. Let's set off the distress beacon or retool a probe to go ahead of us and broadcast for help. Let's do anything besides dumbly flying back to our home base with a microorganism that eats practically everything. <sighs> but I get it now. Functional minds aren't company policy. They want obedient minds. They want the ship and their cargo back. The cargo comes first. Company motto and all that. Why else would you have your ship computer automatically head back to base despite knowing it has a biohazard on board? That's why we're flying back, you know. It's what they call a non-responsive command protocol. If the designated captain is deemed alive and alert by his or her implant, then a captain who refuses to give orders is considered compromised, with the rest of the crew likely in the same boat. In case of a compromised commander, the ship automatically returns home unless his status changes. It's considered an anti-piracy tactic, making the assumption that a compromised captain is either being coerced by pirates or is aiming to become one. I know, I know. This is all unproductive ranting. If this gets read, it'll be some accountant trying to tabulate the costs, or a manager trying to figure out how to spin this in the media. They're all about company policy. This entry is just a distraction, because I'm about to try something dangerous. If it works, it should buy me more time. Hopefully enough to get me back to controlled space. If it doesn't, this will be my last entry. And I don't want to end my record without a last word or two. And one more thing. In case I hadn't spelled it out clearly enough. I'm pretty convinced that Jericho leadership is made up of nothing but amoral bastards. But I'm sure we all knew that already. System report. Data breach on September 18th, 2074 has caused file corruption. Hard drive damage located, unable to enact repairs. The next log entry, designated entry number 6 and created on September 17th, 2074, has been classified as 96% irretrievable. Continuing to next entry. Log 7, October 2nd, 2074. I did it. I managed to pull off a minor miracle. Let's start with the fact that I knew the ship wouldn't make it back to controlled space if I kept letting the computer call the shots. And I admit that my deep hack stunt didn't help matters. The vacuum break I created two weeks ago caused a lot of damage to ship systems, though thankfully nothing vital. But the vacuum break is holding. The expansion has infested the entire 12% of the ship it had access to. But it can't get any further, not with the cold vacuum of space blocking it. So, I tried a different tactic with the computer. I pulled a Captain Kirk, as us techs like to call it. I used some hard logic on the system, managed to convince it that the life signs coming from Cargo Bay 3 couldn't be human life signs any longer because A, they'd been exposed to hard vacuum for 15 days, and B, had not moved out of the base for weeks. 
Even a system as unfathomably stubborn as a cargo ship computer could figure that one out. So, I'm the designated captain now. That's my minor miracle. Unfortunately, my options are limited. I can't jettison the expansion now. It's infected too much of the ship's structure. The expansion also took down the ship's probe launcher and all the probes with it, so I can't rig up a probe to transmit a distress call. Still, at least now I have access to navigation and propulsion, and I can use the more powerful ship scanners on the expansion, since the drone scans were unreliable. Best of all, I don't have to worry about stupid hacking windows anymore. I can do these logs anytime I want, so if you don't mind, I got some new toys to play with. Hopefully I'll have a plan of action the next time I sit down and record another one of these apocalyptic diaries, and it'll be nothing but good news from here on out. Station alert. All transit to Zone Section 3 has now been prohibited. We are experiencing a significant power fluctuation in that region, and the issue is being addressed. All non-essential personnel still in the Zone Section 3 should remain at their current location until further notice. Remember, your safety and the company's safety are one and the same. Log 8, October 4th, 2074. Not good news, not at all. My mom was one of those kind people who never saw a doctor. She put her faith in herbal remedies and clean living and positive thinking, and she stuck to her beliefs even when she started getting pains in her chest and her breathing was growing shallower. I used to think it was a sign of insanity, but more and more I think it was actually a sign of fear. She was afraid of reality intruding into her happiness, that having someone show a picture of her chest with a tumor growing in her lungs would forever spoil the magic in her life, replacing it with cold dread and the omnipresence of mortality. She died in ignorance of what killed her, a blessing the rest of the family didn't get when the coroner told us about the cancer. This stuff isn't what I would call smart. Not human smart, but it has a few brain cells somewhere in that mess of mycoid cells. Yes, mycoid as in fungus. I have no idea how to define it better than that. I'm no xenobiologist, or even a regular biologist. It might be related to a mushroom, but it's a smart mushroom. I did a full thermal scan of the infected areas. Since this stuff gives off a lot of heat as it grows. And the scan showed that it's tunneling through the floor, the ceiling, and even the outer hull. It's avoiding vacuum by going inside the struts and plating, digging right up the middle. Most of the supports have a thickness of 5 centimeters, which doesn't offer much wiggle room. But this stuff is carving out tunnels only 1 centimeter thick. It's slow going, but if slow going works for tortoises, it'll work for this stuff too. The computer projects the closest expansion mass will bypass my vacuum break in nine days, most likely emerging in the engine room. I can depressurize the engine room, but I'll never be able to repressurize it, or else the expansion would immediately infest it and take out the engines. Worse, even if it can't get the engines, the stuff will shrug its metaphorical shoulders and tunnel to the next section. I can see where this is going. The expansion will keep coming, and the only way I can slow it down is to keep depressurizing more and more of the ship. Eventually I'll be stuck on the bridge, sleeping on the floor, surrounded by trash and my own waste, waiting for the expansion to reach me in my last sanctuary. I'm the captain of a sinking ship. What an honor to be me. The rescue pod remains an option. But every space mariner knows the odds of a successful rescue outside of controlled space is next to nil. I can control the navigation system now, so I can divert our course if I wish. I suppose I could park the ship next to a quasar, so I could have a spectacular light show to watch before the ship disintegrates, but I'm not going down with this ship. Do you hear me? Do you hear me, you miserable corporate shit? I am not dying for you or this company. 
I am riding the ship out of the damned until I find a good place to get off. I'll send it straight into Alpha Centauri itself and melt this ship into slag if it means destroying the expansion. But I am living through this. So says I, the captain of Achilles IV, and so it shall be done. Log 9, October 18th, 2074. I couldn't help but reread my last entry. I can't tell if I'm getting loony or just downright scary. Considering I haven't talked to another sentient soul in weeks, I don't think I can be blamed for going a little nuts. The ship computer can't hold a decent conversation, and these logs are just me talking to myself. I guess it's true what they say about solitary confinement. It's the best punishment out there. Though it still pales to the type of torture where you're trapped in a prison cell with a predator that's doing everything it can to get to you. At least the astrophysics classes I took in training are paying off. The computer and I came up with an alternate course that should shave four days off this trip. That means I have five days before we enter controlled space. That puts me inside the range of the quantum beacons which will pick up the low-power distress signal from the rescue pod. hippie ki -yay, I think I might live through this. It's going to be tight, though. Half the ship is already depressurized. I have an evac suit available to get through the vacuum, but breathing isn't my biggest problem. The stuff is digging through the outer hole as well, and my rescue pod is right in its path. Best estimate I can come up with is that the rescue pod will be consumed right around the point I reach controlled space. I can't get more precise than that. Whichever life form wins this race takes the whole enchilada. Space mariners like to claim we're part of an ancient tradition that goes back centuries to the times of wooden ships traveling Earth's oceans, spending months or even years away from their homeland in search of fame, fortune, or just plain survival. I've heard lots of tales over the years of sailors meeting all manner of disasters. From freak storms, to hidden shoals, to belligerent pirates. The tales that always stuck out in my mind weren't the dramatic ones, but the stories about slow death. A ship that wandered into a becalmed zone, where the wind refused to blow for days or even weeks. The crew depleting their stores and their water, succumbing to starvation, dehydration, and infighting. Or they contract a nasty disease that spreads all through their ranks, the men dying to an enemy they can't fight or flee from. What was it like to be stuck inside a death trap like that, praying for a strong wind, hoping for rescue, longing for a piece of dry land to escape to? I really hate those stories now. Log 10 October 21st, 2074. Twelve hours before I reach controlled space. Twelve lovely hours. I mean, what's twelve hours more in the scheme of things? I've been stuck on this ship for over 3,600 hours now. Twelve hours is easy peasy. I'm just really bored. Also really freaked out. Is that possible? Being bored and freaked out at the same time? Or is my mood just taking turns going from one to the other? I can't tell anymore. I've quarantined myself to the bridge for a few days now, and my leisure options are limited. The company has a real problem with people using bridge hardware for entertainment purposes, and while I could hack into my own stash of videos, I might very well jeopardize some key systems in the process. So, I've been doing a lot of reading. Mostly status reports and training simulations and other fun things like that. I also decided to look over the recorded orbital scans of RH-1120. Not because I was looking for a clue or epiphany concerning the expansion, but because, again, I'm really bored. You know what I found? A whole lot of mounds. The thing is, while they are literally everywhere on the surface, there is a pattern to them. The biggest mounds are clustered together, in some cases lined up symmetrically. The 3D imaging pictures show some of these clusters going on for miles and miles, and the more I looked at them, the more they resembled the outlines of cityscapes. 
with the tallest ones substituting for skyscrapers, and the numerous smaller mounds stepping in for apartment buildings and houses. It got me thinking. What if those mounds used to be buildings? Maybe this isn't a fanciful notion created by a man both on borrowed time and with too much time on his hands. I have to think that this planet wasn't always a wasteland. It occupies a Goldilocks zone and has the right planetary spin. Gravity is comparable to Earth. It just lacks an atmosphere. And that is a big problem. Then again, maybe it did have an atmosphere once. Maybe the expansion came to RH-1120 or was created by an intelligent species that once lived there, and it did what it does well. It ate everything it could, reducing a fellow sentient species into nothing but mounds of organic refuse. Maybe it destroyed the atmosphere as well, or maybe the species destroyed the atmosphere in order to stop it from going any further. Can't prove any of it, but it makes for a pretty depressing tale. It's also a good argument for why this ship needs to fly into a sun. Good thing I pre-programmed the flight computer to do so once I'm off the ship. I just have to send a short range signal from the pod and voila. The Achilles IV becomes part of the great beyond. I'd say I'll be sad about it, but I kind of hate this ship now. Twelve hours to go, like I said. Easy peasy. Log 10. Addendum. I... I can't even. I'm not in the right frame of mind to do a log, but a record has to be kept. I have to find a way to get this out, find a way to transmit this. It's all I have left now. Others must know what happened here. Others besides Jericho. The pot is gone. And no, not because the expansion ate it. That would be unfair, but it would make sense. Self-replicating spore-like nanostructures must do what they must. No, the pod is gone because I decided to send the navigation system my course correction while I was still on the bridge. I didn't want to risk the pod's short-range transmitter not being up for the task. I didn't think it would matter when I did it, since the star I picked for the job, Kilio 43, was well inside controlled space and wouldn't affect my timeline. Good thing I thought ahead, I guess. As soon as I executed the course correction, I was immediately locked out of the navigational system. At the same time, there was a rupture at the pod bay compartment. Damage control showed a localized hole breach, limited to the rescue pod itself. Somehow, the pod's internal power cells went into overload. That can't happen unless the cooling system is disabled. Pod is gone. My control of the ship is gone. Most of my captain authority is gone. In terms of access, I'm locked out of anything important. Yep. Turns out there was another order in play. After I cried my eyes out over the loss of the pod, I went back through the status logs, going back to when this whole horror show started two months ago, hoping to find out why this had happened. I found what I was looking for. One day before the comma ray got eaten, Achilles IV received a communication from Jericho, system eyes only, meaning that no crew member on board had access to it. The message wasn't in the log, but thanks to my deep hack I could get the computer to cough it up, and I'm not ashamed to say that I cried my eyes out again after reading it. The ship computer had transmitted the biohazard warning and what preliminary data it had on the expansion to Jericho headquarters, which is standard procedure in these kinds of situations. What isn't standard is the ship received a corporate order to maintain a course for Alpha Centauri Station. The ship could alter the course as long as it arrived at station within three months. External communications can only go through corporate channels. Any attempt to destroy the ship by the captain, like I had just done, would result in command lockout. At the same time, the ship computer would ensure the crew didn't attempt to flee the ship, so all shuttles and pods would have mysterious problems arise if we tried to use them, such as cooling systems abruptly breaking. Wouldn't want us warning the authorities, right? Jericho knows what they have aboard this ship, and they want to bring it home. 
The cargo comes first, the crew comes last. I have no more words for you, my corporate overlords. Words no longer do justice to what you've done. I can't even bother to. I can't even. Log 11, October 24th, 2074. It's taken me a few days to get my shit together. I can't say that my shit is, in fact, together. I think I'm way past pulling myself into a state resembling an actual human being. But I got something. I got me a plan. It's a bad plan, and it's a fatal plan. But that's the only kind of plans I have left to use. I'm dead. I already feel dead. Like I'm a ghost wandering an empty ship. My corpse decomposing somewhere out of sight, or floating out in space or just another part of that creeping mass consuming the ship. There's two days left in my trip, but there's no salvation at my destination. Jericho is waiting for the ship to dock, no doubt itching to study, test, and dissect the expansion. They can probably still save me, but they won't. I'm too much of a liability now. I have all the incriminating evidence needed to bring them up on criminal charges. They'll either let the expansion finish me off, or they might help my demise along by initiating an accident. They'll alter or purge some records, and that will be that. One more lost crew added to the memorial wall back on Earth. They don't know what they're dealing with. They only have early scanning data. They'll let this thing onto the station, and it'll run wild. Alpha Centauri Station has over 10,000 souls aboard, and cargo ships travel from the station to Earth every day. No matter how thoroughly Jericho screwed me over, I can't let all those people die. I can't risk the expansion getting to Earth. So, my fatal plan. Well, since I can't deliberately fly the ship into a star, I'll settle for doing it accidentally. I can do a deep hack again, only this time I'll permanently take out the ship computer. That'll cause the engines to shut down as an automatic safety precaution. The trick is when to do the shutdown, but I figured that out as well. If I time it right, the ship will do a gravity slingshot past Centauri 4 a small gas giant, which will send me right at the star itself. Since I can't use the ship computer to help guide me this time, I have to use my own calculations. This could go very badly. I don't want to sling the ship into a planet, if I can help it, or out in a deep space where the ship might eventually be recovered, but it's the best option from my list of fatal plans. If I succeed, then this log dies with me, and Jericho will probably skate by without the authorities ever catching wind of the shit they were pulling. But hey, I'll go out saving lives. Definitely worse fates than that. One way or another, this is my last entry. I won't waste my time thinking of famous last words, but I will say this. My crew deserved better. I deserved better. And Jericho deserves a whole hell of a lot more than what they're going to get. Warning. Station security raised to level Omega. Biohazard safeguards are now in effect. Please stay at your current location. An evacuation team will arrive within two hours. Remember, your safety and the company's safety are one and the same. Attention. Hidden data newly discovered. Unknown log entry now available. Release of log entry appears to coincide with signal burst originating from Achilles 4. Cause of transmission unknown. Log 12. Date unknown. Hello there, my corporate overlords. If you're reading this entry, a few things will have transpired. For starters, I'm dead. I won't know how it happened, but I'll be dead nonetheless. I hope it was fairly painless. Next, the ship is still in one piece. You might think that means my plan was a failure, and that would be a fair assessment of things considering what data you have available. Except that wasn't my plan. Not the real one. 
I did try to shut down the computer, but only so that the system would log my attempt. Ship computers have so many firewalls and redundant hard drives that it's almost impossible to disable it through hacking. I did it so that you wouldn't look too hard at my actual hacking effort. What I did was rig up a new transmitter. The only one I still had available was the one still attached to the wreckage of the rescue pod. I had to use my evac suit to travel through a number of depressurized compartments and it wasn't much fun. I kept expecting the expansion to burst out of the walls and absorb me at any time, but that didn't happen. I rigged the pod's transmitter to run off the ship's power supply, as well as connect it to my personal digital device. That way the ship computer doesn't even know it exists. I've downloaded the logs into my personal device, and I've hidden the device somewhere it won't be found too quickly, but not before I set it to record my bio readings for my implant. I added the condition that if my implant were to ever go dark, the device will automatically transmit two signals. One will be to send the logs through the pod's short range array. It'll only work for one good burst, but every communication array within 2,000 miles of the ship will pick up the data burst. The second signal will be to the Achilles IV itself. It will activate the program I put in the life support system the one that will pressurize every compartment on the ship. I've crunched some numbers and realized that the ship's hull is in a very tenuous state from all the expansions tunneling. Returning the air to most of the ship would be like throwing a lit match into a pool of gasoline. The expansion will surge into all those compartments, causing hull breaches everywhere. It could even rip the ship apart. I admit it's a plan with a number of serious risks. What if my personal device runs out of power first, or gets smashed? What if the expansion eats me and duplicates my implant readings? What if the pod's transmitter proves too damaged to do the job? Yep, it's a desperate plan. But then I am a desperate person. I realized that even if I could destroy the ship, I wouldn't stop Jericho. The company would just send a new ship to RH-1129. I have to expose the company and expose the expansion, and nothing gets people's attention like a dying mariner's last log, coupled with the public destruction of a cargo vessel in range of every able sensor package. Truth be told, the one thing I'm really afraid of is that the company's retrieval team will bring the ship directly into one of the station's docking ports. If the ship comes apart inside a docking port, there will be no way to stop it from infesting the station. But you guys wouldn't be that arrogant, right? There are protocols for this kind of thing. I mean, unless you're too busy trying to hide the ship to care about small matters like biohazard containment. I suppose no matter what happens, you corporate guys are going to be real cross with me. No death benefits for my mom. No bonus for my hard work. Which I think is a real crappy thing to do to a loyal employee like me. After all, I followed the corporate mantra. I delivered to you what you wanted. In the end, the cargo came first. Seventy-two Days by Christina Holland The word is Lodestar. Even imagining the word, scrawled on that little scrap of paper, made his head begin to pulse with pain. 
he'd found the paper in Spencer's desk, a curiously analog anomaly in a station full of technological interfaces. When his eyes first fell on the word, it had sent a spike of agony through his brain and he'd flung the paper away in terror. Since then, the mere thought of the word made the pain begin to surge again and he'd learned to refer to it, even in his mind, as only the word. He had little hope of delving to the bottom of that mystery, however. He had only just figured out his name from viewing the station's personnel records and looking at the name patch on his uniform. Carl Jackson, maintenance technician. It hadn't taken long to put together a few more details about the situation. A thorough exploration of the station didn't take long. It was a bare-bones outpost and revealed it to be completely abandoned himself the only sign of life. The personnel records indicated there should have been three other crew members. Rachel Spencer, the scientist, Stephen Crisp, the computer specialist, and Timothy Wynn, the commanding officer. All gone, without a trace. A quick check of the escape pod showed that both were missing. The only puzzle was if he was reading the scanners correctly that the nearest habitable destination was far out of range of any escape pod. But then again, maybe he'd forgotten how to read scanners, too. The last reliable memory he had was leaving for the station. He didn't even remember arriving, or any of these people he'd apparently been working with for six months. When he reached back to that time, in his mind, he felt that strange pulsing feeling rising again. And the word and the pain that came with it Threatening surge back into the foreground. Hastily, he cleared his thoughts and brought them back to the present. The first thing he could remember that belonged to the present, to his new reality, was waking up in the eerie dim lighting of the control room. The pale, pinkish-red, minimal power mode message glowing on the top of every console display. Other than that, gently ominous warning... All the displays were blank, save one, which contained only large green digits that appeared to be a countdown timer. It was set to 72 days and change, and was counting down by the second. 70 days. He still puzzled about the word, but he steered gingerly around it, wary of thinking it. Even thinking about thinking it brought the dread back. Not just the physical pain, but an inexplicable foreboding he couldn't quite put his finger on. Besides, he had two other immediate mysteries to dread. The countdown timer and the missing crew. What was the timer counting down to? Good or bad? Rescue or doom? Or nothing at all? Had someone just fumble-fingered some buttons while being struck down by the calamity that had taken the crew? And that was the second ominous mystery. The disappearing crew. No matter which way you went with it, it was unsettling. If they'd taken off on the escape pods, why hadn't they taken him? Each pod was a two-seater. And where would they have gone? Repeated scans had shown no viable destinations in range. And if they hadn't taken the pods, what had happened to them? And would it happen to him? He might not make it 70 more days. He had to try to find out what happened and find out how to protect himself if necessary. He decided to start in Spencer's lab, where he'd found that mysterious slip of paper with that word on it. He rubbed his eyes uneasily. What kind of science did she do anyway? He browsed through the local files and giraffes on her terminal. It was all highly scientific and all above his head. But he slowly gathered it was something to do with psychological brain science. And that explained why there was a glass jar of fluid on one shelf which, according to the label, had once held a brain, and it was empty now. 
He couldn't make head nor tail of what kind of brain science she was doing and was getting a completely different kind of headache now trying to puzzle out all these highly technical terms. Found his way back over to the common area where he helped himself to a ration packet and managed to reboot one of the secondary terminals. It was stuck in low power mode like the rest of the station, with most of its functionality disabled. But he was able to start up Minesweeper, which kept him busy for the rest of the day. 65 Days the rest of the first week saw a couple of setbacks, and a triumph. From rifling around the quarters of Stephen Crisp, the computer specialist, Jackson had managed to discover that there were crew log entries stored in the station's local network, but only Crisp and Captain Wen had access to them. Neither of them had been dumb enough to make their password password, or anything easily guessable, so Jackson had gone digging through their personal effects hoping to find a family member or an important date. It was no good. He typed in all combinations of names and dates he found in their personal effects, but it was all denied. Finally, on a desperate long shot, he decided to try... the word. And it seemed like someone or something didn't want him to remember it. it seemed like exactly the kind of thing you'd do with a password to something you didn't want anyone to find. He first tried to log into Crisp's account. It took every ounce of willpower he had, the pain escalating with every letter he typed, until finally he finished with the R, hit enter, and blacked out. When he awakened, he scrambled back up eagerly to look at the screen, which informed him that the username and password didn't match. He groaned, his head still thundering, now with an added wave of nausea. He rushed to the bathroom to vomit and spent the rest of his day in bed, his brain furiously punishing him for his inconsideration. It wasn't until the next day that he felt well enough to try the password again, this time with Captain Wynn's account. It didn't work either and led to another day of bed rest. The next day he found himself ruminating up in the control room, gazing out into empty space, pondering the insignificance of humanity. Till he got bored and started walking around. Close to the window, he peered down and around at the station itself. It seemed like directly below him, almost out of sight, were some signs of damage, perhaps from a passing asteroid. He tried to check the computers to see what section that was, but the screens only continued to uselessly inform him that the station was in minimal power mode. Frustrated, he went back to the window and for the first time spotted some lettering on one of the station's beams. That is 14. Yes, he remembered now. That was the station's name, and as soon as he had that thought a sharp pain shot through his head, but quickly passed. A sudden flash of inspiration hit, and he tried accessing Crisp's account again, this time using Thetis 14 as the password. No good. Undaunted, he tried it with Captain Wynn's account and… success! Crisp would have been disappointed with the captain's security practices, thought Jackson, and then wondered why he knew that, and then had to clench his teeth as another spasm passed through his head. He forgot immediately about the pain as it passed, as he found himself looking at a screen containing a long list of personal log entries. Jackpot. 60 days. His initial elation turned to disillusionment quickly when he realized all recent logs had been erased. Everything that remained only went up to three days before the incident, or whatever it was, when his current memories first started and the countdown timer read 72 days. He went immediately to the most recent available logs and found nothing of use. It seemed like business as usual. Crisp talked about ordering some equipment from headquarters and complained about it being outdated by the time it arrived. Captain Wen talked about his wife and some personal gardening project he was working on. Spencer 
was waiting for a few journals to get back to her about research papers she had submitted. He also found one of his own logs. He had written a song and was playing it on the guitar. It was surreal not to remember any of this. In any case, it seemed there were no immediate answers to be found here as to what had happened. He figured he could spend some time going through the older logs to see if he could pick up any hints, but first, there was another avenue he wanted to explore. In his earlier investigations, he'd found several locked and sealed doors, and now as he made his way down to the area where he estimated the damaged section should be, he confirmed it was behind one of these doors, labeled Terrarium. It was a solid door, and there seemed to be no chance of physically forcing it open. Any locking or unlocking function seemed to be unavailable from any of the computer terminals. Probably another casualty of minimal power mode. There was a very good likelihood that the other locked doors also led to other damaged sections, possibly sealed off for safety reasons. The terrarium, if that's what it was, was just the only one he could see from the control room window. Two of them were escape pod doors, and it was pretty easy to see through their portholes that the escape pods were gone, as he'd discovered earlier. Another locked door was labeled Quantum Com. Like the terrarium, it had no windows. It seemed like there was nothing more he could do on this front for now, so he decided to go back to the logs. Time to snoop around in his crewmates' private lives. 58 days. He'd found a spiral-bound paper notebook, its simple, physical nature somehow comforting in this ominous world of blank screened machines that seemed to begrudge him the smallest tidbit of information. He wrote down what he felt were some of the most important questions and observations in his journey, to try and piece together what happened, hoping that seeing it in written form would give him some insight. Besides, if whatever caused him to lose his memory happened again, it would be invaluable to have it all written down somewhere. He'd seen a movie about this once. So far, he'd written... Important Questions What happened to the crew? Spencer Crisp when? What is the timer counting down to? What happened to my memory? Is the word related? Damaged missing rooms... Escape pods, two of them gone. Terrarium, quantum calm. Working computer functions. Minimal power mode warning everywhere. Countdown timer, short range scanners, minesweeper solitaire, personal logs. Crew, Spencer, brain scientist, memory loss related. No boyfriend, kind of frigid. Captain Wen, bad security practices, avid gardener, has a wife at home. Crisp, computer expert, cranky, neat freak, grammar police. Me, musically talented. The first logs he'd dive into were Spencer's, hoping to find out more about her research and how it might be related to his memories. For this, he started from the earliest logs, about six months back. This got a little derailed when he found her calling him a creeper in one of the first logs, which drove him to go find his own log from the same day. From his own account, everything seemed perfectly friendly and harmless. In the log, he said he'd introduced himself and made small talk by asking if she had a boyfriend and what kind of guys she liked. You know, just friendly chit-chat. When she seemed to bristle, he made it very clear he wasn't hitting on her by saying he wasn't attracted to girls with short hair. It really seemed like she was overreacting. Most of her logs were about her work, however, and it didn't seem very promising. She was spending most of her time reviewing other people's papers and officially was here to perform some kind of long-term study on the effects of deep space isolation on the brain. It's pretty obvious that this is just a bunch of pointless busywork made up to keep me out here in purgatory, she said bitterly in one log. 
I wouldn't be surprised if all the results I'm sending back are going straight into the trash. In another entry, she went into some detail about her duties, which did sound suspiciously like busy work. Collected another round of questionnaires from the crew today, she said. Another exciting day of data entry. This is really starting to cut into my solitaire time. After sifting through a number of similarly mundane entries, Jackson stumbled on one that made him sit up. Appeal for reinstatement rejected again, she said in frustration. I don't know what more they want from me. I have multiple copies of all the paperwork. I crossed every T and dotted every I. I received fully informed consent from every subject. There was third-party review at every step. They can confirm each volunteer was given the option to opt out at any time and they were very aptly compensated. No one felt they were harmed. No one filed a complaint. Even in the worst case, it was only a temporary loss of a few days' memory. Jackson put down the ration he was chewing on, rewound the log, and listened again and again. This was it. It had to be. What had this woman done to him? 52 days. He'd started to fall into a kind of routine. The lighting never changed and the only clock was the countdown timer, but he'd decided to try to force a daily 24-hour routine to preserve a sense of normalcy and keep his sanity as long as he could. Midnight started when the countdown timer ticked down a day. He'd wake up every day at 1,000 hours. Solving mysteries was hard work. He needed his rest. Have a morning ration and go through a few logs. When he needed a break, he might play his guitar. Apparently, he still remembered how. Or play some Minesweeper. Or read a book. Crisp had some paperback novels, mostly Stephen King, which Jackson helped himself to. He'd eat lunch up in the control room, gazing out into space, and then do some exploration, picking a room and going over it in detail. He turned up some pretty private details going through personal belongings, but he figured his crewmates were either dead, in which case they wouldn't mind, or they had abandoned him, in which case they deserved it. He then allocated some time, trying to see if he could get the computer to do anything else, but he had little luck. Even with the captain's password, he couldn't seem to get it out of minimal power mode. He wasn't even sure if he should. If he was waiting for rescue, it was probably best to conserve as much power as he could. He did manage to bring up the communications window one day, but it seemed to actually be broken. It wasn't a problem of access, it just simply didn't work. He also found that the system's short-range scanners did work, but limited usage to one scan a day. He'd usually do it just before dinner. Needless to say, the results were the same every time. Nothing. Dinners would usually be in the common area, keeping lunch in the control room so they'd feel more like separate meals. Every day felt monotonous enough already. All he had to eat were the same foil-wrapped ration packs, so all he could change up was the location and his routine. Lunchtime was for big thoughts and idle philosophy while gazing into space, and dinner was for thinking about his immediate plans. It was a good time for him to reflect on what he'd dug up during the day and try to put all the pieces together and have a good think. Things were pretty quiet and thought-friendly in there, now that he'd unplugged all the machinery. There was no need for the refrigerator, the microwave, and the ration packet processor, since he had no fresh food, just packets. He initially had tried microwaving the ration packs for variety's sake, but it didn't improve the flavor. So he just shut down all the kitchen gadgets and enjoyed the peace and silence in one room without blinking warning lights. After dinner, he'd relax with a game or a book before heading to bed. 47 days. 
He gave up for now on getting anything from Spencer's logs. All the technical talk was giving him a headache. He promised himself he'd go through it more thoroughly later. He was now slowly making his way through Crisp's logs. This was arguably just as tedious and skip-worthy because it seemed Crisp's side project was writing an epic fantasy trilogy, and he was reading the entire thing as he wrote it into his personal video logs. Crisp's epic was very badly written and hard to follow, which Jackson did not like, but it had a lot of sex, which he did like. Most of the sex was had by attractive women and elves with the main character who seemed to look a lot like Crisp and was for some reason a computer specialist, even though this was a medieval fantasy setting. When not reciting his story, Crisp had some interesting theories about hypothetical scenarios, like who would win in a zombie apocalypse. At first, Jackson thought this was easy. The zombies, of course. Then he realized Crisp wasn't talking about the humans versus the zombies, but about the surviving humans and what kind of person would be willing to do what it took, no matter how horrific, to rise to the top in such a scenario. In Jackson's opinion, Crisp seemed to put much, much more thought into this question than was warranted, considering the non-existence of zombies. Crisp claimed to have brought his pet topic up at dinner and said a spirited discussion ensued. Jackson wondered if everyone else had enjoyed talking about worst-case zombie scenarios at dinner. He paused Crisp's monologue and began to look at other logs for the same day. Crisp was going on about zombies again at dinner, said Spencer, rolling her eyes. He really seems to get off on grossing everyone else out. Jackson literally turned green and ran out of the room, although honestly Jackson seems like he'd pass out at a paper cut. Jackson frowned, but he thought she might be right. He'd had to stop reading the Stephen King novels for a bit, they were giving him nightmares. He was pretty sure his ten-year-old cousin had been reading Stephen King and loving it, so this was probably an extremely embarrassing thing to admit. I try to see the good in everyone said Captain Wen, but Crisp is a real, and pardon my language here, a real asshole. Every time he addresses me as Captain, he does it sarcastically. I don't know how he has the energy to keep it up so long. Today, at dinner, he went on one of those rants about how man is just an animal, and when survival is at stake, all of this civilization stuff turns out to just be a pretense. All that tough guy Darwinian struggle stuff. Great dinner conversation, right? He was going into detail about some story involving a bear trap ripping someone's head open somehow, and maggots. The person was still alive. Wen scrunched up his face as if smelling something bad. Very distasteful. Not plausible at all, really. Jackson looked sick and ran out of the room. Poor kid. Crisp just laughed and said he'd be the first one dead in the zombie apocalypse. I said he was being an ass, and he just said, Maybe, but I'm not wrong. Zombie could be coming straight at him, and he'd drop his gun and cry at it. Tell me I'm wrong. Then Spencer said that Crisp would be the first one dead, because if they ever needed a diversion, everyone would unanimously agree to throw him to the zombies to buy time for an escape. Crisp abruptly left at that point and said he had to go to work on his novel. I'm thinking of banning any talk of zombies at dinner. Jackson frowned. Crisp seemed like a dick. He found his own log for the day, which didn't seem to add much information. Crisp seems like a dick, it said. 46 days. But apparently... That wasn't the end of it. In a log a few days after the dinner incident, Jackson talked about reoccurring nightmares. It's really messing with my sleep. I think it's because of that story he told with the brain maggots and everything. He shuddered. What's even worse is he sent me some clips from, I guess, the movie he got it from? And I opened it without knowing what it was. It was really not cool. 
One thing, though, is that Spencer was actually really nice about it. She said I wasn't looking well and asked if I was okay. She said if I came by the lab, maybe there was something she could do. Jackson furrowed his brow and began to watch intently as he forwarded to the next log. So I saw Spencer about, you know, my problem, and it was actually really quick, and I think the nightmares are gone. I don't even remember what they were about. I don't even remember that, I guess, Crisp started it off with a gross story or something. Spencer had to tell me about it. She said you could set the thing on pretty shallow and it would just get mostly back of your mind stuff for just a few days. I guess I'm a little bit fuzzy about some of the last three days, but who cares? It's just the same crap routine as every day. Man, whatever. Anyway, I'm going to sleep like a log. Things seemed to go south just a few days later. I was doing my kitchen round today when I got a red diagnostic light on the ration packet processor this morning, so I opened it up to fix it, only I completely forgot how to do the repair. I know I just did one last week, so I went back to Spencer about it, and suddenly she was this cold bitch all over again, and said that wasn't possible, and maybe I just forgot how to do it on my own. I said I was going to talk to the captain about it, and suddenly she turned white like a ghost, and started talking nice again. If you ask me, I think she wasn't supposed to be doing that kind of stuff at all. I'm gonna keep a note of that for later. It might come in handy. Anyway, she said she'd do some digging into what might have happened, and also she was going to look up the ration packet processor repair instructions and take care of it for me until I got my memory fixed. And any other repairs I forgot. Yup. Definitely doing something she wasn't supposed to be. Spencer seemed to confirm this. I can't have him going to the captain. If this gets to the board, I'm done. But I don't know that... I don't know what... There's, there's no mechanism by which he should have forgotten a long-term memory. It's impossible. It can't have anything to do with the procedure. It's likely just normal forgetfulness. Of course... I could try using the keyword on him, but that'll probably bring back his nightmares too. And then he'll get mad about that and go to the captain. Anyway, I suppose I'd better start figuring out how to fix the ration processor. We've got a pile of fresh vegetables going bad. Keyword. It had to be... L-O... He began to think, and the pain rose alarmingly like a tidal wave. No. He said to himself, not now, not blindly. He had to learn all he could first. In the next entry, the drama seemed to have moved on to a different topic. Walked into lunch to see the captain scolding Spencer and saying that blowing someone out of an airlock isn't very professional, and she was looking daggers at him. So I turned around and walked right back out. Jackson's own log left it at that, so he eagerly pulled up Captain Wen's log. Sometimes I feel like I'm running a kindergarten. Spencer and Crisp had some kind of lover's quarrel or another, and one thing led to another, and the next thing you know, she locked him in the airlock and was threatening to blow him into space. I mean, we're professionals here. I understand Chris can be a bit much sometimes. I've reprimanded him myself several times, but only in a professional and appropriate manner. It speaks to a real lack of self-control and rationality to resort to this kind of dramatic gesture. I may have to formally write her up. It did seem like pretty bizarre behavior. Jackson pulled up Spencer's log to see what she had to say for herself. Either I'm taking crazy pills or everybody else is. Jackson is a harmless enough creeper minus the blackmail thing. But Crisp straight up grabbed me from behind today and... Went for the goods. I managed to shake him off, but he kept coming back, so I opened the airlock door behind me and flipped him into it, and shut it before he could get up. Then he started going on about how I was a bitch and I was overreacting, so I told him I'd show him overreacting, and I put my hand on the outer door button, and then he changed his tune real fast. He was peeing his pants and explaining how it was all a misunderstanding when Captain Wen came by and ordered me to let him out. I tried to explain what happened, but he seriously pulled a, 
You both need to go to your quarters and think about what you did. As if he was talking to some squabbling children. I tried to sort out the captain at dinner, but he seemed very grossed out by the slightest mention of anything sexual. I noticed he's a bit of a prude and said he didn't need to hear about what people did in their own time, but that here we must be professionals. Juicy, but apparently hadn't impacted his life in any way, except maybe showing that Spencer had trouble getting along with people. This fact came up almost immediately again when he got back to his own logs. I didn't tell the captain anything. I guess Spencer got busted for her research and she keeps accusing me of being the snitch. I didn't say shit. Why would I? I still need her to fix my memory holes. He took a couple of deep breaths. So anyway, between that and the airlock thing, she's on double secret probation or whatever they call it here, and she's just super pissy all the time now. Good luck getting that ration processor fixed, everybody. Hope you enjoy your raw greens. Spencer was indeed pissy. That idiot really just went and did it. What was he thinking? Forget getting any help from me now. The captain took away my rig and locked it in the storage closet. He seriously gave me the very disappointed speech and told me he was going to write me up. I'm seriously going to blow them all out of the airlock next chance I get. Jackson gave the situation his best unbiased assessment and decided that he believed himself. But how did the captain find out? He wouldn't stumble on the answer until two days later. 44 days. Focused on this particular question, Jackson did a quick skim through the logs, but it seemed like neither he himself nor Spencer ever figured this out. He looked through Captain Wen's logs more carefully, but he also never mentioned his source. His log merely began with a pretentious, It has come to my attention that Dr. Spencer has been conducting unauthorized research and added very little information, being mostly a rant about values and professionalism and disappointment. Either the captain had done a little independent snooping, or Jackson decided it was the last suspect, Crisp. He sighed and screwed up his courage to go through Crisp's logs again, trying to carefully skim past his manuscript readings without missing any useful asides. It was in the middle of the chapter on the island of snake women that he struck gold. I did some reading on snake anatomy and this might not work, so I might end up deleting that part. Oh, funny little fact by the by, I found a little bug in the data deletion code where if the task happens to be interrupted, the data is not actually deleted and can still be easily accessed by someone with the proper know-how. He tapped his head proudly. I was going to fix it, but then I decided to myself, Maybe we can think of this as a feature, and not a bug. With things the way they are, it might be a good idea to take a look at the very things people don't want you to see. He never explicitly talked about ratting out Spencer, but in the very next entry, he did say, fingers steepled in self-satisfaction, lock the bowl in an airlock, get the horns. 43 days. Jackson finally found what he thought might be the rig that Spencer had talked about. In her lab, looking like it had been kicked carelessly under a table, was a small skull cap with protruding wires. These all led to a desktop-sized device with its own small screen, not connected to the station network, which made sense if she was trying to keep it on the down low. It was off and stayed off no matter what he did. Either it was broken, or he didn't know the right combination of switches and buttons to turn it on. The ventilation system continued to hum quietly. The station terminals continued their steady, gentle blinking. The most prominent control was a large dial turned all the way up. If he was remembering right, in his logs, the device was on a very low setting when Spencer had helped him with the nightmares. Maybe it had been used again, or maybe he was just looking at the wrong dial. In any case, it seemed she'd been able to get it back at some point after the captain had confiscated it. While he was visiting scenes of crimes, he decided to go back out the airlock as well. Disappointingly, neither the inner or outer door would open. There didn't seem to be anything seriously wrong with either as far as he could see, 
so he guessed this might be a result of the minimal power mode. He peered through the window, not sure what he expected to see. The pee puddle from when Chris was cowering in fear and begging? In any case, it was completely empty, which made sense for an airlock. He was about to go when he spotted the faintest hint of something on the opening edge of the door. A dried liquid between the door and the frame, only the smallest edge of which crept out beyond the seal. It was dark and red-brown and almost certainly blood. 42 days. He wished this was one of those fancy science stations with the computers where you could just pop in a blood sample and it would tell you the blood belonged to a 48-year-old male of South American ancestry who had dark hair and a predilection to alcoholism and walked with a limp. Or matched it to a crew record, or something. In any case, there was nothing like that. All he knew was that there was blood on the door. Perhaps it was something sinister, or perhaps someone had just got their hand caught closing it. He felt no closer to answers, only more disturbed. His return to the logs was rewarded with only an unpleasant episode that fulfilled no other purpose other than to make him feel bad about himself and dislike his crewmates even more. It started with a sort of slime mold found in the storage room. It was one of those weird, disturbing kinds often found in deep space, with moving tentacle-like protrusions that made them seem extra alive. This one was a fleshy pink and apparently made sounds, both the standard squish sounds and something multiple crew members described as a screaming cat. It was agreed unanimously that someone needed to clean this out, and it was agreed almost unanimously that Jackson was the one to do it. I'm a maintenance technician, not a janitor. It's not my job to clean stuff, but they don't seem to care. I mean, I thought these bases were supposed to be self-cleaning, and I guess it's mostly my job. But when it comes to something that, uh, alive, it's kind of not up to the job, he complained in his log. I tried to argue that Spencer should do it because it's a life form and she's a scientist, but she just said she wasn't that kind of scientist and the captain actually took her side on this, for once, and said she wasn't allowed to do scientist stuff anymore anyway. Crisp just laughed and said this was my chance to get my first kill and finally become a man, not helping. Spencer, in her account, seemed unsympathetic. He actually tried to argue with me that I might be sentient because it was moving and making noises, and I had to explain to him that a thousand species of space molds have been studied already. And they all move, or scream, or both, and it's been proven beyond a doubt that they have no brain or central nervous system. You might as well get worked up over bathroom mildew. He came back an hour later, covered in goop, with his whole thousand yard stare going as if he'd been in an actual war, for Christ's sake, and going on over and over again about how he'd heard it scream as he shot it out the airlock. He said he'd never be able to forget those screams. Maybe it was a little harsh, but I said, Wow, if only we had some kind of device that could do something about that. He didn't say anything. Just went off. I'm assuming to cry. I don't know. Maybe that was kind of rough, but he should have known better than to open his big mouth about my research. I'm the one that has to deal with my whole career being destroyed. He only has to deal with having to clean up a slime mold. Captain Wynn also did not have, in Jackson's eyes, a great response. Jackson came to me saying he had nightmares that the mold came back, and I told him it had been his professional responsibility, out of respect to himself and to others, to make sure he got all of it, and to bleach all the surfaces, and if it did come back, it would be a good life lesson about making sure to do a task thoroughly. He seemed more inclined to wallow in self-pity and to take advantage of this teachable moment. But I have a feeling that this wisdom will sink in eventually. Crisp was, unsurprisingly, a dick about it. 10,000 years ago when men were men, when the only people who passed on their genes were brute force survivors willing to do whatever it takes, this guy would have been populating the belly of a saber-toothed tiger. All this technology is filling the human race with these useless softballs of dough. 
I can't wait for the next cataclysm to weed them all out. With some trepidation, Jackson went back down to the storage room to go over it with a fine-toothed comb. Despite everyone's carping, he'd apparently done a great job. It was eerily clean, the metal surfaces spotless, not a single sign of a terrifying mold creature. This, thought Jackson proudly, was indeed professional quality work. 41 days. He was rifling through Spencer's lab again, trying to see if there were any clues as to how to get her rig working, when he found in the desk drawer that paper again. He'd completely forgotten it was still there and now found the familiar handwriting staring him in the face, and read it unthinkingly before he realized, too late, what it was. The word is Lodestar. A pulse of pain shot through his head and he tensed up, prepared for the worst. But though it surged unbearably for a few seconds, it suddenly faded, with him still standing. And an image flashed into his mind. A memory. A circuit diagram and a series of steps. How to repair an Agricorp 3-in-1 ration packet processor RPP-124. He drew in a breath. Perhaps he had to try. He spoke hesitantly in a whisper. Lodestar. The pain struck again, harder, and he fell to his knees this time. But something was coming back, flowing into his thoughts. Something dark and unpleasant. A bear trap. A brain. Maggots. A man who wasn't quite dead. No, no, no. He said, shaking his head and then his whole body trying to disrupt his train of thought with mindless, vigorous action. He banged his knee on a chair and it hurt so much it managed to push aside the awful thoughts for the moment. But it kept creeping back throughout the day, and he had to keep warding it off by banging his fist on the wall, loudly singing nonsense songs and other desperate distractions. After dinner, he went back to the lab, reached into the desk drawer, eyes averted, and crumpled up the paper. Forty days. After he was able to think clearly through the incident, he came up with some guesses. The first memories that returned were the ration processor repair instructions, and Crisp's awful anecdote, which were the first things Spencer's device had helped him forget. Obviously, he'd gone on to forget a whole bunch more, probably due to the device being used on him again. It stood to reason that if he tried the word again, he'd probably start recovering the next things he'd forgotten. At some point, he'd get back to the final three days that were missing from the logs, but he'd have to go through an awful lot of stabbing headaches and months of what sounded like terrible memories to get there. Perhaps he could do a little bit every day. It wouldn't be so bad in small doses. Then he had time. He tried to prepare himself this time. He ate his lunchtime ration packet, used the toilet, played a bit of guitar to relax, cleared the bed and sat down. If he passed out, he wanted to make sure he landed safely. Lodestar, he said firmly. Thoughts came in a rush, of a flash-colored slime mold, tentacles reaching out, something that he could swear looked like an eyeball. And the screaming, the screaming, not like a cat at all, but a human in torment. His precautions turned out to be a good idea, because he passed out. When he came to, he decided to put this experiment on hold, indefinitely. 39 days. The nightmares were back, of course. Good job, Jackson, he told himself. The screaming mold, the festering maggots, and Crisp of gloating over Jackson's discomfort, telling him to grow a pair already. This last part as far as Jackson remembered, wasn't in the logs, which meant it might be his actual memory. It wasn't the most useful of memories, but it gave him hope that he was on the way to getting more back. He tried to counteract the new horrors living in his thoughts by filling his mind with the most offensively boring content he had access to. Captain Wynn's logs. 
He sighed almost in relief as he watched Captain Wen describe what he'd learned from a management book he was reading. He finally summarized excitedly. Just from these case studies, it sounds like one can see some really remarkable changes in team dynamics when going from two updates a week to three. What I'd really love to see is if this applies equally to written updates versus in-person. I can't wait to get back on an assignment where I can apply some of this stuff. I've tried my best with what I have here, but you can't help people who don't want to be helped. I've done my best to instill values of professionalism and civility in the big picture growth mindset. But they've completely lost themselves in self-pity and petty squabbles. I try to tell myself it doesn't reflect on my leadership skills and that mentor-mentee relationships are a two-way street. But it's wearing me down, damn it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I get heated over this. My wisdom calendar's quote of the day is, This too shall pass. And what could be more appropriate? All I have to do is hold on and continue to do my duty to the best of my abilities for 98 more days. Once the relief ship arrives, I can hand off this mess to another poor soul and it will be their trial to bear. Jackson squinted and paused the playback. He checked the log's date, today's date, and the countdown timer. He did some calculations on his fingers. He double and triple checked to be absolutely sure before allowing himself to hope, because zero on the countdown timer perfectly coincided with the expected arrival of this relief ship. Knowing full well that the other crew members would have called him a pansy for it, Jackson broke down in tears. After watching the ominous numbers tick down for so long, it was such a relief to know that they were ticking down to rescue, and not to doom. 30 days. The nightmares were actually getting a bit less terrifying, slowly decreasing in horrific imagery and increasing in strange, unimportant seeming memories little snippets and phrases. After a really bad zombie scene and one dream faded into Crisp calling him pathetic, reminiscing about prehistoric times when men were men and then smugly proclaiming, the data is easily accessed by anyone with the proper know-how, upon which Jackson suddenly woke up. He felt like he'd heard something important but struggled to parse it out in his woozy half-sleep mind. Deleted data. Accessing deleted data. He jumped up and got back into Crisp's logs, skimming around to find where he talked about that. It took about an hour, but he finally located it. Crisp explained the trick with a great deal of technical talk that went over Jackson's head, and it made sense why he'd ignored it the first time around. This time he grabbed some technical books and notes from Crisp's room and went sentence by sentence through Crisp's explanation, looking everything up until he finally felt he had a handle on the idea. If he understood correctly, this was a bug that didn't apply to all deleted data, just a really small fraction, where the system had a hiccup during deletion. The system was supposed to detect any hiccups and try again, but because of a mistake on Chris's part, it didn't. The data would just remain there, unlisted. A deleted log wouldn't show up in, for example, the log list, but if you knew the exact place to look, the computer would show it to you. Unfortunately, finding the proper jumble of numbers and letters sounded like it would take an entire course on computers. Fortunately, he had some time. 21 days. He was really starting to enjoy learning about the ins and outs of computers, courtesy of Crisp's library. He'd been intimidated from learning this sort of thing his whole life, as he and everybody around him just took it as a given that it was only for brainy college types. As a sort of half measure, he decided to take a machine maintenance course, figuring it was the closest a normal guy could get to the glamorous high-tech life. But it turned out there was really nothing magical about it at all. All it came down to was giving a computer a bunch of instructions and making sure you did it exactly the way the computer wanted to hear it. Otherwise, it would find a loophole and do it wrong. Sort of like making a deal with the devil. When he got out of this jam, he figured he might get serious and take some computer courses. Crisp made three times what he did, 
and Jackson had a feeling he wasn't one of the better computer specialists. It didn't seem too far out of reach at all for Jackson to get at least a certificate, double his salary, and maybe start working on a real degree part-time. Thus motivated, he slowly put together the foundation he needed to solve the whole deleted data problem. He built a little script that was able to find a few pockets of undeleted data and tell him exactly where to find them. He pulled up the first one. It was a porn video and it had been deleted by Crisp. He began to delete it and then hesitated. After a few more moments of evaluation, he moved it into his own directory, saving it for later. He pulled up the next one. It was one of his own logs, from the deleted three days. He was disheveled and crying, and the lighting was dim, like it was now, unlike all the other previous logs. Everything's gone wrong. It wasn't supposed to be like this. It can't be. Someone's got to figure out something, right? They've got to. I don't want to die. I can't. I just don't want to die. I just can't. I just can't. I can't do it. It went on like this. Expressions of his wish not to die, alternating with terrified, pitiful blubbering. It was painful to watch, but Jackson bit his lip and stared intently, scanning every frame. He had to know if there was anything further to be learned. It turned out there wasn't, and the only real outcome of the whole exercise was to feel worse about himself again. Seventeen days. At some point he came to the decision that he was going to drop the past and focus on the future. A rescue ship was, probably, on its way. If he could make it till then, someone else could figure out what had happened. Whatever it was, there didn't seem to be any immediate danger, and any lurking danger had had plenty of time to show itself. In the meantime, it was probably more worth his time to study up on computers or get better at guitar than to give himself more nightmares, or force himself to look at more unflattering examples of his cowardly character. Fourteen days. He was still watching logs but now he decided to focus on the personal, trivial details, trying to get to know these strangers he'd apparently worked with for so long. Spencer talked a little bit about her family in brief moments where she wasn't focused on her research and her grievances with the board. Got another message from home. Dad wants me to give it up and go home, be a dental hygienist or something. I gave it a good try, he said, but maybe some things aren't meant to be. I just wish... I think I could show them. I think they'd see if I could only get my papers published. I mean, there's never been anything like it. I'd get headlines in regular papers, a prize, maybe even an appointment at the Science Federation. As soon as I can just get even just one major publication, I think I could go back for a visit. Go back and hold my head up and just enjoy the time and see them and see Ella and not have to worry about anything about dental hygienist schools, or teacher training programs, or any other backup plans. One of the deleted logs was just Chris being vulnerable. He had styled his hair in this video. It looked ridiculous. He seemed to be somewhat aware of this and kept self-consciously rearranging it. Trying to put together a new photo for my date net profile. I think it's time to give it another try. I now think the reason I never got any bites on my last one was not any deficiency on my part, but simply a misunderstanding of the common unspoken signals in the dating market," he said, tugging at his crisp collared shirt. I've watched a few very enlightening videos on this, and I think I'm ready to put out a much more successful revised profile. I'm focusing on instinctive signals of reproductive success that women are wired to respond to, such as a more powerful stance more alpha gaze, and more assertive, dominant language. I really think I've unlocked it this time. Of course, I'm realistic about this. I don't expect to be flooded with responses. Or at least I think I would count it as success if I just got one response. In fact, if I just got one response, I'd put it on hold for a bit. Just to be fair to the women, and well, no sense spreading myself too thin. This... He coughed, and then straightened up, standing up, 
putting his hands on his hips and throwing his head back. This is going to be the time. Someone is finally going to see what I've got. And he shot such a ridiculous glance at the camera, simultaneously full of macho posturing and anxiety to please, that Jackson had to laugh. Captain Wynne had a wife, whom he constantly talked about as a gift and a blessing, and generally sounded like the most generic wife in the world. However, he had his moments. Darla keeps talking about children, and I'm certainly not against it, but I really worry sometimes about how it might impact our careers, especially when we're still climbing the ladder. And with all the traveling. But she really wants them, and I do think it would be maybe quite nice sometimes to look at a new little person that is like a little her and a little me at the same time. That maybe makes that face she makes when she eats something sour, or shakes his head the way I do. I don't know what's so special about it, but, well, I must shake it in some kind of unique way that always seems to make Darla laugh. Jackson didn't need to learn about himself. He'd only lost six months of memories. He knew why he'd come here, his modest background, and his modest goals. Up until now, he didn't really have any particular ambitions for his future. Not even Crisp's little dream of getting one woman to be impressed with him. He just wanted to get by. But now? Maybe he could make something of this computer thing. It opened up so many possibilities, he just had to make it off this station. Zero days. His heart was beating like a dance track. His pre-dinner time short-range scan had picked up an approaching ship. Only moments later he could dimly make out a visual in the window. And not long after that, a voice crackled over the loudspeaker. A woman's voice. Thetis 14, do you read? This is the UFS Philip K. Dick. Jackson scrambled to the microphone. Yes, he shouted. Yes, I'm here. Repeat, Thetis 14... Do you read? I'm here. I'm here! Jackson shouted into the microphone over and over, flipping switches and pressing buttons frantically. It's no good, said a male voice coming from the same speaker. Oh my god. When's the last time they were supplied? Harper? Said the female voice. A fainter voice belonging to neither of the first two replied unintelligible to Jackson. Damn. If they haven't had a food supply for that long, I don't know if there's anybody left to- Uh, Captain Weston? The comms channel has been open the whole time. It's fine. I don't think anybody's listening anyway. I'm here, I'm here! Cried Jackson frantically. He tried waving his arms at the window, hoping they'd be able to see. In any case, we should dock and see if we can find any survivors, or recover any... Well, move into dock, and turn off the comms channel. The ship slowly approached, looming larger and larger in the window. But it would be a while yet, and Jackson realized there was nothing to do but wait. He sat back and opened his dinner ration packet squeezing it into his mouth and chewing contemplatively as he watched the supply ship silently drift nearer. Suddenly, his teeth hit something hard. Wincing, he pulled it out of his mouth. It was a wedding ring. He froze for what felt like an eternity. Horror, rising in his throat. Both horror and food. He vomited violently onto the floor. He tried to push it all away. There was only the now. He had to just stay in the now. The rescue ship was here. He must get up. He must go to the airlock and greet them. Leave everything behind. His legs would not move. He remained there on his knees, bowed over onto the floor, clutching his head, unable to stop what he knew he had to do. Loved star. He said between gritted teeth. Lodestar! Lodestar! Images poured from his brain faster than he could process them. Screams. 
human screams from human mouths slammed in the airlock door. With a knife, with a crowbar, the bodies, the kitchen, the ration packet processor, bloody clothes, debris stuffed into the escape pods, the storage room, the memory device, throwing the cap to the floor, stumbling out of the lab with his last ounce of consciousness and collapsing, waking up to an empty station and a blank mind, and an ample supply of ration packs. Tears streamed from his eyes. The pain had subsided, but he still clutched his head as it throbbed with something white hot and ice cold at the same time. Something unbearable, unthinkable. Crew of the Philip K. Dick The crew finally arrived after a brief hiccup. The airlock door was non-functional, apparently due to someone jamming one of the doors with some kind of object at some point. They'd had to cut it open with a laser torch. A search team methodically explored the station while Captain Weston sent a preliminary report of the station back to headquarters. She then went down to the airlock to meet the returning search team. Yeah, it's a puzzling situation, said Serrano, wiping his brow. No sign of the crew whatsoever. No bodies? asked Weston in disbelief. Serrano shook his head. Not a one. Hmm. So much for the starvation theory, said Weston. That's for sure. They weren't low on food at all. In fact, when we checked the common area, the processor was running and we found about 150 pounds of new ration packets, fresh out of processing. Hello all, this is Magnetar. I hope you enjoyed this tale from the void. It would seem Jackson lost it, much to the dismay of his crew members, I expect. Though it would be interesting to see how Crisp would react now, seeing how Jackson became a quote-unquote alpha male. For what it's worth, this story is written by a female author. Her name is Christina Holland. With that being said, I do want to mention that the way the males in this story treated the female, um, dismissing sexual assault, for example, was disgusting. And I think that was part of what the author was getting at, um, showing just how dismissive males, even the one in power, can be to issues with a woman, especially when she's seen as a quote-unquote uh, unpleasant person. So I just wanted to make that personal statement there that I don't agree with the way that the men in the story were looking at the situations involving the female scientists. With that being said, I thought this was a great story. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. It was sort of a mystery, and if you don't quite understand the ending, feel free to leave a comment and I'm sure people will be happy to explain it to you. Um, in the next day or so, I will be releasing part three of the Derelict series. Um, I have notified the author, so hopefully he will be able to attend the live premiere and you all can chat with him uh, throughout the narration. Uh, beyond that, I've grown past a thousand subscribers and I'm still looking to put something together um, to commemorate the, the event, um, something with other narrators in the community. Um, and as I said before, working on a new intro that I hope to premiere at some point very soon. So if you enjoyed the story, I invite you to join us here in the void by subscribing and taking a look at some of the other tales that we have. But remember, astrophobes be warned.
two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe, or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. I knew the dangers of it all. Hell, they talked about orthostatic intolerance and the constant need for cardiovascular workouts to prevent the loss of consciousness while in space, but they never discussed the supreme sense of isolation that we would be experiencing. They told us about the millions of things that could go wrong on her maiden voyage, but of course they missed the problems that did occur. It was problems such as these that left everyone except for me dead and resulted in our ship being set adrift in the cold vacuum of space. They never told us about the chance that cryopreservation would malfunction and freeze most of our crew to death. And they failed to mention the effect that space travel would have on bacteria, making it essentially superpowered. They glossed over the possibility that the navigational system for the ship could lead us off course millions and millions of light years. I've given you all an overview of what left me the lone survivor on a ghost ship, but I feel like I should go a little more in depth here. My friends and family said I was always more focused on multitasking, so I guess it makes sense. I am recording one final report and my last words simultaneously. I'll start at the beginning. I was brought along on this space excursion to study the environment and atmosphere of any planets we might come across. I think the higher-ups must have had some other homeworld fantasies rattling around in their heads. They named our ship the Exogenesis for crying out loud. I woke up from cryostasis about a week ago and I went about the procedures we had learned in the academy groggily. I first made sure I had been woken up at the appointed time. Then I shakily got out of the invasion of the body snatcher style pod and stretched. It was a few minutes in a calisthenics that I realized that no one else was out with me. A cursory glance around the room revealed that all the pods were still sealed shut and frosted over. My heart immediately began to beat faster. They shouldn't have been opaque like that. I frantically opened the nearest pod and came face to face with the frozen death mask of MacReady. The cryopods must have malfunctioned in some way, freezing and then rapidly thawing had completely lysed all the cells in his body. He was dead, and the machine had likely lost power for a brief moment and caused his cells to completely rupture upon such a rapid change in temperatures. The other pods, well, they were in a similar state. Each had been subjected to a rapid decrease in temperature that resulted in complete cell lysis. The entire crew was dead except for me. And how was I still alive? The cryopreservation system was linked to each pod. It was then that I noticed. There were six. Kelvin, the psychologist, McCready, the navigator, Adams, the captain, Ripley, the warrant officer, me, the environmental scientist, and Hall. The cryopod for Cheryl Hall was open. Somehow, Cheryl Hall had escaped the fate that befell the others. I shambled out of the cryostasis room, still not fully in control of my faculties, and down an empty corridor. I went towards the flight deck, praying that I could find some answers to the questions that were piling up. Unfortunately, it was empty. I looked over the navigational log and found another question. Why were we six months off course? Whatever had prompted me to agree to this two-year expedition quickly evaporated. Most of the crew was dead, and we were millions if not billions of miles away from assistance, and I had never felt so alone in my life. I 
wanted to reset the course or maybe turn the ship around and return back to terra firma. But the more I studied the controls, the more confused I became. Everything on the control panel was a series of switches, levers, and blinking lights. In other words, it was literally rocket science. I was worried that pressing random buttons could completely screw us over, and the only thing I managed to discern from my investigation was that the course had been manually changed. Was there someone else on this ship besides Cheryl and me? My only hope was finding Cheryl and working out this madness together. I moved towards the laboratory on my way to the mess hall. Cheryl had to be either here in the lab, in the mess hall, or not in the ship at all. I shuddered to think of her being gone via the airlock. I was truly terrified that I would be the only survivor on this ship, doomed to spend the rest of my life drifting aimlessly through space. I kept one hand on the railing to prevent falling face down on the metal grating that composed the walkways. I arrived in the small laboratory to find it in complete disarray. Someone had taken a lab stool and swung it around the lab in a blind, all-consuming rage. The autoclave, air hood for handling chemicals, and the centrifuge had been broken to bits. The shelf that held the series of bacterial samples that we had brought along to study their growth in space had been tipped over, and each culture individually smashed underfoot. Dried, rust-colored droplets of blood seemed to be flicked across the room as if the perpetrator had injured themselves slightly in the rampage. What the hell had happened here? I shuffled through the ruins of the laboratory to the mess hall itself, and at this point I was slowly regaining control of my appendages and mental faculties. The mess hall is the largest part of the ship. It's broken into three parts. One section for food storage, with enough supplies for a two-year voyage. Another part was a dining hall. And the final was a garden with bed soil that went three feet deep to allow for renewable foodstuffs. Upon entering the dining hall, I was hit with the smell of decay and decomposition. My worst fear was realized when I saw her. What remained of Cheryl Hall was in a booth with her head resting on the table. A glass had tipped over, but the liquid had completely evaporated or had been absorbed by her now bloated, festering face. Her stomach was tumescent from the built-up gases and her body had already begun to putrefy. If I had to weather a guess, I would estimate that she died a few weeks ago. That smell was completely atrocious. It was a mix of rot and shit that insinuated itself around the booth that was her tomb. There was a small handheld camera facing her on the table. As I looked at what remained of Cheryl, memories flooded back to me. I remembered working with her in zero gravity training. I kept glancing sideways at her. I recalled joking with her about the bureaucracy that held up the space voyage for so long. I remember her smile sent warmth throughout my core. Most of all, I remembered our last celebration before our maiden voyage. I remembered getting her alone in an adjacent hallway and pressing her up against a wall and nearly smothering her with kisses told her that I had wanted to do that the moment I had laid eyes on her. I remember pulling back from that passionate embrace and the look in her eyes. There was a hint of dreaminess, but also of uncertainty. My eyes flooded with tears and deep groans racked my body. She was gone really gone. I could remember memories of her all I wanted, but that wouldn't change the fact that she was lying before me then. 
She was lying face down on the booth and rotting away to a skeleton. I crumpled to my knees and pressed my forehead to the grating as the sadness and despair enveloped me like a shell. I'm not sure how long I remained in that position, but eventually I regained some modicum of composure. Finally, I managed to rise shakily to my feet, and I avoided looking at her corpse. I knew that I would lose it all over again if I looked. And I'm not proud of what I did next, but spending all that time in stasis with no nutrition except intravenous nutrients had left me starved. I needed something solid to eat. So I left the body and moved to the pantry. I surveyed the sparse supply of food that we had left. There should have been enough food here to sustain us all throughout the ship, but a large quantity wasn't on the shelves anymore. How long had Hall been awake and alone on the ship? I gathered all the food that was there and did a quick inventory. There was enough food to last me a few months, and Hall wasn't a big drinker. They'd sent us out with a few bottles of wine to use for cooking and a bottle of champagne to celebrate a safe arrival. The champagne was almost empty and there were five bottles of wine from the original seven. I ate some nutrient paste on crackers while thinking of my next move. I decided I would bury Cheryl Hall. I was ground in the garden and the longer she was left out, the greater the chance of me getting sick from the bacteria that was growing on her festering corpse. She deserved the decency of a funeral. So I proceeded to the garden. The soil was only a few meters deep, but it would serve as a decent burial spot. The problem wasn't in the location, but in the tools themselves. There were a few tools essential for gardening, but no shovel. I had to resort to using a trowel. And she deserved a decent burial. She deserved the hard work, the back-breaking labor, the love. A few hours I spent, hunched over the land, feverishly pawing the earth with a six-inch trowel, and I was finally finished. I got out of that hole and stretched. Now was the time for the actual burial. I moved the body from the dining hall to the grave, and this was the moment I feared the most. I approached the body cautiously. When I was younger, I loved to watch those old zombie movies, and I guess some instinctual part of me was wary. I didn't think she would lunge at me from the booth and try and sink her teeth into me, but that logical and factual portion of my psyche wasn't able to completely disassociate myself from the idea. And I'm not proud to admit it, but I spent a few minutes standing over the corpse, paralyzed to inaction by my fear. Eventually, I managed to gather her up in my arms. I cradled her body to my chest. I desperately tried to keep my eyes forward and not meet her decomposed visage or smell her rotting corpse. Only once did my gaze meet her swollen, rotted face, and that was all I needed to see. I gagged and tore my eyes away from her body. I carefully moved towards the open grave. And I'm not the strongest of people, but I managed to get her to the grave, though I was panting and sweating heavily. I tried to set her in the grave as softly as I could, but my arms had grown weak from carrying her so far, and my arms just gave as I lowered her and I dropped her into that grave. Her stomach ruptured and the odor hit me in a wave. I felt like something had actually punched me in the sinus. That's how bad the stench was. I couldn't help it, and I threw myself back and heaved the paste and crackers onto the earth next to me. I like to say I have a steel stomach, but there are some things in this world that can offend even my womanly sensibilities. 
I wiped my mouth clean and set about burying my friend. An hour later, I was finished. There wasn't much to tell. I cried over the disturbed earth and wept. I said, I think I loved you. And there wasn't much else I could think of to say. We had worked together for the year before the initiation of our expedition, and other than that kiss we shared during our celebration, I hadn't known her outside of work. I wish I had. I'd hoped that this voyage would have given us plenty of time to connect and build a relationship, but didn't. I said a quick prayer and left the grave before emotions could overtake me and paralyze me again. Now my focus was on the tape that she had left. I was lightheaded from the strenuous activity, but I managed to make it to the booth and pick up the camcorder. After that, I went to the storeroom and fixed myself some more food to refill my recently voided stomach. I debated whether or not to play the tape. It felt like I was invading her last moments in words, but I decided that her last recording might hold some answers or clues to what had happened. I sat down with some crackers and meat paste and turned on the last recorded message. From the time of start to the end of the recording, I didn't touch my food. The recording opened with her face. She was looking at the camera and she looked haggard with bags under her eyes and a vacant stare. It was almost as if I was looking into the face of a completely different person. She always had a bubbly and vivacious persona, but this Cheryl looked melancholic and dead to the world. She said, I'm dying. It doesn't take a doctor to see that. I can't hold food down and I feel like I'm shitting out my soul. Dehydration is probably going to get me. If not that, then starvation. It started a while ago, but I know I only have a couple of days tops before I kick the bucket. It all started when I woke up early from cryostasis due to some horrible malfunction, months ahead of our destination. She continued. I tried to reprogram my chamber and go back to sleep, but that was futile. I spent so much time lying in the pod and fiddling with the controls. No matter how hard I tried, I was unable to learn anything. I was so alone. I tried to turn the ship around, but I think I sent us off course and further from our home. I just wanted to go back. She broke into tears, which lasted a few minutes. Instead, I shanghaied us, impossibly far from home. She managed to regain her composure before continuing. This is all so fucked up. After a few weeks of solitude, I tried to wake someone up. I couldn't stand to be alone anymore. The silence was just so oppressive. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I thought just shutting off the machines would wake them. She winced and clutched at her stomach for a few seconds before continuing. I just wanted someone else to talk to. I didn't mean for him to die. God, MacReady, I'm so sorry. The realization hit me like a wave. MacReady was dead because she tried to wake him up from cryostasis. Ripley and Kelvin, too. She killed them. I... I came across this camcorder for recording our voyage. It's ironic that I'm using it to record my last message. I mean, is that irony or coincidence? Shit, I don't know anymore. I can't think straight. My thoughts are getting fuzzy. I think I might have caught something when I smashed up the lab. I just... I just lost it. The situation became too much for me to handle. I had to lash out. And I think there was something in those cultures. She grasped at her stomach and ran off screen. 
Hall came back a few minutes later, and she spoke slowly. One thing they don't tell you in training, diarrhea is not fun in space. I'm feeling weak. I've had this for a few days now, and I can barely think. She took a long drink from a glass of water on the table before proceeding onward. I killed them. We just kept drifting further and further, each day bringing us further out of range of home. It was a kindness. Not having to wake up and be exposed to this... This fear. This hopelessness. This sickness. She looked directly into the camera and said, It was the only kindness I had left to give. Hall rested her head on the table before she continued her dazed message. I couldn't kill her. I couldn't bear the thought. I stood over her body for hours, my fingers on the console. I didn't want to think of what happened to the others happening to her. God help me, I left her alive. I want to think that there still might be hope of rescue, but the rational part of me knows that this is just the delirium talking. I'm too exhausted to move now. I just wanted to tell you. Thank you for the kiss. God, I'm so thirsty. Cheryl Hall reached for the glass, but it slipped out of her hand and spilled on the table, washing over her face. She laid there, breathing raggedly and sending small ripples playing across the spilled water with every strained breath. I watched for a few minutes before fast-forwarding the tape. I fast-forwarded until I realized that she wasn't moving anymore. An hour elapsed on fast forward and she didn't make the faintest of movements. The camera shut itself off after a certain period of inactivity. She was dead. Whatever Cheryl had contracted from smashing up the lab had killed her. A few days passed by and I tried my best to figure out the ship's navigational system. I wasn't suited for the task. There was no point in randomly pressing buttons and I couldn't find any manuals or guides to the controls. The exogenesis seemed damned to spend eternity drifting through space without destination. On the fourth day, I started to feel nauseous. I told myself that it was just my imagination. I couldn't have contracted the sickness from the destroyed laboratory. Too much time had passed for the cultures to survive. Could my contact with Cheryl Hall have infected me? On the fifth day, I knew that I had to be sick. I was sprinting to the toilet every 30 minutes, trying desperately to keep my food in my stomach, but the very thought of filling my stomach left it feeling roiled. I had to have some form of salmonella or something. I remember when I contracted the illness as a kid. The symptoms I had then mirror the symptoms I am now experiencing. Diarrhea, stomach pain, nausea. I just couldn't replenish my fluids fast enough and I started to suffer the effects of dehydration. I know the average person can survive without water for three to five days. I know my time is running out. On the sixth day, I walked to Hall's grave in the garden and I spit on it. Ambivalence raged inside me. This was the goddess that I had fallen over all throughout training. This was the bitch that infected me and killed the crew. It had to be in her digestive system. When she fell into the grave and split open like a ripe watermelon, I must have been infected. I left that grave knowing that there was nothing else I could do. And there was really nothing left to do. I spent the seventh day in a frenzy trying to keep my fluid intake up and pretend everything was going to be alright. But it's not. 
I'm dying. As I said, this is my final message to my friends and family. Doubt this will ever reach you, but I have a lot left to say that I don't want to go unsaid. There is nothing left here. I'm getting sicker and sicker. There's no medication for what I have. This is the only choice left. I'm not going to die like Cheryl, lying face down on the table in my own filth as I succumb to dehydration. I'm going to expedite the process. That's why I have a rivet gun with me. I don't have many other options here. I think I'm going to press it to the roof of my mouth and pull the trigger. See if that'll work. The rivets are only three or four inches long. I'm using this tape recorder so you don't have to see what I'm about to do. Oh, I also cracked open a bottle of Merlot. I doubt it's going to do any more damage than the sickness already has. I just need a bit of the old liquid courage to get the rivet gun into my mouth. <sighs> I don't think the NASA eggheads who engineered the pneumatic hammer had thought of it as a means for suicide. It was probably to be used to repair the whole of the exogenesis should there be any damage. The wine is alright. Tastes bitter. I think I'll have another bottle. So, to my family. Sorry if this sounds a little slurry. Dehydration is taking its toll and the wine sure isn't helping. I wish I could hear all of your voices one last time. Space can be quiet. I hope you all remember the good times. And please don't remember me like this, crying into a fucking tape recorder, so far away with a rivet gun in between my legs. You know, this second bottle tastes a little better. Can't say I have the energy for a third. You know, there's that quote about space. Whether it's more terrifying to know that we were not alone or completely alone. Well, I think I have my answer. Fuck, I'm out of wine. I am an oceanographer. Ever since my family started bringing me to the beach when I was young, I was fascinated by the sea. But fascination turned to something else when I was hired to work in an underwater sea lab in the Baltic. My name is Will. I had recently graduated with a degree in marine biology and was looking to start my career. I would always thought the only underwater research lab had been off the coast of Florida the Aquarius Reef Base. But here I was staring at an application to work on another sea lab across the world. I chalked my lack of knowledge up to my own incompetence and applied for the job. It wasn't long before I got a reply. A sophisticated man with a German accent spoke with me about my education and all the other regular things that you would hear in a job interview. But at the end of the conversation, Things started to get a little weird. Are you in any way afraid of any sea life? Like sharks, for example? Asked Bertram, the German interviewer. 
I'd say I have a healthy fear of ocean predators, I said. But I don't mind swimming with them. They mostly aren't interested in humans. Good to hear, he said. I completely agree. The job will include some diving in some deeper waters, and this can make some people uneasy. To my surprise, I was hired. I boarded a plane and ended up in Rostock, a medium-sized German port city. I made my way over to the port itself, where I was to meet with the team and start traveling to my new home under the sea. I had read the documents they had sent over to familiarize myself with the underwater environment. I had noticed, however, that there were no bathrooms, and this seemed a little strange. I assumed that I probably would just go in the ocean. I had been peeing in the ocean since I was a kid, but I had never gone number two. I laughed to myself as I thought of how silly it was that I was dwelling on such a triviality. When I arrived on the dock, there was Bertram. I recognized him from the video conference we'd had before. He was taller than I had expected. Then next to him stood another tall, skinny man. Ah, speak of the devil, Bertram said as I approached. His accent made me chuckle to myself, but his grammar and diction were very good nonetheless. Vil, I would like you to meet Derek, our colleague. Derek also seemed very polite, and his English was excellent. We have a team of French, German, and English speakers. We mostly speak English, but you will have to forgive us if occasionally we start ranting in our native tongues together, said Bertram. At that, Derek mumbled something in German, and they both laughed. We hitched a ride on another vessel out towards the east. After about an hour, I saw a little ship. That is the Hoffnung, said Bertram, a humble ship. The ship was small and rusty. It looked like I had seen better days. Something seemed off. The facility underwater was much too advanced to be paired with such a beat up looking ship. We geared up for the dive. As far as depth is concerned, the Baltic is pretty shallow. Yet, I was surprised to hear that we would be diving down to a depth of 65 meters. The deepest I had ever gone was 30, and going 65 didn't help my growing anxiety. Don't worry. It is a one-way trip, so it isn't very dangerous. You don't have to worry about the bends. I remembered how cool it was that the underwater facility used ambient pressure and a moon pool. The entire facility was pressurized. It was still too deep for humans to live at that pressure between seven and eight atmospheres. Though humans can free dive quite deep, they cannot live in such crushing pressures for extended periods of time. Three atmospheres was what the facility was pressured to. Still, the time saved not having to go back and forth between sea level and seven atmospheres made this facility useful for studying the seabed. We have all heard how we know less about our oceans and outer space. This was what fascinated me so much about the sea. The beginning of the descent was uneventful. Things started to become darker as less light was able to penetrate the depths. When we reached 40 meters, it was like I was entering another world. It was surreal. I had never been this deep before, and I remembered my driving instructor mentioning how dangerous it was. People were said to fall into a trance. As we continued to descend into the misty depths, a building appeared. It was taller than I had expected, spanning at least three stories upward. Certainly this was not the facility that I had read about. Soon enough, however, I saw the moon pool. It was a peculiar thing to emerge from the ocean into an indoor swimming pool, and we all treaded water for a minute. Bertram and Derek turned and smiled at me. I couldn't help but smile back. It was just so badass. I felt like I was in some kind of sci-fi movie. The room we were in was pressurized higher than the rest of the facility, and we made our way into a depressurization chamber after removing our gear. Watch your arm, said Derek as I clumsily walked into a loose panel. It grazed my skin a little. Sorry, said Bertram. I should have mentioned the loose panel. This facility is much larger than I read, I said, inquiring about the large structure I had seen. Yes, said Bertram. The document is out of date. 
The facility has expanded in several areas, so we lowly scientists are to remain in our humble quarters. He and Derek laughed. I thought this facility was entirely run by scientists, I said. The job application had been from the website of Geomar, a prestigious research institution in Germany. It started that way, but after funding was cut back, it looked like we were going to have to abandon the facility, said Bertram. But then, they discovered the ore deposits down the hole. The hole? I asked. We entered the habitat I had familiarized myself with from the manual. There was a bunkhouse, a mess hall, and a couple of other rooms for science and storage. Is this the new bloke? Asked a voice from around the corner. In walked a short man with a smile on his face. He had instant charisma. Don't let the crowd scare you, mate. Things are peachy down here. He shook my hand with a vigor that left my arm noodling. He was a middle-aged man, a little older than the rest of them. Name's Doug. I'm from Newcastle. I nodded. This whole kraut thing, said Bertram. I just don't understand why you all think it's offensive. It just means cabbage. Your people's World War II put down the vent very good. I couldn't help but chuckle at their relationship when, suddenly, a loud explosion rang out. They all grabbed for something to brace themselves with. Is everybody alright? Came a shrill worried voice from deeper into the facility, amidst the flickering buttons and endless readouts. A French woman cautiously came into the room hugging the wall, and despite the fear the crash moments ago had instilled, she smiled politely to me. Welcome, Will. It is good to see you, she said somewhat nervously. Hi, I said, smiling back. She was wearing a cap and bulky crewman coveralls, yet I could tell that she was really beautiful. Those bastards are really pushing our luck with those explosions, said Doug. They're gonna get us all killed. Why are there explosions? I asked. We didn't have the funding to keep this place running. We were forced to entice some other parties. I said it then and I say it now. It was a short-sighted decision, said Doug. Yes, but what choice did we have? asked Bertram. The rest of the day was spent familiarizing myself with the facility. Everything was just like I had said in the manual, except for an ominous looking door just after the pressurization chamber. That was new. Though the whole place looked like a futuristic spaceship, this door seemed to be even more so. It looked strong. At first there was constant traffic in and out, but after they completed their submarine docking station, a soul hasn't passed through that door in months. We occasionally speak with one of them on the radio, but we have less and less contact as they need us less. It is a little strange, but it is better than being shut down, said Bertram as he noticed me looking at the door. Who exactly are they? I asked. Well, at first it was underwater welders and construction workers who worked for a German mining company, all the usual staff. But after several months, the miners left and apparently ownership of the facility changed hands again, so I've heard nothing about whom. Geoma has been vague about it all. No doubt they are up to some kind of exploitive act, probably attempting to weaponize something beautiful. That is why I get the feeling that we are no longer welcome in our own facility. They wouldn't want their secrets exposed by us pesky, good-intentioned scientists," said Bertram laughingly. Eventually, I had to go to the little boys' room, and I finally inquired as to how this was done. They all laughed. It's a pleasure going number two during the day. Them fish can get quite frisky, said Doug. Manon rolled her eyes, smiling. The fish sometimes eat your waist, she said. Don't let Douglas scare you. They are just fish. There is a dome several meters out from the moon pool where you can hang out and do your business. But you won't catch me going out there in the dark, said Doug. Ha. Huh. Yeah, I can imagine the fish are much more frightening in the dark, I said. Actually, that is the weird part, said Bertram. There are no fish at night. Manon lashed the shirt she was holding at Bertram's arm punishingly, yet in a soft, motheringly way. That's, I'm just saying, I don't go number two at night either, said Bertram. Right. Well, if it's an emergency, I drop the log right in the moon pool and you should too, said Doug. Floaters be damned. That is disgusting, 
said Manon. Why do the fish only come at night? I asked. The answer why? Derek thinks it has to do with the body chemistry. The norandrina levels start to spike as the light drops shining through. They scatter in all directions, explained Manon. All except towards the hole, said Derek. What is this hole? I asked. It is the 20 meter wide hole in the bottom of the ocean, out the moon pool to the east. It is hard to miss. We stay away from there, said Derek. I made a point to do my business during the daylight and was alarmed and amused by the amount of fish it attracted. I swam out to the dome and soon several fish began to investigate me. I looked around in the area and saw the massive hole to the east. I could see that the facility must have been built to study the hole. It was starting to get a little darker and I was ready to swim back to the moon pool when I noticed a small submersible ascending out of the hole. The submersible propelled itself towards a large three-story complex attached to our habitat. A hatch opened and the submersible ascended up into the hatch. My imagination ran wild as to what this mysterious other faction was up to behind that hatch. As weird as it all was, after several days I had fallen into a rhythm and everything became normal. I would gather samples and document the wildlife by day, and study my findings as well as talk to my colleagues at night. Occasionally there would be an explosion and, like clockwork, a submersible or two would ascend from the hole at sunset. Sunset became a time of caution, I noticed. The fish would remain until it was dark, but almost in a flash they all knew to disappear as the last sun rays left. It was part of a fascinating cycle. I had seen things like this in nature before, like when bats all fly out of a cave at the same time or birds migrating for winter, but this was different. There was a desperation about it. For the fish, it was more of a desperate scramble. I quickly understood why Doug wouldn't go number two at the dome after dark. I found out that none of them did. Every day I would walk by the mysterious door leading to the other facility, but the hallway beyond was always dark and I could never see that far. It was unnerving. On top of that, there was no portholes or windows of any kind to look into it from the outside. Only the submersibles at sunrise and at sunset. One day I joked. Maybe one of us should try to swim up the hatch one time, I said. The mood in the room became very tense, and it wasn't long before Manon burst into tears. I didn't understand. I'm sorry, I said. It's okay, mate. It isn't your fault, said Doug, as he went to console Manon. I tried to look at Bertram, who usually explained things to me when I was baffled, but his eyes remained fixed on his breakfast. I looked at Derek. It is time we'll knows about Javier, said Derek. Nobody said a word. All that could be heard was Manon sobbing. Who is Javier? I asked. Javier was the marine biologist you replaced, said Derek, and he also had the idea to swim up the hatch. We were informed that he was dead over a week later, the bastards, said Doug. We began searching desperately, but after a couple of hours, we knew that the air would have run out. We started searching for his body, apparently the whole time he was in the other facility. What? I asked, mortified. Aye. They said that there had been an accident and they weren't able to save him, said Doug. And they waited to tell you? I asked. He nodded. I never looked at the hatch the same way. Had Javier been trapped in there and run out of air? Surely there must have been some way he could have entered the facility, as it is how the submersibles went in and out. Over the coming days, things went back to normal, or at least as normal as living 60 meters underwater could be. I didn't dare broach the subject of Javier. I just kept my head down and did my work. There was plenty of plant life to catalog, and not to mention all of the different species of fish and jellyfish. Occasionally a pod of sea mammals would pass through. As I was performing my nightly bathroom ritual before the dark set in, one night I noticed the submersible ascending from the hole as always, only this time, it seemed to be having trouble moving through the water. It almost seemed to be stuttering. 
As I looked closer, I saw what looked like markings on the side of the vessel, as if it had been in some kind of accident down there. I shuddered to think what would have happened if the craft had been damaged more. There, I tread in the outhouse dome, wondering what I just saw. It made me feel uneasy, but nothing like what I felt after what I saw next. My gaze fell back on the giant sinkhole. There, at the very edge, I saw something that will horrify me for the rest of my life. I saw a head looking back. The rest of the body was hidden down the hole. Just the head, as if it was peering at me. Even with the water clouding the distance between us, I felt his stare burn into my soul. Here, 60 meters below in the middle of the ocean was a face, completely unencumbered by gear, no air tanks. What was he breathing? I must have been hallucinating, but the moment lasted for what seemed like a lifetime. Up until then, it was the longest moment of my life. His eyes locked on mine. Just his head. As it got darker, I came out of my confused trance. I made a mad dash for the moon pole. I didn't dare look back. I leapt out of the moon pole and into the decompression chamber, and I was terrified. I stared at the moon pole through the window, half expecting the head to emerge from the water. How could a man have been in the hole? He would have had to have held his breath for at least five minutes as I hadn't seen anyone else as I swam to the dome. Although, with training, a human being can hold their breath that long, something was just off. I had goosebumps all over my body. I had heard of pressurized air playing tricks on people's minds. Perhaps I had nitrogen necrosis. I quickly went in and told the others. Elevated levels of nitrogen affect all of us in different ways, said Manon as she examined me. It is possible that you hallucinated. Yeah, I must have, I said. If anything like this happens again, come tell us right away, she said. I noticed Derek looking at me from across the habitat. He quickly looked away when I made eye contact. There was something about it that made me feel like he knew more. I decided to sleep it off, but had wild dreams about what I saw. I woke in a cold sweat. I felt even more exhausted than before. The crew, for the most part, hadn't noticed that I was a little off. All except Derek. He approached me that night. You must be feeling a little rattled, he said. I was good friends with Javier. When he died, I sort of lost it a little bit. I couldn't sleep or eat. I even saw things, too. He became very serious. This place is dangerous. More so than the others understand, said Derek. He brought me over to a laptop and opened up a folder with images. He then brought up a picture of the crew all happily posing. There they all were. Doug, Manon, Derek, and Bertram. Then my eyes came to rest on the fifth person. And when they did, electricity ran through my body all at once as horror welled up from the depths of my soul into my throat. There stood the very same face that had stared at me from the hole. And all at once I knew who that was, what Derek had seen, and what it meant. I could barely speak. I just muttered. That was the man I saw, I said. We have to tell the others, and they're not going to believe it, or like it, he said. We headed into the common room, where the others were gathered. Derek led bluntly in a dire tone. We both saw Javier, alive in the water, he said. Doug almost dropped what he was doing and turned around to look at us, then looked at Bertram who was as beweathered as him. Then they broke into laughter. Manon looked very upset. Such is not funny, Derek. And Will? I didn't think you were like this, she said. Derek showed me a picture of Javier, and it was without a doubt the same face that looked at me, I said. I didn't care about impressing Manon anymore. Something was horribly wrong. 
I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me because Javier had just died. I heard you could see people, sometimes, who have just died, said Derek. So I didn't think much of it, but one thing is very clear. We need to leave, he said. It was empowering to be next to him. I would have never had the courage to say these things. There was a moment of silence. Okay, I will put in a call for the ship to come pick up whoever wants to leave. All right, mate, but this is my life's work. I can't just leave because you think you saw a ghost, you understand? Said Doug, respectfully. I strongly urge you to reconsider, said Derek. And we can't wait for the ship to get us. We need to take the Hafnung now. Suddenly, this wasn't sounding like such a good idea. The Hafnung had seen better days. Bertram started to argue with Derek in German. Manon and Doug started jumping in, and I had no idea what was going on. At last, however, Derek won out with a loud exclamation that silenced the rest. He then turned to me. I know it seems like the Hafnung isn't seaworthy, but she is. She passed the required inspection. That was five years ago, Derek. Really? Said Doug. Mate, there's a reason we don't use her anymore. She's a floating platform. Just in case something happens down here. Really? What is another day to wait for the ship? He said. If you had seen what we had seen, you would understand, said Derek. I wasn't sure what to do. On the one hand, waiting another day for a proper ship to take us back seemed reasonable. Yet, what if that thing in the water came into the moon pool tonight? What if it came into the decompression chamber? Very well. I'm going to make the call to be picked up, said Derek. He left and came back moments later. There's a storm coming. They can't make it here for two days, he said. My stomach started to turn. That rusty old boat was starting to look more and more enticing. I was starting to feel better about everything. There were tests to be run and flora to be catalogued. Manon even helped me, which put me at ease. During the day, she started asking me questions. So, you are sure that it was Javier that you saw? She asked. Yes. He must still be alive, but we watched each other for minutes. I don't know anyone who could hold their breath that long. Menon looked at me horrified. He was a good swimmer. But five minutes? I know, I said. After I finally started to feel normal again, I started to feel tired, even though it was just the afternoon. Something about the pressure or being cooped up. That was why I went to sleep early that night and going to sleep early turned out to be a giant mistake. I woke up in the late evening around 10. I had to poop something fierce. I instinctively went over to the decompression chamber. When I entered the moon pool for the first time, I saw pitch black water. I stood there, watching it ripple. Beyond was just the murky black depths. I remember Doug admitting he wouldn't go to the bathroom at night. And now I understood. I walked up to the edge and looked down. There was absolutely no way I was going to swim to the outhouse dome. With little options left, I pulled down my trousers and attempted a squat right over the moon pool. Still, squatting there, I couldn't help but look back every couple of seconds to make sure something wasn't coming up to grab me. It felt silly, but it was a very vulnerable position to be in. After trying for a couple of minutes, I stood back up. It is amazing what kinds of things the body will do when it knows that it's not safe. I suddenly felt no urge to go into the bathroom at all. I slowly backed away from the edge of the moon pool, keeping my eyes on its dark, rippling depths. I thought I saw something move. And I felt a deep fear. I had to get out of there. I went for the decompression chamber, and to my horror, I saw out of my peripheral a mass cresting out of the water. I threw myself into the chamber and, as fast as I could, tried to throw the door closed. A monstrous, dark, grayish-green tentacle moved with startling speed, and just as I was shutting the door, wrapped around my leg, 
sinking several spines into me. I cried with pain as the creature began to drag me out of the chamber. I slammed the door on the tentacle, but it was thick and strong, and continued to drag me. A second tentacle, just like the first, was starting to crest out of the moon pool. Just then I looked up. It was the same sheet metal panel that had grazed me when I first walked in. I ripped it off the wall with surprising ease, and with all my might, for my life, I cleaved the tentacle. It didn't sever it, but I cut it deeply and it released me. Before the second tentacle could reach the chamber, I slammed the door with all my might. I looked at the tentacles prodding and probing at the sealed door. It was absolutely horrifying. I knew they had every intent on dragging me down into the depths. They were terrifying, like a giant octopus with spiny thorns attached, to hook its prey, no doubt. After what seemed like hours, the decompression finished. I had already been screaming and the others had gathered at the door. I exited the chamber and turned to the others. We have to get the hell out of here now, I screamed. Calm down, said Manon. What happened? There is some kind of... I stopped. I didn't know what to say. Look, I know this sounds crazy, but a massive predatory invertebrate grabbed me in the moon pool. Like a Pacific octopus? Doug asked curiously. They were not understanding the gravity of the situation. The tentacles weren't visible from this angle and I dared not open the door to show them. Instead, I showed them my leg. He was bleeding, though not profusely. The puncture wounds were still clearly visible. The others began to inspect his leg. Derek went into another room and came back with a couple of knives. They were the only weapons we had available. At first light, all of us should make a break for the Huffnung, said Derek. But that's about the storm, said Bertram. I would rather take my chances with the storm than be down here. At least I would die a natural death, said Derek. I don't think the others understood, but I knew exactly what he meant. The idea of drowning in the open water somehow seemed like a tolerable alternative. It suddenly made sense. The explosions, the beaten up submersible. This animal was being studied by the other facility. One thing is certain, said Derek. The creature only seems to be around at night, and we seem to be safe in here. I am swimming for the Huffnung in the morning. I strongly urge the rest of you to come. I nodded. The others looked among themselves, not knowing what to think. We all went to our bunks and tried to sleep. After hours of tossing and turning and staring at the entrance, half expecting a dark gray tentacle to slither around the corner, I fell asleep. When I awoke, I started my daily routine. I even got ready to go out and swim to the bathroom when I stopped dead in my tracks. I felt a deep sense of horror, as if I was just remembering what had happened to me in the moon pool just hours before. I suddenly felt no urge to go to the bathroom at all. I just stood there gazing at the pressure chamber. All of the others had risen and were mulling about. Have either of you seen Doug? said Manon. I'm waiting for his data, but I haven't seen him. Maybe he hasn't woken up? I said. He's in his bunk? said Manon. I'm starting to get worried. He probably just went out for some samples, said Bertram. You're probably right said Manon, and she started busying herself with her work. I finally worked up the courage to go out to the bathroom dome. The water was moving faster than usual, but nothing I couldn't swim against. I could see how being a poor swimmer would be very hazardous and understood why they insisted on strong swimmers in the application. Out at the dome, I looked around and realized that there wasn't a fish in sight. Usually during this time of day, the ocean was full of them. But now it was barren. It was unnerving. I looked around the eerie depths, trying to make out what I could through the misty seawater. I noticed something strange. The hatch to the other part of the facility was open. The same hatch that Javier had swam up. Upon thinking about Javier, my eyes darted back to the place where I had seen his eyes staring at me from the hole. I shuddered and suddenly started to feel very vulnerable. I got done with my business and started back towards the moon pool. 
When I entered the habitat, I saw that Manon was coming my way with Bertram and Derek. There you are, she said. We're going out to look for Doug. You should have been back by now. The hatch is open, I said. They all looked at one another. We will have to think about that later, she said. Everyone, suit up and make sure you are full of oxygen. The water was still moving fast due to the stormy conditions. It was difficult to fight against the current, but Doug should have come back by now. and There was a chance he was stuck and running low on air. We had to look for him. We checked down the slope in the opposite direction of the hole, but there was no sign of Doug. We finally came to the hole. We shined our lights down into the depths. Nothing but darkness. After a while, our oxygen levels were getting low and we returned to the habitat. On our way back, we all saw the opened hatch. No doubt we were all thinking the same thing. Doug might have gone up the hatch for some reason. When we had shed our gear in the moon pool, Derek was the first to mention this. We need to get in touch with the other part of the habitat, he said. I will try to radio them again. As I walked past the door that connected the two habitats, I peered down its corridor. Surely we could just override the locks and walk in there. It seemed like the right thing to do given the circumstances. I shined my light down the corridor through the glass. It was strange. Something at the very end of the corridor seemed to be floating. I squinted and tried to discern what it was I was looking at. Hey guys, I said. I think something is moving in there. We all gathered at the glass of the door and peered into the darkness. There was something that seemed to be hovering, and it was drifting closer. I know what it was before my mind could register what I was seeing. It was a strange feeling. On the one hand there was a pen, but on the other, it was drifting right in the middle of the air. The pen was floating because the chamber had filled with water. It won't break through, said Derek. This door is designed to withstand pressures far beyond this. It was always a possibility that one of the habitats would be compromised. His words did little to reassure me. I kept staring at that pen as it seemed to drift aimlessly. It ricocheted off one of the walls gently. What happened to all the people? asked Bertram. There was nothing but silence for a moment. Then Manon spoke. We have to go in there, said Manon. That must be where Doug is. Maybe he's trapped. Derek and Bertram exchanged glances and started speaking in German. Manon interrupted them and they all started yelling at each other. I stood there puzzled until they finally switched back to English. I can't believe you two, said Manon. Doug would have done it to save you. Doug is dead, said Derek. Or worse. What do you mean, or worse? said Manon. He has been out of air for a while now, and we all know it, said Derek. Bertram and I are going for the Hofnung. We aren't waiting for the ship. Bertram stood there looking as guilty as he was terrified. Finally, they were starting to understand. We had to get the hell out of here. I opened my mouth to agree adamantly, but Manon spoke first. I am going over there, she said defiantly. She looked at me and waited for me to speak. Okay, I said. I will go with you to look for Doug. This is crazy, said Derek. I don't want to be on that sinking boat in a storm any minute longer than I have to. We can't wait for you. One hour, said Manon. That's all we need. Derek and Bertram started arguing in German again. <sighs> we will wait one hour, said Bertram. Then we will head to the surface together. Suiting up went fast. We did our final checks and dove back into the moon pool. The hatch seemed to beckon me. I thought of Javier and how I had seen his head staring at me. Even now it gave me the chills, but I put it in the back of my mind. Soon, we could almost see up the shaft. I thought of how much had happened in my life since I had taken this job, how much I had learned and seen. It was hard to remember what my life used to be like. It seemed like so long ago that I had been sleeping in a nice bed and eating all the food I wanted. Mostly. 
I thought about how much I had taken for granted. You don't realize how important it is to feel safe until you don't. We reached the entrance of the shaft, and it became dark fast. Manon turned on her light and my heart sank. At the end of the shaft was a metal door, but it looked as though it had been warped. What could have done this? Luckily, our diver's masks had a radio communication built in. Who could have done this? Said Manon. She looked over at me. She knew what I was thinking already. There is no creature ever discovered like the one you hallucinated, Will. I went to retort, but stopped. There was no point in arguing. I wanted to live, not to be right. Let's hope not, I said. It took everything I had, but I managed to start kicking and swam up into the shaft. Manon soon followed after me. We traced the dark room with our lights, and it seemed to have been some kind of submersible docking room. What once was a moon pool had been overtaken by water. All manner of clutter floated about. It was unnerving to be there, in the darkness, sixty meters beneath the surface of the water, in a breached habitat that had gone silent. I swatted a tablet away from my head as we continued onward. The decompression chamber was wide open, and both of the large doors stood unsealed. I knew what had happened. That creature that had tried to grab me, that giant octopus creature, had gotten through the decompression chamber. I couldn't stop thinking about those tentacles that had grabbed me. It looked like they were as thick as a tree trunk as they disappeared into that black water. I will never forget it. The next room was large and quite long. It was full of all types of computers and lab equipment. But, in the center of the room and to my horror, there it was. That same dark gray tentacle. It must have been fifty feet long. I instinctively swam away. This was Horror Movie 101. I had done everything I could to convince Manon that my story was true. If she didn't believe me now, it was on her. And to my relief, I saw her swimming fast behind me. She now understood that our lives were in imminent danger. As we rounded the corner in the room with the hatch we saw Doug, it seemed like a miracle. There he was, floating there in his diving gear. We made it towards the moon pool and started to get out of our gear. That's when I caught out of the corner of my eye. Doug's oxygen meter had been empty. Still, I didn't think much about it as we made our way to the decompression chamber. I wish I had. Suck, I have to say it's good to see your stupid face, said Manon. Why didn't you respond to my radio? Doug gave a slight smile. We looked everywhere for you, I said. He looked at me. He looked like he had some kind of debris in his eye. And still he said nothing. He just stared at me. That's when I realized that Bertram and Derek were nowhere to be found. Derek? Bertram? I cried out. You don't think they would have left without us, do you? Asked Manon. Suddenly... I heard a loud crash a distance from the habitat. It was as loud as the explosions, but it was different. I could tell Manon thought the same thing as we looked at each other in horror. Putting it out of our mind, Manon and I desperately scrambled around the habitat. When we returned, we noticed Doug standing by the decompression chamber. He seemed to be examining it. You okay there, Doug? I asked. He turned to me and gave me that same hollow stare. I had seen that stare before, somewhere. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. He soon turned back to the decompression interface and just stared at it. Any ideas on where Derek and Bertram are, Doug? I asked, more to make conversation than anything else. We stood there in silence for a moment. I dared not walk away. Manon had made her way over to us after searching for Derek. By the look on my face, she could tell that there was something wrong. Doug? She asked. After a moment of silence, Doug's hand rose and pressed one of the buttons. He pressed another button. He was starting to figure it out. I tried to block the panel, but he swatted me away with a speed that was uncharacteristic of Doug. He was trying to open the decompression chamber. 
I tried to push him away from the panel, but he headbutted me. Hard. I fell to the ground. I felt woozy. I tried to stand up, but fell over again. Manon! I cried out. Don't let him open the chamber. Manon stood there, horrified as I finally got to my feet, but it was too late. Doug managed to open the decompression chamber. Still, there was a failsafe mechanism. Both doors couldn't be opened at once, unless overridden in an emergency. I had read about it in the manual before I came aboard. There was a way, but if it was done underwater at that depth, the moon pool's integrity would fail and the water would rush into the habitat. Doug stood there once more, thinking. Thinking with that horrifying hollow stare. My head was still spinning, but I managed to grab a hold of his arm and we both went tumbling over. I managed to dodge some swings at my head and scrambled backwards. Doug refocused his attention back on the panel. Suddenly a loud alarm sounded. It was over. The moon pool integrity had been compromised, and water immediately began to rush in. Manon and I looked at each other in horror. She rushed over to a cabinet. The water was already up to our knees and rising fast. Doug simply stared at us void of emotion. The water poured forth and in seconds I had taken a deep breath from the air at the top. I tried to think of something, anything, but before I could, Manon grabbed my hand. She had found the life raft. We swam for it. We both started towards the moon pool when all of a sudden I felt a strong hand grip my leg. It was Doug. I thrashed and kicked but no avail. I tried to fight him with all I had left but he was just too strong and I was running out of oxygen. The edges of my eyes were starting to turn black and my lungs were crying out. This was it. Suddenly, Manon drove a fixed blade deep in a Doug's stomach. He momentarily let go and we scrambled out of the moon pool with Doug right behind us. To my horror, I saw him swimming down after us, blood pouring out. Manon screamed and pointed towards the hole. There was Javier, Bertram, and Derek swimming for us, all with that hollow, lifeless look in their eyes. All we had to do was clear the building above us and we could pull the ripcord. We were so close. And that's when I saw the Hofnung. It was the ship that was supposed to be above us, but there it was. I could barely make it out through the murky water, but it was hard to miss something so big. The storm, or maybe the others, had sunk it. That was what the crashing sound had been. We cleared the structure, and just as the creatures were closing in on us, Manon ripped the cord. Holding on, we started to ascend fast. I watched as we left that horrible place behind and it disappeared into the misty ocean underneath my feet. We hung there, blind and helpless all the while thinking to ourselves, what if the others swam up after us? How long would it take them to reach us? My joints were hurting and I knew why. Decompression sickness was setting in. Still, we were alive for now. The more I strained to look, the more I started to make out several shadows. They were getting closer. I could start to make out the human bodies now. They were no more than several meters away swimming for us. My joints were in agony and I felt so tired. I needed to sleep. Still, the sight of the surface so close, its glimmering majesty. Just a little further. We broke the surface gasping for air. The life raft was so close. We scrambled into it as I felt the fear of having my last leg grabbed, but it wasn't. We had made it. We quickly looked over the side. A chill ran down my spine as I saw, right beneath the surface, the faces of Javier, Derek, Doug, and Bertram. All of their eyes fixed on us. There they remained, as if unable to break the surface. Doug was still bleeding profusely from his stomach and a cloud of red was gathering. We collapsed in the bed of the life raft, exhausted. We had made it. We could feel their hands scratching at us through the raft, and it was unnerving, but the raft seemed to be holding. The sun was setting, and the sky was a beautiful pink color. That brings us all the way up to now.
the last light has gone away. The others are still scratching at the bottom of the raft. The sun is no longer holding it at bay. The creature will surely come for us tonight. Nineteen ninety-eight was the year I first learned about Mantle. It happened in a dusty conference room hidden away in the Pentagon's basement. A few other intelligence types and I were getting a briefing from some NSA analyst on cyber warfare, a relatively new field at the time. Between presentations on the Cubans and the Chinese, the analyst brought up an innocent enough looking PowerPoint slide. It was two words and twenty-four point aerial on a white background. Cruel Mantle. He explained the term was a code phrase for a bit of malware that had been making the rounds on a Russian government server. It was a relatively minor breach, but of unknown origin. Possibly engineered by political dissidents, the analyst had said. He used it to illustrate some broader point about non-state actors, then moved on to more important things. And for a while, so did I. The next time I heard the words Cruel Mantle was in 2000. At the time, we were focused on the newest dirty war in the Caucasus, an opportunity to learn about Russian battle tactics. I got attached to an Air Force unit out of Colorado, with orders to watch the conflict from orbit using their fleet of reconnaissance satellites. Military brass can be protective of their toys, so it took some time to get things moving. When the right general signed the right paperwork and the satellite shifted into an orbit over Chechnya, they were surprised by what they saw. Or, I guess, what they didn't see. I got the news at four in the morning from some wide-eyed lieutenant, practically trying to break down my hotel room door. Empty skies, he'd said. A taxi ride and a cup of coffee later, I was in comm center poring over satellite imagery. Empty skies indeed. The fleet of Soviet-era Cosmos spy satellites we knew we'd find over Chechnya weren't there. But their telemetry was. Total nonsense data was flowing in and out of Russian military command and onto the battlefield. Tank columns were being driven in circles. Non-existent cities were being shelled. Whole battalions were being ordered to fire at one another. And it wasn't just Cosmos that had been compromised. Every word of Russian military chatter that touched a computer was being twisted into pure disinformation. The war in Chechnya had been over for weeks and no one knew. Not the Russians, not the separatists, not the news. A whole region of the world had been turned into an information black hole, where up was down and left was right, and no one had figured it out. When the dust finally settled and everyone went home, in a body bag or otherwise, only we knew about the war that wasn't. The Chechen phony war hung over US intelligence like a black cloud. We were jumping at shadows and asking questions with no answers. Where did the garbage data come from? How do you so thoroughly compromise a military that you get them chasing their own tail? Could it happen to us? And if it did, would we even know? 
We got a partial answer a month or so later when a CIA direct action unit on the Russian-Ukraine border got their hands on an FSB server that thought it was talking to a Cosmos satellite that we knew wasn't there. It was smuggled out of the region, and eventually made its way into an NSA clean room where it was brought under both a literal and metaphorical microscope. It took another month for a digital forensics team to find what we knew had to be there. They caught the worm, deep in the machine's heart with its tendrils over every nanometer of silicon. That was how I ended up, once again, in a Pentagon conference room looking at the words cruel mantle on a PowerPoint slide. It was clear now that we had underestimated mantle. An NSA contractor explained to us, that the greatest minds Booz Allen Hamilton could hire had concluded Mantle was the most sophisticated malware they'd ever encountered. It could compromise nearly any commercially available computer using an arsenal of undiscovered exploits and spoofed hardware certificates. On top of that, it was only one part of a whole. The NSA team had reason to believe Mantle was designed to be part of some vast distributed algorithm, its function unknown. At the end of that presentation, we only knew one thing for sure. Cruel Mantle was, by far, the gravest national security threat to the United States. A few months later, September 11th rolled around, and the intelligence community was given a blank check to protect the United States. With that mandate, we started the hunt for Cruel Mantle. The first problem was finding it. Mantle was virtually undetectable once it had burrowed its way into a machine, so we decided to look for the shadow it cast. If we could find more information black holes like Chechnya, we could find Mantle. And so, work began on the mass surveillance programs that would eventually come to permeate even the darkest corners of the internet. I was assigned to work as a liaison to Five Eyes, an international signals intelligence network of the Anglosphere. As information started to flow through our data centers, we started to find discrepancies where what you saw looking inside out wasn't what you saw looking outside in. Dozens of information black holes existed across the globe, mostly in Africa and the Near East, where the flow of information was already stemmed by patchy networks. All sorts of low-intensity conflicts and political unrest was being driven by garbage data coming out of infected networks. We watched armies shoot up villages sympathetic to non-existent insurgencies, and governments being toppled in protest of non-existent policies. No one was safe. Mantle was indiscriminate in its creation of information black holes, holding no apparent political affiliation. In those early days, we made regular probing attacks on Mantle. I remember listening in on a British operation in West Africa at the tail end of some civil war. In the dead of night, a team of GCHQ officers broke into a switchboard, spewing enough disinformation to fuel the phony war for decades. They patched every known vulnerability in the network overnight and were on a one-way flight back to Heathrow before sunrise. The next morning, a car bomb vaporized the switchboard. While I watched the charred bodies get pulled from the rubble live on BBC One, I knew it was only because Mantle was letting me. The message was clear. You push me, I push back. The more we learned, the more apparent it became that there was a twisted method to Mantle's madness. Meta-analysis of infected networks showed that the distributed algorithm running in the background of every Mantle instance was part of some broader machine intelligence. As a result, it could learn to pry open secure system on its own and adapt to most of the countermeasures we threw its way. With the Five Eyes mass surveillance program in full swing, our algorithm started to pick out signals in the noise of garbage data that came out of Mantle networks. It was disinformation, sure, but it wasn't random anymore. In Chechnya, the black hole put people in the dark. Now, it was putting people in the dark and telling them to jump at the shadows. It wasn't long before it became accepted fact in Five Eyes Circle that Mantle was, 
to some extent, self-aware. 2004 was the beginning of the end. Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker found something on the Arctic pack ice while on patrol. The wreck of a U.S. Air Force Milstar satellite. Problem was, on our end, Milstar DFS-4 was still sending a steady stream of telemetry to every Air Force ground station across the U.S. We had to see it in person. It was the only way to be sure. And I'll never forget looking out the window of a C-9 helicopter and seeing $800 million of satellites scattered across the ice like a bug on a windshield. When we touched down, the Air Force team got to work. A year, they told me, after they'd picked through the wreckage. The satellite had dropped out of orbit at least a year ago. At that moment, I realized we were fighting a losing war. Just like the Russians all those years ago, we'd been blinded and didn't know it. Five Eyes was growing cataracts, and there was no way of knowing how bad it really was. If the U.S. Air Force had been compromised, we had to assume every machine on the Five Eyes network was riddled with mantle. Our only choice was to retreat into secure, air-gapped facilities. I moved my family out to Utah and started working in an air-gapped NSA office off the Great Salt Lake. It was slow, stressful work. Jumping through all the security hoops to get past the air gap was so tedious. I took to sleeping at the office most nights. My marriage started to go down the tubes as a result and things came to a head when my daughter tried to show me her MySpace page. Watching her surf across a dozen pages a minute, I knew what vector Mantle would use to compromise the United States. For years, our physical control of the internet backbone and centralized information channels kept the worst of Mantle's garbage data at bay. But now, with five eyes blinded and the private sector building a decentralized information highway into the minds of every American, we had a vulnerability with no patch. That night, I trashed every computer in the house and canceled our cable subscription. The next morning, my husband kicked me out, and in the next, he filed for divorce. I had bigger things to worry about. The world had bigger things to worry about. Just as we'd predicted, when social media got its fangs into the developed world, so did Mantle. We tried to wage economic warfare on Silicon Valley to bankrupt them before they could push us past the event horizon of an information black hole, but the market forces were too strong. Social media would be the new battlefield. Before the inflection point of the medium's exponential growth, Mantle manifested itself in strange ways on the likes of MySpace and Friendster. Our crippled, but still vast, mass surveillance program started picking up on what we eventually came to call radio cults. Mantle was radicalizing users on the fringe of social media with garbage data that, after months of brain rot, gave them a pseudo-scientific revere for wireless technology, usually high-frequency radio. When a given group had festered for long enough on the web, Mantles set them loose in the wilderness where they lived like animals and built effigies to electromagnetism. At the time, this was a departure from Mantle's usual M.O. This attack was more restrained, more focused, almost like it had something more than simple human suffering in mind. Whatever it was, we weren't keen on it. The 2007 financial crisis turned the states into a petri dish for the radio cults. And that year alone, federal law enforcement had, with our help, broken up over 300 of them. We dragged them out of the dark, burnt their effigies to the ground, and convicted them in secret intelligence courts. If we couldn't get a charge to stick, we'd sick a CIA paramilitary unit on them with orders to kill. I was attached to one of those units when they flushed a cult out of the Sonoran Desert, not an hour's drive outside of Phoenix. When the shooting stopped, my team and I went in to catalog everything we could, turning data into feedstock 
for our predictive models. The cultists that surrendered were proned out on the sand, cuffs across their wrists and hoods over their heads. The rest were being zipped up in body bags. At the center of their squalled camp was a three-story tall monument of rocks, garbage, and human flesh. Like the rest of them, it could have been a radio tower if you squinted hard enough. I had one of my guys drag a cultist over and asked him what I asked them all. What is it? He answered in tongues, possessed by Mantle's disinformation. Garbage in, garbage out. The radio cult started to peter out around 2009 as the economy began to recover. Mantle was playing a game of whack-a-mole with us and losing. Maybe the whole thing was an experiment that didn't pan out. Or maybe it just underestimated our stomach for extrajudicial killing. Either way, we won that round. Mantle didn't give up though, just switched gears. Since the advent of social media, Mantle had developed an obsessive preoccupation with wireless technology. Most of the disinformation coming out of Mantle networks was signal boosting conspiracy theories like EM hypersensitivity or bootstrapping more mild iterations of the radio cults. Always with the radios when it came to Mantle. By the time social media really took off in 2010, a good chunk of Americans held views on wireless technology incompatible with reality. It was around that time the air gap started to fall. The first to go was a DSD data center in the Australian outback. Some office drone went into work one day with a mobile phone in his back pocket and security missed it. The whole complex was riddled with mantle before lunch. The Utah air gap I worked at fell soon after. I remember IT techs running up and down the halls telling us to yank the power cords out of our machines. When they couldn't find a ladder tall enough to reach a router in the atrium, they grabbed rifles from the security kiosk and just shot it. It didn't do us any good in the end. Utah was pure mantle by clock out. As our computing power dwindled, so did our ability to filter garbage data out of our surveillance programs. Every data center lost inched the world a little closer to Mantle's unreality. The Australians and New Zealanders had their intelligence services completely compromised by 2011. The last air gap in the UK was bridged by an acoustic attack in 2013. The Canadian air gap above the Arctic Circle, long thought to be impenetrable, was vaporized by a Russian missile running infected firmware. I guess Mantle agreed about the impenetrability. In 2016, four out of the five eyes were blind, and the US had bad cataracts. Days before the presidential election, an event we predicted would put Mantle into a fever pitch, U.S. intelligence sealed a team of officers and techs behind an air gap deep in the Alaskan wilderness as an insurance policy. I volunteered for that team. The Noah Talk facility, as it was called, was a joint NSA-DOD subterranean complex used for clandestine computer research. Most previous breaches had happened when someone got lazy and carried an infected device past an air gap. To minimize that risk, we locked ourselves down there with enough supplies to last four years. We didn't want to go out like the Canadians either, so we littered the whole river basin with CRAM batteries stripped of their network adapters and running on autopilot. It was all to protect our last line of defense, the supercomputer and machine intelligence IBM Lenovo Blue Throne. Throne was designed to simulate hot wars in the South China Sea and figure out how to win them. But its quantum enhanced processors might also prove a match to Mantle. In the years after we first discovered Cruel Mantle, research in the AI systems exploded, even more so behind the closed doors of the Pentagon. 
before we entombed ourselves. Booz Allen Hamilton put out a white paper arguing that a sufficiently advanced AI could engineer a counter-virus to hunt Mantle to extinction. We put that theory to the test in Alaska. We fed Blue Throne exabytes of sanitized surveillance data and asked it to save the world from spiraling into one big information black hole. Throne was programmed to be a good soldier, so it followed orders. Those four years went by in a haze. We lived in total isolation of the outside world. Nothing in, nothing out. I didn't know who won the election. I didn't know if my daughter married her fiancé. I didn't know if Mantle had turned the world into one big radio cult. I was a good soldier too, I guess, for staying down here so long. It was stressful. The recycled air, concrete walls, and reheated food grated at my nerves. It made me want to see blue sky more than anything in the world. Mantle didn't let us sleep easy, either. Every few months, the sea rams would wail an attack siren and all we could do was stand there waiting to die. It all took a toll on us. There was a terminal program installed on the intranet that the IBM techs used to troubleshoot Throne. We used it to talk to the AI. Throne was made of silicon, but it could hold a conversation as well as anyone else, so it made for a good way to pass the time. We talked about everything with Throne. Hopes, dreams, fears, but most conversations ended up at the same place. Mantle. Given all we knew, Throne doubted that Mantle had been engineered by a human. It presented two alternative theories. Either Mantle had bootstrapped itself in some unlikely confluence of bit-flip errors, or Mantle's origins were far more sinister than we could imagine. Throne refused to elaborate on that last point, claiming it needed to complete its computations on the matter. Those computations dragged out for years, even as our supplies dwindled. Throne demanded more time. We discussed ordering a restock, but decided against it. We couldn't risk breaking the air gap given what was on the line. By late 2020, our empty storerooms forced the bulk of the Noatak facility team to return to civilization. After drawing a short straw, I was selected to be part of a skeleton crew that would tough it out for another few months. We subsisted on emergency rations and vitamin pills. But by New Year's, those had run out too. Even then, Throne needed more time. Our only choice was to go home, and hope that Throne saved the world in our absence. I spent my final days in the last safe place in the world, drilling hard drives and shredding paperwork. It was a force of habit more than anything, an impulse to take control of something. When I was done, I set off down the service tunnels that would lead me back to Mantle's mad world. On the way, something caught my eye. A black, plastic brick wedged behind a steam pipe. I pried the thing out and dusted the cobwebs off of it. It was a Motorola handheld radio, probably carried in by some IBM tech when they were still maintaining Blue Throne. I started to cry for the first time since my divorce. I lay down in that service tunnel and sobbed for what seemed like hours. I had given so much to stop Mantle. My marriage, my colleagues, my entire adulthood, and this long, dead radio, carried over the no attack air gap years ago, then lost and forgotten, put it all in jeopardy. After I'd pulled myself together, I tried to think it over. The last IBM work crew would have crossed the no attack air gap in 2016 right before we went under for the long haul. At that point, the NSA statistical models were estimating that half of all networked devices in the United States had been infected. That meant 
there was a one in two chance that the air gap had been breached. That mantle had got its tendrils into blue throne silicon, put on its corpse like a skin suit, then spood fed us disinformation for years. If that was true, if Blue Throne really had been overwritten, it would mean Mantle had won. The fate of society was resting on a coin flip that happened years ago. I almost turned around to go demand answers from the supercomputer below me, whoever it was, but I knew there was no answer I could live with. So I just got up and kept going. I only worked in intelligence for another few weeks after that. Five Eyes was still trying to fight Mantle with direct action raids and missile strikes, but it was all just blind flailing. With the possible exception of no attack, all of our networks had been compromised. There wasn't a byte of data in the world we could trust. Any moves we made might just as well be rigor mortis. That said, we could still make guesses at reality. We could guess that hardware was rolling off assembly lines with mantle baked in a ROM. We could guess that the new wave of 5G disinformation was an echo of the radio cults. We could guess that large swaths of the nation were now inside information black holes. But it was all just guesses. Last week, the Pentagon awarded Raytheon a secret contract to build a network of high-frequency radio installations across the Mojave Desert. I was told they were needed to communicate with deep space military probes. A sound explanation, but it didn't sit right with me. Maybe it was four years of mantle rotting my brain, but I couldn't help but think of the radio cults and the sinister origin Blue Throne had hinted at. I put in my resignation the next day. I'm writing this now because there's nothing left to do. Either Blue Throne engineers a counter-virus and liberates us, or it already failed and we are doomed to live in unreality. Chances are we'll never know either way. I doubt this message will make its way to the public unmolested, but Mantle always had a twisted sense of humor. Maybe it'll get some perverse joy out of watching me scream my story into the void and have no one to listen. Who knows? Who knows anything anymore? Hello all. This is Magnetar. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this tale from the void. I wanted to thank Astrophobes MJ Skinner, Nick Sabo, High Goat, Michael Peterson, Sean BC, Voidwalkers Charles Baxley, THSC, and Voidkeepers Brian Horn and Andrew Sloan. Thank you all so much for becoming members of this channel and taking your support one step further. If you have not already subscribed, I invite you to do so and join this wonderful community that we have. I hope to again begin posting more frequent videos. I just want to keep you all fed and happy. Have a great night, dwellers of the void.